superintendent, I, I believe that staff has set up a meeting with Ms. Pryor and that we are going to, con right? I'm sorry. And with the parent. And with the parent. Um, and I'm sure that the board would want follow up on this incident. Leanne McMeans. Uh, on the budget? Okay, we'll put you under budget. Thank you. Tabitha Veros? Okay. Hi, I'm back. And I don't want to be back. I'm back about the same thing. <coughs> Both sides of the bullying. And it starts with the teachers and the office staff who have no manners at all. I'm speaking of Ms. Frickman. When my son, who has excuse, medical issues. Excuse me, please, mic, please speak to the board. I'm speaking to everybody. When well, my here to son address the board, so. was ill, he went in and he asked politely, what did I miss? And her answer was, well, we weren't sitting here twiddling our thumbs waiting for you. He asked again politely, and she said, go ask one of your friends. My son was attacked at school. There was nothing done. His phone was broken. Wickerson said, we investigated. There was no investigation. The other child that was questioned didn't want to be a narc and that it's his responsibility that he brings his cell phone to school. My son takes his cell phone to school because he's terrified of school shootings. Every year that my child since kindergarten at this district has been attacked physically at least once. Betancourt, Lieberman, or Liebert, and it's always, always swept under the rug. It's who's got money and who doesn't. I was assured again and again and again, we'll handle it. You're not handling it. My child will not be the next Ronin. And you all know who I'm speaking about, don't you? If you don't, it's the child that was bullied at the same school my child is currently attending, Folsom Middle School, that committed suicide. Now, I don't like the fact that there are children in here hearing this, but my son is now suicidal because of the consistent bullying that's not being addressed. So I have a suggestion the board might want to follow. We have citizenship points, don't we? So why don't we turn it around on the bullies? Why don't we turn it around and offer points <coughs> to children who anonymously, in other words, the only people that will know about it are trusted staff, and whoever gets the most points at the end of the year gets a reward. And they don't have to know exactly why because citizenship awards are citizenship awards. <laughs> Nothing is being done. I can thank Lisa Shelton and Terry Daniels and Mrs. McGee for looking out for my son. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. I do not thank this board for its policies on the way they handle certain children, <laughs> black children, as opposed to white children, children with money, as opposed to children without money. And I'm done with it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tara Martin. Welcome. Good afternoon or evening, wherever we are right now. I am up here tonight to talk to you about the criminalization that's going on within the Unified School District. 
um, the situation that Ms. Price just spoke about and the young man, Micah, what he's going through seems to be an everyday event somewhere within the school district. You guys have moved from being educators, teachers. In my day, when I was going to school, I looked up to my teachers, my principal. We were taught, we taught our children as we were growing up that you could go to your teachers and your principal and the people at the school for anything. It was a safe place. And now children are afraid to go to school. Um, but particularly black children are starting to fear the school the way African Americans are starting to fear police officers. And let me tell you why. It's because every day you guys are playing law and order with children. And it's starting earlier and earlier. This child is 13, but I've seen it happen to eight-year-olds, six-year-olds, even in the preschools. I can tell you, I've seen it. And what's happening is when the children go to school, and most parents tell their kids to be respectful to adults. When they ask you a question, answer them. And so they're talking and they're trying to explain their case. Sometimes they're not even asked what their case is. But you take this information and you have them sign a statement that can and will be used against them. But they're not Mirandized, no. They don't have a right to an attorney. They don't have a right to a parent. This woman just told you that she waited for hours. Her child had to call her. Unacceptable. Why are you interrogating these children like this? It's okay to ask them questions if you're gonna take both sides and listen to both people, but you're not. You become the judge and the jury, then you go and you involve the cops. And then next thing you know, we have all kinds of other things happening. When you walk these kids out of the school, that's the perp walk. Stop playing law and order with these children. Stop criminalizing our babies. We love our babies like you love yours. Stop doing it. Because even when it's over, it's not over for them. Thank you. At this point, I don't have any other public participation cards. One more? Oh, wait a minute, let me see. Yes, Jerry Brown. Thank you. As I stated earlier. The mic, please. As I stated earlier, my son has become suicidal. You sent a cop to my house. You criminalized it. I told the school. I told them what was going on. I took the steps necessary to protect my child. The crisis counselor that I've come to depend on told me to keep him out of school until we could get things more resolved. You sent a cop to my house. I'm the one that informed the school. I'm the one that told the school what was going on and what the decision was. You sent a cop to my house. I know my rights as a parent. And then you bring cops in from other areas that don't know what the hell's going on up here. And she sits there and cusses in front of my kid and says, well, it looks like you can dress yourself and you must have your backpack ready, so we're going to school. And turned around and looked at me and said she didn't agree with the crisis counselor. That's what you've got going on in your schools. One child in particular, for his bullying, for his mouth, his punishment was to apologize 
to my son. And that still has not happened. I've contacted an educational attorney. And that educational attorney apparently has won more than lost one lawsuit against this district. Excuse me, one. If I have to take this any further, if these children are not protected properly and treated with the respect that you want, that you expect, and that the teachers respect and expect, and everybody else, if you cannot give the respect, you're not going to get it. And it makes me ill. My son has had a very traumatic year. The one thing he wanted to do was come home, be in his own home, and be with his friends. And he can't even do that now because he's constantly afraid and bullied outside of the classroom. It's constant. And you're anti-bullying policy is garbage. It hasn't worked, it never will work, and it needs to be reworked. No more of this who knows who crap. No more of sending cops to a parent's house whose child is suicidal and telling that child to get in the car. If that ever happens again, you won't like what I have to say next time. Leave our kids alone and retrain your staff, especially if you want the respect of the public. Because this district may have high state marks, but they've got some of the biggest bullying issues in California. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. I think we heard a few times, I think there was mention made that her son is getting support from the Folsom Middle School staff. Can we make sure, since it was mentioned numerous times suicidal, that we are, this child is on our radar? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have no more public uh, participation <coughs> cards. We're going to move on to reports of district organizations. Student Advisory Board. Thank you. So we had our meeting this past Tuesday, and we confirmed our talent show date, which will be on April 22nd at the Cordova High School Theater. We also continued our phone conversation, and one of the most prominent things that all students agreed on was that we want um, habits built at a young age and consistency. So when we talked about phone pockets, everybody seemed to like the idea, but since not all high school classrooms have it, then it's sometimes frustrating to not continue that habit throughout the day and um, remember you're supposed to put it or not, et cetera. So starting that from elementary school where students are starting to get phones so that it's normal and it's not an upsetting thing that, oh, this teacher makes me put my phone away. Um, also lessons, I know we talked it about talked about at the August board meeting, but having lessons for elementary school students on internet safety and how they manage their phones and social media, everybody agreed on it unanimously. So that's another thing that we really want to see happen. And our on our next meeting, which will be on January 14th, we're gonna continue this more and see if there's anything or any ideas that we can pose that we wanna see done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have PTA Council, but I think that's a mistake unless somebody wants to speak on that. No? Okay, California School Employees Association. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Amara Johnson, CSEA Union Steward. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to, under, to tell the board we understand how the challenges of the budget, the situation, and appreciate your efforts to get us back on track without layoffs. If that's possible, we would also like to say that we are in support of what our teachers are going to say this evening. And with their support and our support, we know that you as a board can come to the proper decision. Thank you. Thank you. 
Folsom Cordova Education. Folsom Cordova Education Association. Okay. You're pulling it up. So good evening, board, Dr. Kalikian. Angelica sends her regrets tonight. She's at an Arbinger training with um, Rob Thomas, and uh, they are trying to uh, learn how to train the trainers for the district so we can all be a little bit more thinking outside of the box. So um, my name is Debbie Krikorian. I'm the FCEA bargaining chair, and I'm speaking on behalf of FCEA tonight. So I want to thank you for your time. Is it coming? There we go. Okay. So school services acknowledges 85 to 90% of budgets often are spent on personnel. This is not a set number, but FCEA feels we best meet the needs of students when 85% of the budget is used on people who support students. The food service person, the bus driver, the office staff person who greets the students, the paraprofessionals, the speech and language pathologists, nurses, counselors, principals, and others who meet the daily needs of students, and of course, their teachers. The numbers you see above show where district spending on people has fallen on the chart in the last few years. We want you to look at zero line budgeting and ask how each dollar is spent and how each dollar impacts students' lives. The Folsom Cordova Education Association is asking the school board to come up with a plan to cover students' needs by providing the best professionals to serve them, by meeting employee costs of living increases, and cutting areas which least affect students. You can see above, FCUSD is falling short on personnel spending. We need a plan to bring 85% of the budget spending on personnel who makes a positive difference to each child's life, including their social and emotional well-being. In a time of budget cuts, this board has approved opening a trust fund. Since the 2006-2007 school year, money has been put in to Fund 71 for paying medical retirement benefits. FCEA was told it was an irrevocable trust fund. This past year, FCEA discovered Fund 71 is an unrestricted fund and may be used to meet student needs. So now the school board has directed the district to open an irrevocable trust fund in the middle of budget cuts. Between the super cola given in 1819 of 3.7% and this year's cola of 3.26%, FCEA's ongoing cost of living increase has calculated to a half percent each year with an option of working extra time for professional development. We have been told the COLA is given to the district as a cost of doing business increase. If we are 85% of the district's cost of doing business, then we should receive a proper cost of living increase. But instead, the district has been advised to take the cost of 1% for all employees and put it into Fund 71 for future medical retirement costs with the possibility of earning interest. This is an irresponsible practice for a district who is deficit spending and not giving its employees a proper COLA. 95% of the districts in the state of California recognize they cannot afford to put money into Fund 71 for the opportunity of earning interest to pay medical retirement costs. They pay it yearly out of general funds. FCUSD has had a difficult time enticing world language teachers, math teachers, science special ed, speech language pathologists, nurses, and our paraprofessionals in the classroom to come to our district 
over other districts and private industry. FCUSD must stop deficit spending and go to zero line budgeting and account for every dollar spent. FCUSD must pass on the state cost of living adjustments to our salaries to be competitive to make sure our students are served by the best teachers, support staff, bus drivers, food service workers, paraprofessionals, <laughs> principals, and every other person who touches the daily lives of our students. We're asking that you stop putting 1% yearly of our COLA into an overfunded medical retirement fund. This fund is a luxury item we cannot afford. Be responsible and meet our needs of our students first. This includes meeting cost of living increases to maintain the best staff. We are a school district, not a financial institution. 10 years of medical retirement savings is more than enough money to provide for our employees' needs and the rest of the money should go back to general funds to meet our students' needs. In conclusion, Folsom Cordova Education Association is asking the school board to approve a plan to cover student needs. By one, cut deficit spending and cut, conduct an analysis of each dollar spent. Two, provide the best professionals to serve students through employee, meeting employee cost of living raises. Three, roll over seven million to cover 10 years worth of medical retirement funds into the irrevocable trust that you have established. And four, place $7 million back into general funds to meet the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, and I'm sure you're going to stick around because Fund 71 is on the agenda tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Kaligi and, and my esteemed colleagues. FCLA has no report tonight, but I know that I'm up for DLAC, and I um, We'll be reporting on Parent Summit, and Monica Merrill will be joining me, so I'm going to actually turn the mic over to Monica. Thank you. Monica Merrill <clears throat> with no voice. Monica Merrill, Power School Community Outreach Champion. So not only am I a parent, I also do show up as a Power School employee. I would like to talk about the Saturday session that I did with Elena and the English Learner Advisory event that was put on. Most notable, I'd like to say that these kinds of events are open to everybody, the entire district. There were mothers, there were fathers, there were guardians, people concerned with the lives of the students in this district. I was granted 45 very generous minutes to talk about the, the Power School Parent Portal, how to log in, how to interpret grades, how to have meaningful discussions with students about how things are going without assigning blame or shame, how to, how to quantify and measure accomplishments, but most of all, how to celebrate what's going on and always try to do incrementally better. So what I noticed was that there's a wide variety of people that showed up, but they all were very invested in their students. Not only were they invested in their students, but they were also invested in each other. There's a camaraderie that happens when you invest three hours on a Saturday, with beautiful weather, I might add. Not only were they engaging with the material, they were really engaging with each other. And by the end of the three hours, with a little bit of help from some pizza, <laughs> and I might add, with the free child care that was provided, removing that obstacle for many of the families. The parents came together, and not only did they talk to each other, but this kind of event provides dialogue, meaningful dialogue between district personnel 
and the adults who showed up. It's another kind of communication. It's another kind of forum. And having these meaningful conversations, not only over technology, but also over the VAPA, the um, art project that they were doing. There was also a science center. The, the people who showed up were all on the same page. And it was a really, truly beautiful page, and I was, it was a privilege for me to be a part of it. I really hope that more parents get involved in these events and anyone who wants to actually contribute to healthy dialogue and communication in our district, not only show up to the school board meetings, but also show up to these kinds of parent engagement events. So it was my, my pleasure and my privilege. Thank you for the opportunity. And on a final note, our next one will be in February, and they are a wonderful opportunity to have thought partners with our parents. So thank you. Thank you. So I hope we use the three hours that we're all here tonight to develop that camaraderie and all leave with that positive attitude that that meeting took place. We don't have pizza, but I'm hoping we can work towards that. Um, agenda, consent. I'll move. Oh, a second. Moved by Mr. Hoover, second by Mr. Short. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, as stated earlier, we are going to jump to the discussion items, and I believe we're starting out with what I'm sure everybody's here for, the measure, is it Measure G first? Measure G, Citizens Oversight Committee 2018-19 Annual Report. Good evening, board. The uh, uh, Citizens Oversight Committee for Measure G, part of their tasks and what they do as well as receiving the audit reports and reviewing expenditures is also to provide the annual report, uh, the activities of the Oversight Committee and also the uh, what the Oversight Committee has been doing for the year. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Laura Ruby, who's the chairman of the Measure G Bond Oversight Committee. And she's going to give you some information regarding the annual report, and then I'm going to follow up with some of the uh, activities that have been happening under Measure G. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. As chair of the Bond Oversight Committee, Measure G, for Folsom Cordova School District, it's my privilege and pleasure to present on behalf of the full committee our annual report. The Bond Oversight Committee exists to ensure that expenditures of the funds collected under the voter approved Bond Measure G are spent on the items and projects booter, booters, okay, voters approved at the time of their vote, or those booters, whichever, you know. <laughs> the committee is dedicated to ensuring that the public trust is well kept and remains intact throughout the life of the bond. The Board Oversight Committee is pleased to report that the expenditures for the fiscal year 2017-2018 after a full audit by an outside agency are in compliance with all the laws, regulations, and accounting. Measure G General Obligation Bonds Performance Audit was approved by the Board of Education in February 7th, 2019 meeting, but even though you do yours, we have to do ours. And so we review all that you review to make sure that everything is copacetic. The finding of this audit were that all expenditures of funds from the Measure G bonds were in full compliance with the outlined purposes voters approved in 2014. Specifically, during the reporting period audited expenditures from July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2018, totaling 49 million 143,320 were reviewed and found in compliance. The Bond Oversight Committee met, met three times in 2018 and have toured sites where projects were, in, were complete, in progress, or are in the planning stage. On behalf of the entire committee, thank you for the opportunity to serve our district and ensure that as all is in full compliance with legal and ethical guidelines. Thank you. Thank you for your service. So also in your packet is the mailer that's sent out to the uh, voters every year as required under the uh, uh, Measure G. And now I'm going to go to the actual project update and kind of run you through with the projects that under Measure G, the accomplishments that have been done and, and projects currently underway.
Okay. okay. Technology's on that list, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first under Measure G, as you know, the voters approved Measure G was a $195 million bond. It was passed in 2014. We've already issued three series of the bonds, so we've been very aggressive in pursuing the projects. We uh, want to spend the money, make sure we try to beat some of the uh, cost escalation of some of the projects. There's also additional funds that we also have for that. So there's developer fee funds, there's uh, uh, CTE grant funds, and then there's also state bond funds that we're actively pursuing under all eligibility under the state bond program. So you see Measure G is, was provided to uh, renovate, upgrade, repair classrooms, different instructional areas, replace HVAC systems, provide energy management systems, uh, improve the health and safety, security systems. Uh, technology is a big, big uh, um, improvement that we're doing to all the schools as well as replacing all say, unsafe uh, playground physical education equipment and classroom and furniture and equipment. So that's something we've been pursuing as well. Um, Measure D projects, the current projects that we're working on, uh, Sutter Middle School, as you can tell, we drive by all the improvements over the last couple of years. That's a multi-phase project. The first phase is complete. It's phase, which we call 1B and C, which you can see is the administration building, the library complex, and the, uh, the classrooms, we also added some portable classrooms out back. Uh, part of that was to temporarily house the uh, staff while we were building the uh, two-story classroom building. Phase two, which just recently completed, is a new multipurpose building, music, food service, lunch shelter, and related site work. Um, that's going to replace the old undersized multipurpose room, which now will have a stage, a nice performance area, and an adequate food service area. Phase three, which is just started construction, is now gutting the old multipurpose room. We're creating project lead the way classroom areas. Um, we're providing areas for PE. Uh, we're upgrading some additional classrooms. We have site work. We're putting in new roofing and updating our fire and intrusion alarm systems. And then phase four will eventually be the new synthetic turf installed at the field and some uh, site work as well. Folsom Hills Elementary School is currently under construction. Um, we actually modernized, replaced all the old portable classroom buildings, modernized and expanded the administration area and the multipurpose building, uh, created a nice new quad area, a, a sense of an interior quad, so the school is kind of combined area, so the portable classrooms that were up there now, the new classrooms feel a part of the campus. Um, we're also replacing the door locks and uh, new lighting has been replaced and then also uh, a lot of site work as well. Folsom High Career Technical Education Building, which is currently under construction. We're housing new manufacturing technology, um, development engineering and architect pathways. Uh, it's re replacing all of the uh, bu buildings that were on there. Those portables have been moved and then we've added some additional portable classrooms onto that campus as well. That's estimated to be completed in 2020, and we're also doing that in conjunction with state CTE funds, hopefully, and CTIG funds. Uh, Theodore Jude Elementary School, which just recently completed, we replaced the uh, old uh, library building, classrooms, uh, site work, we created a new uh, parent drop-off area, a lot of uh, safety and site work, and also some of the fire and intrusion alarm systems as well and also a new digital marquee will be in there an ada accessible path recently completed projects are carl sundahl and oak chan both similar projects uh, we basically it looks like a new school we totally replaced all of the old classrooms with new permanent construction class uh, buildings new library um, expanded the multi or the multi-purpose and the administration building all new extensive site work, landscaping, uh, new uh, uh, playground equipment, and also furniture and equipment as well as technology. Uh, next is uh, Folsom Middle School. Um, it's part of a larger project, but we went ahead and did some work. It's part of a larger master plan that we will be working on shortly once we receive uh, or the school becomes eligible for state funds. We did a new marquee, which was partially funded by the PTA and then we replaced the gymnasium um, HVAC. The Folsom High School Auxiliary Gym, you know, that's complete as a new auxiliary gym, which um, obviously is a great improvement. It adds additional space uh, for PE and athletic activities. One thing I want to mention too, back on Sutter that I forgot to mention, that the city was a great partner. They also helped fund the Sutter. They added additional money so we could expand the Sutter 
multi-purpose room to actually be a gymnasium type facility as well. So that'll increase the recreation um, activities and capacity for the city as well. Vista del Lago, the stadium improvements. You know, we, uh, a new stadium was put in there, also with new uh, field house, snack bar. Um, greatly improved that so that each school would basically have their own uh, athletic events be able to held at each school. And these are fun or the projects coming up. Actually, Branch, Blanche Sprints Elementary School, we just recently had a kickoff with the Modernization Committee. We are actually starting our planning on that. Um, we are looking at 2021. It's replacing a multipurpose building um, with a new one, a larger one, which actually has restrooms in it. Um, expanding the parking lot, uh, ADA improvements. And then we have other projects. Uh, what we tr do is we also make sure that projects we don't do ahead of when they're eligible for state bond funds, because if we do that ahead of time, then we lose our eligibility. So we're timing these projects. And as you know, there's AB 48, which is not Prop 13, that is going to be on the ballot next year. And we are hoping that we will receive some additional funds from that that we will parlay into doing more projects on down the line as they receive more state funding. We will go down the list of these other projects here. We have Folsom Middle School, Empire Oaks, Gold Ridge, and you can kind of read the scopes on that. And then on down, there's Natoma Station, which we have some old buildings to replace there. Um, and then on down to the rest of the projects. Technology-wise, we've been very active working with our ETS department, and nearly every school in Folsom has received 21st century technology, all new bandwidth, um, all new 21st century technology with uh, monitors in the classrooms. And then as we complete projects, we are also replacing furniture and equipment, and some schools are getting a little ahead of time as if they are severely dilapidated in their furniture and equipment. So working in conjunction with the sites, all new desk chairs, new, more 21st century technology that will help the learning environment within the classroom. Um, that's what we have as far as uh, what we're doing to Measure G right now. Um, are there any questions from the board? Yeah, um, Matt, I just want to thank you for updating us on this. So a quick question uh, regarding Folsom Hills. Uh, are we on track for that to open? Yes, this, we are. This, yeah, this we, year? We actually will be opening a few classrooms the 1st of December, um, moving some of the administration over, and then the rest of it will be complete uh, by the end of the winter break, and everybody should be back in when school starts. That's the timeline, unless uh, you know construction things can happen, but <laughs> that's the tentative timeline. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Reed? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, where are we in getting a representative on Measure G representing the business community? That seat's been open for a year now. Yeah, we try to, uh, we, we've advertised uh, word of mouth. Um, we've worked with uh, Daniel Thigpen on communication. He sent some things out. We put some stuff in the digest. We need to re-engage efforts again and try to do that. We have some um, other ideas on regarding the oversight committee that we're also maybe looking forward in the future to try to gain more interest as well. Have you reached out to the chamber? Uh, not personally, no. no. That, that might be but a good option. That. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, and um, we appreciate the regular information updates that we get. It helps us stay on top of what's going on and timelines. We do have someone from the public who would like to comment on this. Ming? Hi. Um, so I'm a parent of Blanche Sprints Elementary, and um, I see it's great what we're doing with Measure G. And I've driven by some of the schools and they look awesome and wonderful. And um, I see on there for our school, we're getting a new multi and a new parking lot, but we're not getting our portables replaced. We have two sets of portables where my kid's been in there for three years now, ceiling tires are falling off, it's been leaking, and I don't understand why they're not being replaced. Um, so, and I don't see on the, um, part of the plan as a fence around our school. So I know some of the fencing has gone up on the side where it's a deep um, slope where the kids sometimes play and may get injured, but I feel like we need to kind of block off the park that's immediately behind the school. Um, so I don't know. That was a fence. Yeah. Okay. There are a few items that are included 
in this report. It's by no means the full master plan of everything, and we're currently meeting. One of the ideas or one of the plans is to fence off that area between the park. That is in the plan. That is actually in the master plan. There will be improvements to the portables. We're not planning on replacing them. They're not of that age that we would replace them, but we would be making improvements to them, interior improvements, whatever needs to be done. We do finishes, replace that. So we'll be doing that. Well, typically like 25 years or so, we would go in and replace them. We're, we have portables, some of them are 30 years old. We totally refurbish them. Take, you know, as long as they're structurally sound, we'll go in and re we'll do that. Those portables, um, they're not even 20 years old. So I see like ceiling tiles, that's kind of like... Right, that's Warping just, that's interior improvements. That's okay. just replacing ceiling tiles, you know, replacing carpet, replacing things like that. They already have been re-roofed. Okay. So they have been re-roofed, so they won't prevent additional uh, water drainage. So how often do they go in and look at the ceiling tiles? Because my son has been in class, and the ceiling tiles have fallen down. Okay, well, we, we can look at that. Yeah, is there something that perhaps staff can follow up on these concerns? Because I know she's addressed the board a couple of times about um, yes. issues okay. there. Yeah. Yes. So yes. thank you. Um, uh, Kelly, um, we need some technical assistance setting the clock to two minutes. <laughs> so anyone with that expertise here, if you could do that, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to our next um, discussion item. Um, I'm sorry. Um, proposed dates and times of regular board meetings for July 2020 through June 2021. Do any of the board members have comments on this proposed calendar? Mr. Reed. I do. Um, I, I mentioned before my desire to have a board strategic planning session, um, and I would like to see perhaps staff take a look at the calendar and suggest a date that we can uh, either in June or July have um, a strategic planning meeting uh, to uh, strategize and brainstorm um, what our vision is for uh, 2021 and 2020. Um, I, I think that's that's healthy for an organization and a board to have uh, such a such a meeting. Thank you. So, Superintendent, can you bring this calendar back with recommended days for 21, and also bring back? this current year's calendar for recommendations for June 20. Yeah, also, yeah, I, I, I did have a comment too. Um, looking at November uh, 2020, uh, looks like we are meeting on the 5th. Um, it's been a concern of mine that in the past at least three years that I've been on the board that we have missed uh, being part of the city of Rancho Cordova's uh, state of the city uh, only because it's held on the first Thursday at six o'clock and I, I think it's probably important that at least someone from the district if not the board is there to kind of represent and um, you know show our presence there I think it's been kind of empty uh, since we haven't been there and I know there's been talks of uh, the great programs especially at the PAC uh, the Performing Arts Center um, that I think that the district needs to be recognized for. So, Superintendent, is this something we can put on a two by two with Rancho Cordova to see if we can either get them to budge or us to budge or they something? Won't budge. <laughs> so maybe we I should tried. talk, oh. yeah, <laughs> or reach out to them. Yes. Okay. Um, is there anyone from the public who cares when we meet next year? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, moving forward. Um, uh, first reading revisions to board policy BP forty two hundred personnel. Um, it was a yeah, routine update. Does the board have any questions? No. No. Um, we'll see that item. Anyone from the public? No. We'll see that item back under consent next time. And at this point, we need to go back to our public hearing. I'm opening up the public hearing, Folsom Cordova Education Association 2019-2020. Proposed contract openers to the Board of Education. Is there anyone in the public who wishes to address the board on this item now? Okay, seeing no one, I am closing the public hearing. Thank you. Our first discussion action item of the evening is to approve the Folsom attendance boundary change effective 2020-21 school year. Um, Superintendent, I wasn't sure if staff was prepared to make a presentation on this or if we felt the board was comfortable with information on the items. I think um, 
Yeah, we can um, definitely go over the three scenarios that the board asked us to bring back. We don't have a formal PowerPoint presentation, but we can entertain questions. I did want to lead off by saying, um, again, thank you to Mr. Washburn and to Jerry Wickham and Joanne McCarthy from our facilities department in the information that they brought forward, not only the last two meetings, but for the last 14 months that the board has asked us to study the different boundary scenarios. And the reason that we've been charged with that is we have an urgency, we have an issue, we have an over um, enrollment capacity at Vista Del Lago. And this is something that the board has recognized and asked staff to research. And we don't have a capacity issue in Folsom with our high schools. We have plenty of space between Folsom High and Vista Del Lago. Our issue that we're trying to solve is a feeder pattern issue as we look at growth, development, birth rates, and enrollment over time. So the board has asked us to bring that information. We brought back some scenarios at the last meeting um, and uh, board asked us to bring back some different ones. So that's what we have before you this evening. Mr. Washburn can address any of those um, with any questions that the board may have this evening. Um, does the board have any questions on these items? I know that everybody took time to um, uh, reach out to staff if they had concerns. Mr. Reed? Yeah, I just had a, a one quick question. So if the Blanche only option uh, had a majority and the board uh, adopted that, um, will there be space at Folsom Middle to ensure that any student from the Blanche Sprints neighborhood would be able to school choice into Folsom Middle should they have a desire to? Well, I would never say assure because that means every single person would always be able to guarantee that. <laughs> but is there an adequate space there? I would say yes, because of the feeder pattern going from Blanche to Sutter, anybody who would want to choice back to Folsom Middle, there should be adequate space for anybody to choice back there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other yeah, board that questions? takes care of my question. <clears throat> I, I did have one real quick. Um, if Folsom High uh, nearest capacity What's our plan? Are we going to um, start turning away students in other districts? I mean, like do our ITP uh, kind of like Vista does now? Yes, absolutely. We've actually had discussion about that because we have a fairly significant amount of ITPs that go to Folsom High. As Folsom High starts nearing a capacity that we think we can't handle from additional enrollment, then we would start reducing the number of ITPs. Um, you know, it's nice actually having that because it provides ADA to the district now, so it provides funding. So as capacity goes up, we can start reducing those type of ITPs and choice options in the Folsom, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Short. <clears throat> I think you probably mentioned this, but um, uh, the infill uh, that is within Folsom, the boundaries and the growth of south of 50, uh, with the governor's new uh, initiatives on uh, high density low-income housing, there seems to be a concern with infill that some of these numbers might change down the road with high-density uh, uh, land use that the city controls and we don't have control. So I guess these are just based on infill that is more of a low dense, uh, more not a high density, but more of a low density. Is that correct, a single-family dwelling? We have both. Us, we track all the housing within Folsom. Uh, we were close to the building department. They provide us with that. Uh, we have any new development that comes in, both high, low, or medium density. Mm -hmm. And we have various yield rates that we apply to that. So apartments, high density, we have a certain yield rate. Mm -hmm. you know, con condominiums, townhomes, which would be you know, perhaps uh, attached homes would be medium density, and then single family low, would be low density. And then we apply the yield rates to those within each attendance area. We have those numbers that we provide for infill um, based on the development, and those numbers are all included with our projections. So that's something we track for the long term. So it's based on an old rate or well, standard rates that we've typically done Right. We have yield rates that we track and we constantly <clears throat> update. Right, right. We we and we have to. That's part of our requirements, right. especially with our developer justification documents and state reports. We have to monitor and update right. based on new growth and we know a new home typically what the yield rate would be, what the most children come after a certain five years and then what the turnaround is after 10, 15 years. Right. So we we track that data. So, so I guess then with the governor's initiative and the shortage of housing, those rates can change in a year or two depending on the shortage of housing, uh, ADUs, the accessory dwelling unit laws, everything that's coming down the pipeline. We could see a surge of infill and more 
uh, things that might change those yield rates. Is that is that a fair, thing, a fair statement to say? That's always possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. there's only a certain amount of capacity within the city for yeah. more infill projects, and then you know they have added some over time, um, and you know that's something we'll constantly monitor. So it can change these numbers. So oh, yeah, any, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, numbers are you know the projections are snapshots, snapshots, and yeah. you know the the further you go out, obviously the they're least reliable. Um, our projections over the years have been. Pretty, pretty accurate. I mean, we've yeah. been able to track pretty no, closely on that. So. Right on. The other one is on the south of 50 growth. You know, uh, we're going to be half, there's going to be, as the growth goes in south of 50, they were going to have to house some of those kids as we're building those schools. And that would be at Folsom High, correct? And is that part of this equation or that's off the table right now? We have a plan for south of 50. We have adequate housing for that based on our capacity at Folsom High. We have added additional portables. Uh, we are currently doing the okay. CTE program, which will allow additional capacity. And um, based on when we would reach functional capacity, by that time we have plans that we're already working for a new high school south of 50. Right. At that time we would be housing those students before we reached uh, over capacity at Folsom High School. Oh, so we are, we'll have some transitional Yes, we are. We uh, already have housing portables. Among, uh, we're taking portables off of projects as <clears> we're doing some of the Measure G projects I indicated. We're taking old portables, refurbishing them providing them there also at Folsom Middle School. So we have additional capacity for that that we're building in for those south of 50 kids until a new school is built. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Question. Hoover. Um, yeah, just two quick questions. Uh, first of all, thank you to the staff for putting together these grids. Uh, I think they really help visualize the data better. I know that these projected numbers are lower than the resident enrollment numbers that were in the report. Um, so do they take into account uh, projections on uh, transfers out? Is that why they're lower? or They are slightly lower. Um, some of the percentage of students that uh, choice out are actually, it's actually between at Vista de Lago, it's about 17% that choice out. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that number of their 50 that is, is one thing, it's not really a choice, that is an overflow, right. which are included in the numbers. So what we don't know is how many of those 50 kids that were overflowed last year will want to come back next year because that's the first year that we've had those policies at Vista del Lago. So those numbers aren't included in there. So if those are, that could slightly increase those numbers a bit. Okay. And then uh, last question. I know that the staff's um, preferred proposal, at least at the last meeting and throughout the process, has been to send Folsom Hills and Blanche Sprints to Folsom Middle uh, and Folsom High School basically due to, so that we don't kind of create a new problem at the middle school, mm -hmm. uh, mid one of the middle schools. So I guess my question would be, is there concern that tonight's proposal, uh, I, I forget which one it is, uh, to send both schools to Sutter and Folsom High, that that would put uh, kind of create new challenges at Sutter Middle School uh, based on uh, just kind of capacity issues and numbers at the middle schools? Well, if you're talking about the one that sends both schools, actually the proposal is that one school, one would go to Sutter and one would go to Folsom Middle. Okay. So, because of the right. impact at the middle school, they both can't go to Sutter. So the way we have it is Folsom Hills actually goes to Sutter, Sutter. and then Blanche Sprints goes to Folsom Middle, I mean to, um, yeah, Folsom Middle. And then with the there would should be able to be choice options. Okay, that's to be able the to goal. Change. Yeah, because on the earlier uh, scenarios that were presented, you can't send them all. There's just too many kids right. that would be going to Sutter. It was right. like 900 and 1700 the, the mix. It was too much of an imbalance. Okay. So this is one way to balance out the middle schools. One would have a continuum and one not, and then there may be some opportunity for choice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt, thank you. And I think it's important to note that staff has put a lot of hard work into this over, in my mind, almost two years. Um, and um, I just want to make mention that we have some pretty outstanding staff members in our district. And um, they are true professionals and um, appreciate all the hard work you put into this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, these numbers, would you remind me if... Um, are these more on actual enrollment than projections, correct? Are, are we taking into consideration looking at the solid numbers that we have on enrollment reports for these? Yeah, this is enrollment projections based on the enrollment we have, taking all the residents, taking the enrollment, 
then figuring in a percentage, certain number of percentages that would choice, and then you know depending on the school, and then applying those those factors each year. So those mobility factors and how they normally transfer each year, and then pro providing those projections. There's a lot of background information that goes into these charts. I mean, it's easy just to present this chart, but behind it, if we look at all of them, <clears throat> how many kids coming in from the feeder districts all the way up, all the way in the ninth grade, how many typically <laughs> matriculate in. Then you have to add in how many kids would be coming in from new development typically each year. And then there's other factors. We have a, a surge at ninth grade because we have people that come back from private school as well. Okay. So we have to take into those considerations. And then you look at the choice policies and then trying to determine what the actual projection will be for each school. And as you know, with the three, and these also indicate three years really of grandfathering. So three years, essentially, there isn't really any change in you know, those numbers. And that's where the registration priorities and policies will really have to come into play. Everyone will be back for that, I'm sure, <laughs> too. So thank you. Um, Mr. You have a question? Okay, go ahead. Oh. In, in that regard, out of, out of all this, explain, I think, not for the edification for the board and the, and the community, is what is the, the pros and cons of functional capacity versus cap capacity? Uh, there's a lot of differences between the two, and I think there's been some confusion in the community and us that what is capacity and what does that mean, the restrictions? and uh, it, I, I think what you're going to probably explain what least impacts operations and, and how we uh, make those decisions and based on functional versus uh, the cap. So obviously, the, you know, if you're at maximum capacity at your school, there's also impacts to the infrastructure. You have impacts, you know, counseling, restrooms, parking, you know, just safety, number of kids that are actually crossing. Those are some of the impacts that we see at sites. Then. You have the, the other impacts we have as well as hot seating. Right now, uh, Vista Lago is about 85% hot seating. Uh, functional capacity is about 50% hot seating. You know, optimal capacity would be down where there's very minimal hot seating. So those are kind of some of the factors that we look at that are impacting the site. And you know, it, it would not be a goal to have maximum hot seating at the site. You start losing some of your flexibility as well. And so maintaining that 1850 to 1900, we're maintaining that 85% hot seating for three years. Correct. Yeah. Just to clarify. Okay. Um, any other board questions? Yeah. Okay, we have a number of speakers on this. So before we begin, I want to know if there's any students here who wanted to speak on this. And you, are you budget or boundaries? Okay. <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> I almost wish I could let you speak right now. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay. Let's try to get this moving along. And um, yes. Okay. If you're a student who wants to speak, come on up. And I guess I want to ask. The, um, um, I don't know if I want to do this out of order, but I really hate to have the students sit here for what could be an hour and a half of comments on this. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out if we want to try to navigate that. Go ahead, young man. Hi, my name is Quentin. Um, I want to go to the same high school that my friends from middle school went to. Thank you. Very good. Now... If all the comments are like that, we will get out of here. Sorry, I'm from Blanche Prince, by the way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay, no other students on the budget. Okay. Um, on the, on the boundaries, on the boundaries, thank you. Okay, we do have a, a, a number of speakers who have numbered their cards, so I'm going to assume after I say Melanie Myers that the rest of you will know who you are, and if you just want to line up and start speaking, um, we could. that would probably expedite this. If you need me to call out the names, I will, but I have cards numbered 1 through 9 in a particular order, so do they know when... Everybody knows when to speak. All right. I think you should just call out their names. Okay. Time. Okay. okay. Um, I, we are going to adhere to two minutes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank Got you. it. 
Uh, good evening, members of the school board. Thank you again uh, for hearing us. Together, we are passionate, committed, active members of our community as parents, as team moms, coaches, volunteers in our schools, um, as teachers, pastors, scout leaders, to name just a few of the many roles that we serve in our community. We participate with our kids in our community in deep and extensive ways, and that gives us a holistic perspective on the discussions and the impact of changing our boundaries. You will hear from several parents tonight, but we wanna focus our comments on a few key points that we feel need extra attention. First, we strongly oppose what was described before as scenario 3-3A. It still includes a broken feeder pattern for Blanche. Uh, more than 630 people in Folsom signed a petition opposing this, and I have a copy of that if you'd like it. Uh, there's 17 pages of signatures, and these are Folsom you know, parents who are saying we don't want a broken feeder pattern, and this is important to us. The numbers that staff presented don't support needing to move Folsom Hills. Um, it seems like a dramatic overcorrection, given that the demographics of our neighborhood and the Vista zone is changing. Um, and, and so we wanna make sure that you understand that. There's also been very little real conversation about uh, crowding at Folsom High. Uh, shifting both of the schools, we feel, will push Folsom High to exceed its functional capacity, especially when you bring in the south of 50 students. I know there's been some discussion about that. We also feel that having one deliberately small um, and one very massive high school also raises equity issues in our community. It's harder for Folsom High kids to get on sports teams. It's harder to get roles in theater productions, debate teams, among others. Low engagement leads to low academic performance, and that's not good for our kids. Crowding is not just a problem at Vista. Um, we also see hot seating at Folsom High already. Um, and finally, we elect you to create accountability, oversight, and transparency in this system. We thank you for not just rubber stamping. Um, we want you to ask tough questions. You are elected to represent us, um, and that's what we, what we want. Um, please hear the voices of all of these many dedicated, passionate parents who, just like you, give to their community day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, uh, Rudy, Rudy Calderon, and followed by Karen Lee. So if Karen, if you, thank you, could be ready to speak after Rudy, or if, thank you. Good evening, uh, members of the board. Thank you for your service to the community. Members of the staff also, thank you for your service to the community. Much appreciated. I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about um, whether action to change the school boundaries is warranted, and if so, how extensive that action should be. The district's own numbers suggest that the current enrollment bubble at Vista will correct itself over time on its own. And in a few years, uh, doing a boundary change five years ago might have been a good idea, but doing so now would be an overcorrection that could be harmful for, to Folsom High School. As I understand it, Folsom High School would could grow to uh, 3,000 students if both Folsom Hills Elementary and Blanche Brents are moved to Folsom High School. And on top of that, uh, the south of 50 developments would be attending Folsom High School uh, until there's critical mass south of 50 to build a new high school, which could take, as I understand, the population there up to 4,000. I don't think uh, many people here think that Folsom High School at 4,000 is a good idea. Uh, some here have said that uh, all the time and money spent doing the, the community meetings, all the data analysis, over the last couple of years would be for nothing if no action is taken by, by the board to change boundaries. Uh, it kind of reminds me of situations I've encountered myself in, as an environmental planner in my career. As a planner, I was charged with evaluating development projects, uh, identifying environmental impacts, and in, uh, identifying mitigation measures to mitigate those impacts. There were times when I found that a project didn't have any impacts that needed to be mitigated, and public stakeholders would say, so you spent all this time and money uh, evaluating the project, you found no impacts. Couldn't you have said that from the beginning? No, that's not the way it goes. You collect your data, you do your due diligence, act on that data, not on preconceived notions of whether you should take action or not. If act taking action overreaches or is unnecessary and is pursued regardless of what the data says, then that tells me that the money spent and time allocated to the process is more important than my kids' well-being through their school years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Karen, followed by 
Dan, I'm still not going to try to pronounce your last name this, this meeting either. So you're after uh, Karen. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Karen Lee, and I have spent the last year at every board meeting, every roundtable discussion, and everything that this district has presented as far as the boundaries go. And I still don't see that I can find solid evidence for why the boundary changes, change needs to happen. The district's words over capacity keeps being used, but I haven't seen anything with tangible examples of how shifting these students from Vista to Folsom won't cause the same problems at Folsom. I'm also curious why the district has been so hesitant to present the, number, the numbers of the do-nothing scenario using historical rates, such as the number that 20% choice out of Vista in their projections. At one of the roundtable meetings, the superintendent said to me, we are working with a bubble right now that's trying to move through Vista. I think after finally seeing the numbers tonight of the do nothing option, it really is just a bubble and there's no need to redraw any boundaries. The situation works itself out without having to disrupt the lives of our students. While all this effort has been made to show how the numbers will shift from Vista to Folsom, I don't think the district has put the time and energy into looking at the negative impact it will cause Folsom High if the boundaries are redrawn. If you speak to students at Folsom High, they will tell you it is already hard enough to get into classes they need. And student ratio numbers for Folsom are higher than Vista in so many areas. In speaking with Mayor Howell, she mentioned parking is already a problem at Folsom High. How is the district presenting, proposing to correct any of the existing problems while also shifting additional students to Folsom High? In addition, if you drove down East Bidwell yesterday, you would have seen a significant police presence trying to crack down on speeding and red light runners. It is a very dangerous street. There have been multiple tra fatal accidents on East Bidwell, Bidwell this year. The boundary proposals that are being presented redirect hundreds more students across e East Bidwell twice a day, many of them new drivers. If you vote yes on the boundary changes, you are intentionally sending hundreds of new drivers across East Bidwell twice a day, five days a week. With the numbers that have been presented tonight, the lack of tangible reasoning to show the actual need for boundary changes, the fact that there has been no information reported about how this will impact Folsom High, and add into the equation the risk of intentionally sending hundreds of new drivers across East, each, East Bidwell twice a day, five days a week, can you actually say that what the district is proposing is worth that risk? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, welcome again. Uh, followed by Casey Lee, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk about the guiding principles that are in the boundary report. Uh, you're probably very familiar with these and how it relates to our kids' safety. So safety, as you can see, is one of the five uh, guiding principles that's been established by the District Boundary Committee. And when I look at the definition, it talks about site capacities and the ability to house students, uh, uh, sorry, ability to safely house the accurate number of students. And as a parent, when I read this, we're really talking about safety on school grounds. Again, functional capacity, building capacity, and so on. And in fact, if I knew that that was the definition of safety, I'm not sure I would have voted the same way in the survey when they asked uh, to rank the various um, guiding principles. But when I look at the other guiding principles, such as walking distances, transportation, geographic features, and I look at some of the key words in here, I, I do notice that there's quite a few things here that do resonate for me as a parent in regards to safety. I see walking, transportation, buses, traffic, crossings, major streets, thoroughfares, open spaces. So I was curious, these are your guiding principles. How did you evaluate these? I did a word search for every single one of those words and there's not a single mention outside this box, okay? And the frustrating thing is I actually looked for other keywords, cars, drive, accident, bicycles, trails, intersections, again, nothing. So looking at this, I'm, I'm frightened as a parent that our safeties, our kids' uh, uh, safety in terms of commuting to and from school is not even really being considered a priority in this whole process. In fact, the discussion has all been based on safety on campus. So let me present some simple numbers as I see it. Folsom Hills to Vista is 3.5 miles. Folsom Hills to Folsom High is 4.8 miles. That's a different of, difference of 1.3 miles with Folsom High being further away. So that means our commute from, to school will increase by 35%. But more importantly, that means that it increases the risk of an accident by 35%. And that's a concern as a parent. And what's really frustrating is that we have no control over this decision because we've entrusted that to you as our elected officials. 
And the challenge that I see is that you're being asked to make a decision based on recommendations that seem to completely disregard several of the Boundary Committee's guiding principles. Your decision should be based on all the guiding principles. And it means balancing the safety of our kids on school grounds as well as during school commutes. And regardless of this challenge, I do trust that the board will make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Casey, Casey Lee followed by Jennifer Cole. Okay, thank you. Jennifer followed by Raja. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cole. I have a junior at Vista Del Lago and two freshmen, so I'm a mom in the thick of it. So um, I asked each of my children, and they asked over 50 of their friends as well the past few days, do you have a problem going to the restroom, finding space? No. Do you have a problem finding a seat in the cafeteria? No. Do you have a problem getting into flex time? No. Parking? Yes, that's an issue. It always has been an issue. We would like to continue to work with the city of Folsom to resolve that. But until then, we do appreciate the efforts that Folsom has done to provide us with some more uh, parking spaces on the street. Because of all of this, it makes me question why are we continuing to look at a possibility that would have feet or broken patterns uh, for Blanche when the problem resolves itself within three years. Another thing I'd like to talk about is the sense of community. Folsom Hills, yes, we have had a choice between Vista and Folsom High. I would say resounding, Folsom Hills parents tend to go to Vista. That is the school that we look at. That is the school that historically our older children have gone to as well. My daughter is on the dance team. I'm the team mom there. My two sons are on the soccer team. I've become involved with the soccer team. I'm involved in their various clubs. I'm on the junior prom committee. I am invested at Vista. That is our school. That is the school that we feel we have community. That's the school that my family has invested time and resources in. My son is in the Vista uh, Talons feeder program. My husband is a coach there, thinking he would be going to Vista. I ask on behalf of my son, a fourth grader at Folsom Hills, as well as every other child at Folsom Hills that I'm representing that has older siblings, please look at that consideration. Allow our children to be able to call Vista Del Lago their alma mater, just as their older siblings will have the opportunity to. Thank you. Thank you. Raj, followed by Emily Brayton. Hello, I'm Raj Jagadeesan. Thank you for the time. And thank you for uh, exploring what I'm sure has been a totally non-contentious issue uh, for the board. So um, I'm a, a Blanche Sprint's uh, resident, but actually my son's at Theodore Judah Academy. So uh, three things I want to talk about. So the first was uh, broken feeder patterns. Um, one of the moms actually put a really nice white paper together talking about the literature that shows that broken feeder patterns actually impact children's development academically, socially, and actually it, it affects the uh, most highly achieving uh, students the worst. So I, I want to ask that that be a consideration to, to not have broken feeder patterns as others are talking about. Um, the second is, um, so I think, you know, we kind of built a system that, you know, we have two equal sized middle schools feeding into two unequal sized high schools. We kind of saw this train coming a while ago. And as long as that's the problem, then I think um, we're going to have this tension, right? We're going to have this tension of trying to figure out how to switch people around. So I, I would ask two things to, to, to change the assumption. So do we need to enlarge Vista, right? So that we don't have to have this tension in parents fighting parents and Oak Chan versus Folsom Hills, et cetera, et cetera. Or, as has been pointed out, do we just wait for this bolus to move through, right? You know, as, as we wait for this bolus to move through, and then Vista, as you can see in the numbers, kind of comes back down on its own, I would consider not changing the boundaries. And, and please keep that as a consideration, not change the boundaries. The third thing I'd like to bring up is Theodore Judah Academy in particular. So a couple of years ago, the, so Theodore Judah Academy, as you guys know, so it's some of the most highly academically motivated kids. You have to test into your 95th percentile to get in, et cetera, et cetera. It's a plurality of students go through uh, Folsom Middle and then Vista, but not all. A couple years ago, they all had a guaranteed path of school choice so they could stay together with their friends and, and move through together. That was taken away a couple years ago, so now in middle and high school, they go back to whatever the school boundaries are. So as a Blanche friend's parent, my student will then leave his friends who are then going to Vista, et cetera. So I would ask that to consider at least these small edge cases, because I think you know, how we treat some of these most academically motivated children in our, in our school district really reflects upon us as a community as well. 
and think about why people move to Folsom and the importance of those school systems, the life choices they make, and the, the houses they buy kind of were predicated upon those choices from a couple years ago. So please consider Theodore Tudor Academy as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Emily, and then we'll finish up with Ruth. Thank you everyone for your time and your energy. And first of all, I did want to say that I don't think there really is a need to change the boundary. Um, and in fact, I am a mom of a fifth grader at Folsom Hills. And through all of this, I really will be considering him going to Sutter and on to Folsom and really um, taking note of that and not just assuming, oh, we're going to Folsom Middle and then Vista. And then to the point um, that Raja just brought up, really focusing on um, those broken feeder patterns. Um, kids are emotionally resilient, yes, but many are not. And so if you can imagine um, kids at Folsom Middle, the majority of their friends go on to Vista, a very small number go on to Folsom High, um, that can lead to depression when they've lost their emotional support, which can lead to suicide. Um, even worse, it can lead to isolation. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that today Folsom Middle School did have an active shooter drill. So I think we need to take that to heart and really remember and to have kids have the most emotional support that they can and keep feeding patterns the same. Sutter Folsom. Thank you. Or none at all. Thank you. Uh, Ruth? And um, I didn't want to misspeak. We still have speaker cards. It was just a group that was all together. So, okay, thank you. I would like to begin by acknowledging the time and work that has gone into evaluating the school boundaries as they relate to the middle and high school in Folsom Cordova Unified School District. I can relate as I've spent hours researching, reading, and understanding documents related to school capacity that go back as far as 2013. Based on the data that has been presented to the public um, and these documents, I continue to have unanswered questions. I don't have clarity on why a boundary change is the solution. And I continue to feel there's lack of evidence that pr was provided to me so that I could have a side-by-side -side view of what that we're comparing apples to apples, that when you say Folsom has capacity, we're really truly measuring the same thing because I went through the documents and I did my own side by side. And there's probably a lot of information I'm not educated in a way to understand, but I, it, it's still very confusing. If the recommendation for boundary changes stems from the district's position that immediate change is needed for Vista de Lago High School, then I believe this can only come from innovative and solution focused approaches. The projected numbers of actual students demonstrate that Vista de Lago will be at or below functional capacity within the next few years. So I continue to question how a boundary change resolves the immediate concerns. Has the problem been accurately identified or defined? Where is the measurable quantitative data that demonstrates what will change and be improved by the removal of our students from that pathway, especially in light of the continued growth? Our city continues to be in a state of development and change with many unknowns that may impact the needs of our schools in the upcoming years. Is it the right time to change boundaries now when we have not allowed time to have more insight into these potential impacts? What will be the unintended consequences to such a strong focus on only changing boundaries with data that is not inclusive of the complete picture? I obviously have a lot more to say, so I'll probably skip to the end here. I feel fortunate to live in a community filled with inventive, resourceful, and forward-thinking teachers and administrators. The fact that I have not seen any direct impact to my daughter or any of her friends with regards to the number of students at Vista del Lago campus is evident of that. While the numbers are not at optimal, I think the Vista staff and teachers have done a wonderful job with operating slightly above functional capacity and successfully have managed to ensure minimal impact to the quality of teaching and academic environment has happened for their students. We live in a very fortunate community with resources and talents that should afford us the ability to expect excellence in all we do, especially when it comes to our children. I am here tonight to advocate for another path forward to ensure we are serving this community with the excellence I know we are capable of. Do not interpret this to mean that I discount the needs of our teachers or that I am minimizing we have circumstances that are less than ideal. I just believe we have not defined the problem appropriately and that things can be done differently to enhance and support growth and development for our middle and high schoolers. 
I do not mean any disrespect to the district and the time and resources they have put into this proposal, but I cannot accept that what has been put forth is the right choice for all of us. I believe that what I'm asking can be possible if there is a standard expectation we choose for ourselves in approaching the many challenges that face the management for this district. I spoke out years ago, several weeks ago, and I'm here again this evening. My exp opinions expressed are not done so with thinking that I can put this expectation out there on the administration and staff and then just sit back and wait for them to do the heavy lifting. I understand what I'm asking is not simple, but I do believe it is a reasonable expectation. I am committed to being part of finding our way to the next level of academic excellence for our students. However, I am allowed to participate in that. So committed that I just traveled 30 hours home early from a business trip in Buenos Aires didn't see my kids showered and came straight here to be able to continue to be a part of this decision. I urge you all to please consider if we've really evaluated everything. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to stress, please try to keep your comments to two minutes. We do have a lengthy discussion following this about the budget. So please. Um, speaking of that, Stephanie, Barry, you have boundary changes and budget cuts, so do you want to speak on both? I'll, all right, I'll put your card back in the budget pile and you can come back for budget, so speak to the boundaries now. Hi, uh, my honorable members of the board, my name is Stephanie Barry, and I'm here today to pro provide public comment on the proposed boundary changes for Vista Del Lago and Folsom High School. I live in the Oak Chan Elementary School boundaries and I have two daughters who currently attend Oak Chan, one who will start sixth grade at Folsom Middle next year. First, I'd like to commend district staff for their hard work and hundreds of hours spent looking at various scenarios. It's not a small undertaking and they should be commended for looking at solutions that actually solve this problem. I spent a lot of time carefully looking at the scenarios that staff considered earlier this year. I looked at the projected data. First, as has been noted, there's enough space to accommodate all students in Folsom. It's just that there are too many current students currently slated for VISTA. And that's why we're here today to try and rebalance the schools. Folsom's a very large high school. It was the only high school in Folsom for many years, and Vista is a much smaller high school. And unfortunately, the way things are going, more students are actually slated to go to, to Vista in terms of resident students than Folsom at this point. And of course, the middle schools are of equal size, so there's some problems with overcrowding um, by moving some to Sutter as opposed to keeping them where they are. The data the district provided is that functional capacity at Vista is 1,724 students, and optimal capacity is 1,429 students. Functional capacity is defined as 50% hot seating for teachers. Before these scenarios, I had never even heard of the, the concept of hot seating before. Um, my mother is a high school teacher, French teacher, for more than 20 years in San Diego. When I was a child, I would go to her classroom in August to get ready for the school year. She would hang up posters that showed numbers and colors in English and French. She had French decor, all things that made the classroom an inviting place to learn. I can't imagine the stress she would be under if she hadn't had a dedicated classroom to feel grounded and prepared to teach. The fact that doing nothing will keep hot seating at 85% is unacceptable in my opinion for teachers and for a good learning environment for everyone. Um, hot, seating, hot seating should not exist and I'm gonna go over time very soon. Um, I also think that adding portable classrooms to increase um, capacity is not, should not be considered given the fact that you're also considering budget cuts today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very well we're gonna have uh, Tony followed by Cassandra. Thank you. Thought it was a good time. <laughs> uh, Tony Ruiz, uh, teacher of Vista Del Lago. That, that last speaker kind of said kind of what I wanted to say because in 2014, I've been in this district, you know, this is my 16th year in this district. In 2014, the population of Vista was 1514, which is above optimal capacity. Mm -hmm. We are now at 1856, which is above even functional capacity. And any of these ideas that we're talking about is still going to keep us over functional capacity. Mm -hmm. And I feel for the parents, I really do. But you know who hasn't been asked in any of these scenarios is the staff who have to deal with these numbers day in, day out. I can tell you, for my fellow teachers at Vista, we are running on fumes and trying to do the best we can in an incredibly difficult situation. I don't know how much, you know, according to just this chart that I'm looking at right here, we're gonna stay at 1850 
for another five years. We cannot continue like that. We are not able to deliver the type of education that we want to deliver. We're gonna work our butts off. We're gonna work harder than we've ever worked before. But this solution up here keeps us at the status, keep, really does keep us at the status quo. Mm -hmm. And how does that help things? I don't know what the answer is. That's beyond my pay grade. My job is in the classroom. I'm an English teacher. But you know what doesn't work? Saying that there is no problem. There is a problem. I've been doing this job for too long to not realize that there's a problem. Now, we all, staff, parents, we depend on the board. We depend on the employees of the school district to help us generate solutions. So let's keep generating solutions, but let's not pretend that this problem doesn't exist. Thank you. Uh, Cassandra, followed by Quentin Lappin. Hello. Welcome. Okay, my, hi. My name is Cassandra Niklefsky. I'm a mom of two boys, one at Folsom Hills and one at Folsom Middle. My sons are not here tonight because they're trying out for the Vista Lacrosse Feeder Program. We spent last night at the Vista Feeder Program football banquet. I stood here weeks ago concerned about the safety based on a high volume high school specifically concerning, concerning the sheer size of what we expect Folsom High to grow to. Since I was here last, there was a shooting at Southern California High School where a 16-year-old child shot himself and two others. On the heels of an active shooter drill today at Folsom Middle School, a school of 3,000 to 4,000 students is alarmingly large and unmanageable. Where is it in your budget cuts to provide more teachers, security, staff, and safety procedures to handle this? To this date, we have only heard that you will move the students, but not how you will protect them. This leaves our children exposed and not what the Folsom community represents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Quentin followed by Laura Peterson Schaefer. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> Laura. And then Robert uh, Rademacher, Rademacher. Thank you. Hi there, Laura Peterson Schaefer. Thank you for the time tonight. Um, last board meeting, I brought up the problem with the Folsom Hills Elementary Spanish Magnet Program. I'm gonna reiterate that tonight because it's extremely important to me and my family. And it's a handful of kids similar to the Theodore Judith that we talked about earlier. Um, when we originally started, we, we looked at our schools. We decided to go with the Spanish program, knowing that we could go to either middle, either high school. We had planned that way. Similar to how other people have spoken about the broken feeder system, you can't take these kids, put them at Folsom Elementary, Folsom Middle, without even having a choice, just they can go there by application, not by address, and then break the feeder and put them over at Folsom High. That is a huge disruption emotionally, socially, mentally, academically, um, major problems can happen with that. Again, my daughter, who's in eighth grade, is a prime example of this. I don't want to see her going through the broken feeder program and having things happen and her, her support group of all her friends going to Vista and now suddenly she's handpicked out and having to go to Folsom High. When, when she was five years old, we made this decision where she would go to high school. So I just want to address that. And then Mr. Reed shared with us at our last board meeting about how detrimental it was to him having gone with two other friends to a different high school and how that affected him. So that's a perfect case in point right there. And I just wanted to reiterate that and take it into your consideration tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, followed by Mark Johnson. Welcome. Good evening, President Reeking and members of the board. Um, here tonight, I wanted to um, address two issues. Um, the first issue was, um, this is in regard to the boundary um, uh, line uh, proposed adjustments. Um, President Reeking um, had a very good proposal at the last board meeting to require all upcoming high school students moving into the city through new developments, et cetera, be required to attend Folsom High School only to address the crowding issues at Vista. I was disappointed to see that data was not presented tonight or made available to show how this proposal alone would affect the future student attendance number at Vista High School. I would hope that uh, the board would further uh, consider this proposal as part of an overall plan tonight instead of considering any uh, attendance boundary changes brought before the board. 
The second uh, issue I wanted to address was I wanted to thank uh, board member Joshua Hoover uh, for the wonderful interview he did with the Folsom Telegraph. Um, it's in the November 14 edition of the paper called School District Should Listen to Parents. Uh, the parents here tonight have expressed some really good ideas and the board sh um, should um, listen to them. Um, Mr. Hoover gets it. I hope that the rest of the board will join him tonight since attendance boundary changes should be a measure of very last resort. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Johnson followed by Sarah Gibson. Good evening members of the board. Um, I'm Mark Johnson. We're from the Blanche Brent School area. And uh, one thing I wanted to, to mention in the last presentation, I was a little um, concerned that we were kind of called out as being uh, having a very low response rate. Um, Blanche's response rate was 2.6%. The average for the elementary schools was 4.3. Uh, we also are the second lowest um, attendance population out of the elementary schools. So I think when you take things into consideration, it's a little unfair to um, you know, call us out as, a, as if we're not uh, concerned. We are concerned we're, and, and we're here. Um, I wanna uh, make a suggestion before I run out of time and that is uh, currently the middle school students at Folsom Middle, uh, it's just the Blanche and Folsom Hill students that select a high school from what I understand. Um, and I would suggest that you make that option available to all the eighth grade parents. Um, you give them that option, they know they have a choice now rather than just assuming they're gonna to go to Vista. You might get a lot more parents choosing to go to Folsom High and that'll help solve some of these problems. Um, options one and two, the, the latest ones, I don't really see a clear benefit over the do nothing option. Um, you get to functional capacity at Vista in four years versus five if you do nothing. Um, and I'd like to clarify, I think Mr. Washburn said that Vista was currently at 85% hot seating, but functional capacity is 50%. I believe he said that, so it's a little bit lower. Um, and I think the other options really just push that functional capacity around to the other schools. So I don't really see a clear benefit over um, the do nothing option. And I'd like to disagree with the notion that just because you've spent a significant amount of time and effort crunching the data, that you then have to do something with that data and, and make a change. If the data dictates that a change isn't really ne necessary or beneficial, then uh, I, s I say you follow the data and you don't really have to make a change simply because you've invested time in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah followed by Zinn Bowling and then Brian Baird is the last card I have on this item. Just checking. Hi. Hi. My name's Sarah Gibson. Sort of following in his footsteps, uh, we moved to Folsom for schools. We moved to our neighborhood for the feeder pattern. I currently reside in the Blanche Sprints um, school boundaries, but my children go to Folsom Hills in the Spanish Magnet program. My concern is, and it's unfortunate, that we're pitted against Folsom Hills. That's where my friends are. That's where my children's friends are. But I worry that Blanche doesn't have as strong of a voice, and I hope that they're not getting swept under the rug because Folsom Hills has such a strong voice. That being said, I still think that it's unfortunate that my kids wouldn't be able to stay with their friends and wouldn't be able to go to the schools that we hoped that they would go to in purchasing our properties. And so I hope that we're able to, you know, resolve that issue with just keeping sort of what we had hoped when we moved to this area. Also, I think I read at some point that there was some hope of possibly promoting Folsom High and all of the great things that they have there to try and, you know, try and get kids to go there and then hopefully the other kids would be able to attend Vista. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Zan and then Brian Bird, I'm sorry. Hey, good Welcome. evening members, well, board members. Uh, my name is Xin, and my daughter is a, a student and in Fosun Hill Elementary School. And so I come here to ask you and keep keep the boundary for the um, Fosun Hills Elementary School to Vista and also to the um, Fosun Middle School. Her siblings attended both of those schools. Like my son currently is a senior in Vista, and her sis, my older sister, is graduate from college 
She also attended the both uh, Vista and the Folsom Middle. As, uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Hey. <coughs> Hi, well, good evening board members, superintendent. Um, my name is Brian Bird. I am a, uh, I've got three kids, one at Vista, one at Folsom Middle, and one at Blanche Sprints. And I just wanted to lend my voice to the advocates for the no change. Uh, I do agree that uh, sometimes making no decision could be the right decision. For, for me, it just doesn't seem to pass. You, you've got all these kids that surround Folsom Middle, and now you're going to tell them you can't go to that school. Th th that just alone just seems silly. And you're going to have them drive. You're going to have some traffic, unintended consequences for them driving out to Sutter when they could be walking or biking to school. So, so that I want to add my voice to that and speak up for Blanche Sprints. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Silpa Patel, and then um, I have no other cards to speak on this, and I'm going to say last call for speaker cards. Okay, thank you. Hello. Um, I'm a parent of three children at Blanche Springs Elementary, and as it was mentioned before, we have a small school with very involved parents. We may not participate in messages to the district, but we are very much a community. Um, that being said, our school also consists of probably the biggest socioeconomic, economically challenged subset of students in Folsom. So splitting them up from their support system, the other friends and families that they've made when they go to middle school and then move them into high school seems a bit unequitable. You've heard from a lot of Folsom Hills parents that don't want to move to from Vista. Well, I believe that there are just as many Blanche Springs parents that wouldn't want their children to then face additional instability by moving from a middle school to a different high school than the rest of their social cohorts. So that's what I want to add. I hope that you take into account their social, social mental health when you make this decision. Thank you. All right. At this point, we're going to open it up to board comments. Mr. Short, okay, I, Mr. Clark. No, I'll, I'll, Mr. I, I just want to knock this out real quick. And um, actually, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and then just talking to parents, and uh, actually, believe it or not, talking to kids as well. Uh, when I went out to Folsom Hills, just to ask a few questions. But um, just to start. Um, I know our staff has worked for probably about fourteen months on this, and. Um, you know, analyzing current numbers and student data and came up with alternatives and um, that would hopefully fix this problem. Um, last board me meeting, I did not have an opportunity to publicly thank Dr. Kaligian and thank the staff for your hard work. And I think that needs to be noticed tonight. Um, I don't think some of you all will be happy with the uh, comments that I'm going to make, but I, I'm just going to dive into it and just say, you know, a, a cap of 1,900 students at Vista is still above the optimal, optimal and functional capacity of the school previously identified as staff and, and should not be used as a rationale for no changes. I'm just going to go out and say that, I'm, I, and I'm sorry that I am. I, like I said, I know you guys aren't going to be happy with that, but um, I I look at things like the consideration and uh, the school safety, community, school engagement, uh, even the broken feeder system, emotional health, social stability, and even dis and even a distance uh, between schools. And you know, I, I looked at that when I was thinking about okay, well. How am I going to move on this thing? Um, the choices that were presented to us two, two weeks ago didn't quite work for us. We sent it back to staff, and they came back with two more. Um, so no matter what the decision's going to be, just know that 
I know that you guys are advocating and I and parents and I thank you guys. Um, you have public comment, emails, phone calls, uh, meetings that you invited my colleagues as well as myself to. Um, but when I listened to most of the testimony, it was basically about staying in the same schools as their friends and siblings. And guess what, folks? I understand that. I get that. I mean, I want that for your kids. But I honestly, I think there's probably a deeper issue here. And right now, we as a district, we're really scratching the surface. Uh, you asked us as a board to keep an open mind. So I'm going to ask you as parents to do the same thing. I think we as parents, in living through this ourselves, the journey through high school or through middle school, high school, it, it, it's an experience. And uh, you're inundated with passing periods and different lunches and different classes. And, and it will no doubt lead to new things. And what I mean by new things is the development of new friendships and new opportunities. And I'm not telling you or telling the kids to dump your old friends, but you know, I, I work in public relations and business development, and I, I believe in expanding the network. And if anything, and no matter what decision is made, give your kids an opportunity to do that, to expand their network and meet new friends. It's gonna help them later on in life uh, into college, uh, into the workforce, and into adulthood. So I'm gonna end that comment with that. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Short. Uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna try to try to augment, not repeat a lot of things what uh, Mr. Clark said, but I, I do wanna kinda step back and look where we've come and where we've been. Uh, I want to start off that uh, my background, too, was, uh, you know, it's like any other board member has experience when I grew up where we didn't really have feeders where I grew up. We we actually went uh, into a, a dual high school situation. And what Mr. Clark is saying kind of hit a home run with me because I had a, uh, to, myself personally, had to attend two different high schools during my four-year term. And I got to meet a lot of different friends. I went to both high school, uh, both high school same times, and that's just how the district did it back then, due to capacity and, and educational opportunities. How we used to do it back down in the valley area. So down in different areas, a lot of schools don't have that, and some do. And so you look around, and there's a lot of different ones. But it does kind of hit a home run with me where you do have. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend two high schools at the same time, a clear across town, a lot more distance than we have here between Vista and. Uh, Folsom. But I want to kind of address something about board governance. Everybody says we're reliant on the board. And that is very true. And what is board governance? Well, you know, board governance is dealing with the political and the uh, the governance part of it. And governance is really dealing with day-to-day -day operations. We are a, a team of five, and we have a, we're supposed to have a comprehensive, unified approach to things. We're supposed to make decisions collectively. We will have deliberation. We'll have differences in what we do, but we're a board of five, not of one. And, and so the decisions that we have to make here have to be balanced, and we, we've heard from everyone. So we have to take the policies, listen to the community, and listening to the operations to our superintendent is our only employee, is really our only employee, is our superintendent. That does it to day-to-day -day operations, and that impacts all our staff and our teachers, our unions, and all the way down to the classroom. So with that said, when we make decisions, we have to look at the, the whole operations, the, the community, and a balanced approach to that. And that's a very difficult situation, especially when you have issues like this that are close to all of our hearts that do impact us. And, and it, it, it makes a lot of sense. I, 
kids, we love our kids and we want to make sure they have the best opportunities and everything. But we really, the, the bottom line is we looked for all kids learning for across the board at no matter what economic develop, uh, uh, demographics or whatever they come from. We have to make sure as a board that it's for all kids. And that's our number one, the learning conducive learning environment and for kids. And, and the facilities and everything else goes along with it. And we have to balance that out. So the past process, we went out, the board went and gave unified approach saying, you need to go out and make this study. We spent 14 months. We spent oodles of money to make that. And, to, and we put the trust not only into the community and everybody, we engaged thousands of parents, literally thousands of parents and folks to, to give us the best opportunity and voice and vet this thing out and engage the community to make these best scenarios that we saw last time. I mean, we gave a, a big, and I, and I want to keep saying, the staff that did this and what the community did, and we've heard a couple of comments tonight, it was a fantastic, very transparent process that I've never seen before. I've done boundary adjustments before, and it was never like that. So, uh, and that was why we saw those, uh, those scenarios was last time. So that's kind of the history behind it. But now, now it came out, we did not make that decision, that last board member. We had a lot of differences. And then subsequently, I want to address something that's very concerning, not only to me, but I think from the staff and everybody else, and voice from what we said. There, there, there's a bad rumor on social media that this process and what staff did didn't pass the smell test. And to, to me, that's telling a, a really bad message to not only for the staff and the community and the process that we went through, which is it's really unacceptable, that, it, that we're corrupt and that it smells like a rotten egg it's just wrong that we have to be dealing with this type of situation. We shouldn't be. We should be working collectively, collaborative, unified, working together. We have hard decisions to make, but not pass the smell test. That's just wrong. It, it, it supplies wrong. And this, this process was perfect. With every objective and goal, the nonlinear, like Matt was talking about, it's never failed us before. Those formulas are nonlinear. They're complex. Yes, data is data. But it's not straightforward data. There's all this stuff that we talk about. Distances, travel distance, impact, occupant load factors of buildings and design and sewer and infrastructure. No one person can sit down and probably figure this out. But we do rely on our experts, the staff, and the folks that went out and did this. We spent a lot of brain power on this and a lot of emotional brain power on it. So we collectively came up with those scenarios. And those scenarios did get to optimal and did get to other things at a faster rate than what we're seeing with these new scenarios. So with that and test of time of all the things that we did for the yields, like Matt said earlier, it's never failed us. And the best scenarios that we see today and what we're going to do, there is no silver bullet to make that happen. I mean, every scenario you look at, there's not going to be a silver bullet. It's going to impact somebody, some group, some kids. There, I, we can go for on forever analyzing this to go into analysis paralysis and figure out something that may not impact us. But today, here we are with three scenarios. Three scenarios that are not totally optimal, but they do. They have the soft landing that we discussed that we're delaying at the 1900 going out, and it delays it. You can see just the, that we are delaying optimal and reaching those numbers in one, two. But the third one, well, the third one to do nothing well, we've been doing nothing since 2005. And we have an unbalanced situation here that we didn't ask for. The, the, the city thought they were gonna have be a one high school and developed a, 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 a high school that was gonna be up to 3,000. But unfortunately, the city councils here have land use authority and they, they develop faster than we can keep up. We try to keep up, but we don't have, we don't have that authority on development. We just try to keep up where development goes. The top topography, the geography, everything dictates what we do. And that's where we find ourselves today, trying to figure out how to balance this out. We have a problem. Just like the teachers union said earlier, we have a big problem. And part of the board governance, that we have to make these decisions, have to also think of our teachers, the parents, and ultimately the child in that classroom to being the best learning capacity. So that is, we have a problem, we have to make action. The do nothing option, it, it doesn't address the safety, the infrastructure impacts. 
the optimal impacts, all the other parameters that Matt talks about in this nonlinear analysis that's so complex. You can't just do a linear analysis and call it good. It's good to, to, to consider all these different scenarios, but we're going to have to make a decision that follows the guiding principles that we talked about. That's been laid out for, for many, many, many years. So with that said, I want to say at least the do nothing is not the optimal decision. And then we have to deliberate a little bit more on the one and two and what we're talking about right now. So that's my opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoover. All right, so <clears throat> um, I think it's pretty clear that at the last meeting that, uh, you know, I won't restate my comments because I, I'm not convinced that changing the boundaries are the only alternative. That doesn't mean that I don't think that there's a problem. That doesn't mean that I, I don't understand that the current numbers at Vista are absolutely a challenge for teachers. Um, I think, I just think that th we, when we started this process, we we started by saying, uh, there's a problem, let's study boundary changes as a solution. I think what we should have done, looking back, and I wasn't actually on the board that gave direction to study boundary changes at the time, that was actually the meeting before I joined, but looking back, I think a better approach may have been to say, this is the problem, what are the solutions that can solve this problem? And maybe we would have landed on boundary changes. Maybe we wouldn't have. But that being said, I think uh, you know my colleagues are right that this is tonight is an important night for how we move forward. Um, I I get that I'm in the minority in my opinion on the necessity of changes, and I do wish we could wind the clock back five years and do this five years ago. Um, that said, I recognize that my a lot of my call or my all my other colleagues uh, believe a change needs to happen. And I think the only thing I have to say tonight is that if a change is going to be made, I just urge this board to please make a change that is least disruptive. Um, you know, Mr. Short is right. We are not a board of one. We should be working together collectively, which requires compromise. My colleague, Mr. Reed, has proposed a compromise solution, and that is to move Blanche sprints to uh, Sutter Middle School and Folsom High School. Um, out of respect for collaboration, even though I don't fully agree with that proposal, I am willing to support that proposal tonight as a compromise solution that moves the needle on the boundaries uh, while avoiding broker, broken feeder patterns. And just, um, just really quickly, because I think the, the staff's data is really good uh, the way they presented their data in this grid format if we really look at the numbers themselves someone brought up earlier the functional capacity at vista is 1724 that would be much better than what we are today even though you know obviously more would be better um, with no boundary changes we don't get down below that until 2026 which is my proposal so yes it's the worst in terms of uh, getting that number below functional capacity. Um, with uh, the compromise proposal, moving Blanche only, we get to that below that number in uh, 2024. With the more disruptive proposal, we get to that number in 2023. That's a one-year difference. And I think that, um, I think that it would be very wise for us tonight to not quibble about one year and to compromise and pick the solution that best meets in the middle. Um, I recognize that I'm a board member and that governance is very important. I also ran to be on this board because I'm a parent and I care about what parents think because I think very similarly. I have some of these same concerns. Um, we just, my family just made a decision to purchase a house in a neighborhood so that we could, so that our son, who's on the autism spectrum, could have a consistent feeder pattern. We wanted him, he's a fifth grader, we wanted him to go into a middle school, 
stay in that middle school, be able to develop those relationships, continue on to the same high school. I am not the only family that makes decisions based on that logic, and I don't do it. Uh, I, I and I do it for the well-being of my child. In my professional career, I work on a lot of things where I see uh, statistics and. We know a number of things. Youth suicide rates are the highest they've been since 1995. Our most recent California Healthy Kids survey showed that more kids than ever before are suffering from chronic sadness and depression. Every day I pray that my child is not gonna be one of these statistics and I make decisions for my family based on helping to make sure that my children don't become these statistics. You know, I, I get that not every community has consistent feeder patterns. I understand that. But in Folsom, in Rancho Cordova, and honestly, in most of the, high, the districts in our region, we, ha we, for the most part, have consistent feeder patterns across the board. And that has created challenges with the numbers. But I really encourage my colleagues, let's compromise tonight. Let's meet in the middle. Broken feeder patterns are just not the answer. You're talking about a very tiny cohort of students at Blanche Sprints that are going to be split off. And yes, I understand that the response is going to be they can choice into, uh, potentially choice into uh, Sutter if they want to, but we've heard it tonight. We can't guarantee that. And we also uh, shouldn't really have to expect that of parents, that in order to make sure that their kids stay with their friends that they have to, you know, go through an entirely different process than anyone else in the district. I think Mr. Reed has proposed a very reasonable solution. And I just, I just want us to think about in, in the spirit of collaboration and compromise, meeting in the middle on this, I am willing to do that. Uh, and I, I just encourage my colleagues to do the same. Mr. Reed. Thank you. So, in my mind, clearly we have a capacity issue at this Delago. Um, I just, when you look at the numbers, I can't see it any other way. Um, and the teachers at this Delago don't see it any other way. <laughs> and that's an important. I know we had uh, one teacher from Vista get up and speak tonight, uh, but there was. Um, a thought exchange among VISTA teachers, and it was almost unanimous response from the VISTA teachers that participated, and, and there were a lot of VISTA teachers, I would, I would hazard a guess, a majority of VISTA teachers, and it was almost unanimous that they all indicated that 1900 is a major issue. It's impacting um, the teaching of students. It's impacting um, the environment at Vista del Lago. It's impacting their stress levels. It's impacting the student's stress levels. So if anything, we need to trust our professionals who actually are teaching in that facility who almost universally say this is a problem. Um, that's one. School choice. If we did nothing and you look at functional capacity, at uh, doing nothing gets you to um, to functional capacity in 2026, and then the numbers go back up again above functional capacity. So that means that in the year 2026, we could do school choice for 21 students, and that's it. There's no school choice in any other year, and I have a problem of a high school where we don't have the opportunity to allow other people to attend through school choice. So I don't see that as an option that I could ever um, get behind. Um, as for uh, the Blanche only option, it gets to uh, functional capacity in 2024 and it continues to decrease. And in 2028, we would have 276 students could school choice in to Vista del Lago. 
and still get back up to functional capacity. The 276 versus 21, um, and if block schedule, don't know what's gonna happen with that, but if block schedule ever goes away, you can increase that to 376 because block scheduling at, at VISTA accounts for 100 students impacting that school. So if, if VISTA Delago ever went to a traditional schedule, just add 100 more students to the capacity at the school. And I think either 276 or 376 students is very reasonable for a school choice uh, into, into VISTA Delago. Uh, so look at, we have three options before us. So the first one I just, I, I just, I, I, cannot, I cannot support for the reasons I just stated. Um, the second option, which uh, has Folsom Hills going to um, Sutter and then to Folsom High and then has Blanche going to Folsom Middle and then Folsom High. Um, I have a problem with both of those elements. For the, for the Folsom Hills, um, it, it stresses Sutter Middle School. The staff even indicated it as a con uh, when they were looking at pros and cons in last meeting's agenda. Um, uh, that was one of the clear issues with moving uh, Folsom Hills to Sutter. And I, I cannot get behind a proposal that moves a stress point from a high school to a middle school. It's not fair for those, uh, for that, for Sutter Middle School. Um, as for the Blanche to Folsom mid Middle and to Folsom High, I can't get behind that either. I do not believe in broken feeder patterns. I know other districts do it, um, but from personal experience, as well as studies that I've read, it is not healthy for the student. I know sometimes you have to do it, but in this case, we don't have to do it. And so I cannot get behind any proposal that has a broken feeder pattern, which then leaves the third option, which is moving Blanche only. And when you look at that, again, you get to functional capacity in 2024, and it stays below func fun functional capacity. You also have proximity, well actually, when you look at the guiding principles, um, walking distance. Uh, as you know, I mentioned at the last meeting, um, Folsom Hills is 4.6 miles from, uh, let's see, uh, 4.6 miles from Folsom High School and 3.6 miles from Vista Lago, whereas Blanche Sprints is 2.7 miles away from Folsom High School and 4.3 miles away from Vista Lago. Right now, Blanche Sprints isn't within walking distance of, of Vista Lago. Could be potentially it's long, but you could uh, definitely uh, see a walking uh, option to Folsom High School. Definitely bike riding. I would never allow my my kid to ride 4.3 miles to it to high school. So from that uh, the guiding principle, it definitely would seem to land on Blanche. Transportation, same thing. Um, geographic features. You know, look, and I think this one's overlooked. Geographic figures, if you, um, uh, or features, excuse me. If you look at four neighborhoods, and I'll compare it to this, the, the elementary schools. If you look at Blanche, Sprints, and Folsom Hills, Oak Chan, and Theater Judah, there are essentially two groups of like neighborhoods, meaning that um, there's there. They're, they're melded. If you look at, at Folsom Hills and Oak Chan, the line goes straight through a neighborhood. So literally your next door neighbor could be at Folsom Hills and the other side is at Oak Chan. If you split that up, then your next door neighbor is going to, and by the way, you could be friends, I mean, same street, um, could be going to Folsom High and one going to Vista Lago. It doesn't make sense. If you look at um, uh, Theater Judah and Blanche Sprints, same thing. You have Montrose, which splits the uh, th those boundaries. You, ha you have students on one side that goes to Vista, one side that goes to Folsom High. They are essentially one neighborhood that's split by a street. Now, if you compare those two sets, 
there is a de definite boundary. It's called um, Oak, Oak Avenue Parkway. It separates those two groupings. So from uh, a geographic feature standpoint, it, it argues that Blanche Sprints should be going to Folsom High. Community input. Um, if you look at the statistics from the community uh, input from the original survey, um, and it asks for, uh, they rank things uh, one, two, three, four, and five, five being um, where people are most interested in, one is least interested. Safety, options four and five came in at 89%, a majority. Walking distances, um, four and five again came in as a majority at 58%. Geographic features and natural boundaries of four and five came in a majority at 60%. Balancing school size, four and five came in at a majority at 70%. Again, all of these uh, would seem to suggest if you, if you follow the logic of following the, the guiding principles, we should be looking at Blanche and not looking at Folsom Hills. So in all the three options that are before us, the only one I can see myself supporting uh, is the option that Blanche only to Sutter. Um, obviously, they have the option to school choice of Folsom Middle, uh, given the proximity. I assume some will take, uh, take advantage of that. And then Folsom High. Um, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Scarlett. Before I go, do you have any comments? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry about my voice. I keep losing it. But I would get behind the Blanche, moving just Blanche. Um, originally, I was thinking not changing the boundaries at all because I was, you know, looking at the data that, yes, it could resolve itself. But problems are going to keep arising. They're keeping a, they're building new buildings constantly. And so eventually we're going to have to get to the problem where boundaries are going to have to be made at some point. And easing that transition now and kind of getting over the rough part will help the future and help um, students who are coming into elementary school or middle school. So I would get behind the Blanche, and I didn't even know that Blanche was closer to Folsom High School than Vista. I had no idea about that. So that makes more sense. Is Blanche closer to Folsom Middle then? than to mm. It is, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know my locations. <laughs> <laughs> It's not required as a school <laughs> student board member to know okay. all this. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but that would, yeah, that would be my what I would vote for as well. And um, what people were saying about Folsom getting overcrowded, you know, right now, like going to the restroom isn't an issue. You know, finding a place to sit isn't an issue. But my classes are getting bigger, and I know some of my friends are having trouble getting into the classes they want, especially if you're a freshman or sophomore, junior, seniors get priority. But that is an issue that will arise in the future too. However, just moving one school into Folsom High School won't cause as big of a problem, especially we're getting new buildings, the new CTE program. Um, and then once the new high school is built south of 50, then that problem will get fixed as well, I assume. So, thank you. Thank you. And on that note, especially since you have a sore throat, this is going to be a long meeting. So at any time you feel that, as much as we want your input on everything, if you feel that you would Got it. need Thank to you. leave. Please feel free to leave. <laughs> Those kids down there, well, they're here for a little bit longer now. Um, um, I, at the beginning, I mentioned um, all the hard work staff put into this, and I also mentioned how professional they are. I, I think I also need to mention how respected they are in our local education community out here. So um, I'd like to thank Matt Washburn and Daniel Thigpen for all the hard work that you and your staff put into this. And also, also um, we have tasked VISTA with a big problem. We told them last year, we want you to take up to 1,900 students, and we opened this door. In effect, by what we offer tonight, we have done nothing for three years. And I want to share, I mean, the board is up here, and we, rec we represent the whole district, and we have to think about all the long-term plans of the district. And if I go back to, if we are a district with school choice, then every one of our students should have the opportunity to go to any of the high schools they want to go to, and students cannot get into VISTA. My ultimate goal is that there is enough school choice at VISTA to allow anybody who wants to go there. So at this juncture, we've already kind of kicked that problem three years down the road. I want to stress that we were told to listen to parents. Well, the reason we have that 
three years down the road is because we were trying to listen to parents. The petition that was signed by 600 families wanted the grandfathering, wanted the option for middle school, wanted the transportation. We were trying to listen to the parents. So we listened to them then, we listened to them last week, and now we're here, what I am foreseeing to be creating a compromise to again listen to our community. Um, uh, there's a couple of things I would like to see, and I think Mr. Johnson brought up an interesting idea. Maybe every registration form from Folsom Middle should have would you like to go to Folsom High on it? Who knows? Maybe people who don't realize they have school choice, regardless if we tweet it, we put it on Facebook, we send an email, we call, maybe they still don't know. So that might be something if it's a, a minor fix, maybe it might help. I do wanna see a sign in front of Vista Del Lago that says this school is impacted if you move into this this boundary, you may be redirected to Folsom High. So we've met the objective of taking care of our current Folsom Middle students. I think with our compromise, whatever it comes to be, that if we work and promote and are very stringent in our, um, that's gonna be the next meeting or two when we talk about um, the guidelines for how to get into Vista. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a we have it's a step in the right direction, and I think the problem will ease uh, down the road, as it has been pointed out. Whether it's three or four years, but ultimately, I think we making the uh, compromise a small shift. We would still possibly, by the time those Blanche Sprints kids are impacted in fourth grade, fifth grade, that they could get into Vista if they wanted to. And uh, if I'm around, I'll be following them. So. Um, I'm just saying I, I, we've already done nothing by extending it three years, and we've put a lot more pressure on the VISTA staff in doing that. So I'm open to entertaining any motion. I'd like to make a motion. I move that we shift uh, the Blanche Sprints Elementary uh, to Sutter Middle School and Folsom High School effective um, in the 2020-2021 school year with no changes that would affect current uh, Blanche Sprints students in grades 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, current elementary school students would be assigned to their new middle school effective 2020-2021 and that uh, enrollment at Vista del Lago uh, continue to be capped at 1900. I'll second, I'll second that. Yeah. Wow, this is the first time um, we've had <laughs> well, well, I also want to say, just, you know, I second it, but I also want to take the opportunity when I was saying earlier that we have an exemplary staff that did a very wonderful job and we do value everything that you did on this thing and including the community's input but you have to give them a big hand because that you spent i don't know how many hours i mean unbelievable amount and we do appreciate and the superintendent for taking on that leadership role and making that happen thank you very much mr hoover uh, i'll third it i guess no third um <laughs> we might as well fourth but, and fifth. Uh, <laughs> you know uh, i just want to highlight something mr ruiz said earlier uh, and I think we knew this going in that any option that we choose, the problem doesn't get solved right away. Okay. I think that's pretty clear. So I, I still want to encourage staff, let's look into every possible way we can market Folsom High because, uh, you know, we do want to uh, reduce some of this maybe even sooner, right, than, than these are going to kick in. So uh, let's, let's um, obviously, once we get past all this registration stuff, mm -hmm. let's figure out um how we can better market Folsom High and uh maybe we can get input from the community on that as well thank you um Mr. Clark did you want to fourth it or yeah. no okay yeah, you know, okay I'm all in favor ah. aye. aye aye thank you I we worked through this process <laughs> thank you moving on to the next discussion action item <laughs> feel free ah. to stay budget time I think we'll.
Okay, we are going to be moving on. So, our next item is the budget presentation, and there is a pe presentation, but I know that we have some students here. So, if there's any of them that would like to speak about the budget before the presentation, so that you could go home, you are welcome to do that. The presentation will probably take 10 minutes or so, but 15. Oh, what's B? Did they need cards? Approved them. Contract right. opener. Oh. opener. Oh, darn, you got to wait a little bit longer. Okay. Just the next item is Adopt Folsom Cordova Education Association 2019. Can we? Oh, go ahead, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jackson Berry. I want to speak in support of keeping the slip schedule and my teachers. In kindergarten, I needed extra help learning how to blend sound, uh, sounds and learn uh, phonics. The extra and less kids let my teacher practice more with me. This was my favorite part of the day. I felt important. It also gave my teacher more time for math. She did such a great job teaching us Common Core. Common Core has taught me that there are always many different ways to solve a problem. So I am here asking you to please find a different way to fix the budget so that my teachers can continue to make other students feel important. And so it doesn't involve teachers losing their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kelly? Kelly, since we've already gone down the budget path, we can we revisit the item I skipped after the budget? It's a routine one. We can get through it like that. Yeah, just flip them. Um, are there any other students here who would like to speak before the presentation so that you can leave if you want to? Okay. Welcome. Hello, my name is Leora, and I would like to not cut, I mean, to not... Um, take away all the subjects. Music is a very good subject for me because it helps me focus after it and it gives me a break. It's fun, but I'm still learning. I would like to keep... I am at Riverview and music is my favorite subject there and I want to go to... Mitchell Middle School, but only if they keep band in French. Cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, and we and we want to keep her in our district, so that is definitely under consideration. Any other students want to speak now, so that if you wanted to leave, you could. You'll wait. Okay. All right, Superintendent. Yes, we um, have a presentation that we do want to share with you, so we'll go ahead and um, share that PowerPoint, and then we'll entertain questions from the board and the public afterwards. But I want to start by saying thank you to folks in the room through your collaboration and working through some really difficult decisions on the budget. Again, we're, we're faced with having to make some difficult decisions um, that haven't just been sprung upon us. These have, you know, we've been working on trying to be fiscally prudent in um, decisions coming into this fiscal year and then going into the next three years. And on top of that, the County of Sacramento has placed a directive on Folsom Cordova that we have to attend to or otherwise we'll be in um, a place of possibly a negative budget certification. And as a district, we don't wanna be there. So we have to continue to work together, collaborate together, to find ways to get through this. And it's, it's, it's not one group that's gonna solve it, we have to really do it together. Um, we came up with some guiding principles on the next slide um, of how do we reduce these expenditures. And um, I love hearing from our students and, and what they have to say because they really represent the heart of what we do, boots on the ground every single day. So minimizing the impact to our students as we consider these tough decisions is part of that. And also looking at our staff in the room and knowing that these decisions will impact staff. 
how do we minimize the, the impact and create soft landings as we look at changes or reductions or reimagining? Um, we don't want to go down the path of layoffs. So we're trying to reimagine how can we do this in the least disruptive way to our faculty and employees as well. So as you see, it's not an easy, you know, single fit decision. We have to really work together. And I appreciate that collaboration with our bargaining units, um, with our community, and the discussions we've had with our board. As you see on the next slide, our timeline, we've been talking about the budget since last year. Actually, before that first check mark box there, we've been talking about it with our board budget study sessions that we've had public engagement in for the last over a year. We had four budget study sessions last year. And some of the ideas that rose from those study sessions are those that we're seeing tonight. And some are ideas we said we need a little bit more time to explore a little bit further. Um, we, we have more questions to ask. But you can see that you know it's been an ongoing process. Um, the county expects uh, us to show that we can make these reductions and have a positive ending balance. And we have to show that first, uh, first interim report by December 16th to the county to be able to, to prove that. So here we are on November 21st, and once we get through the presentation, we'll have a resolution for the board to consider. Next slide, please. Ms. Crawford. Thank you, Dr. Cleighian. So as, as we mentioned before, we have, over the last year and a half, we've had quite a few budget study sessions. We've had lots of meetings with our stakeholders. We've provided some feedback based on those discussions in the last couple of board meetings. So tonight we've taken all of that feedback and we've made a couple of recommendations. Um, we have some recommendations starting for this current year that we feel we can make mid-year and we could include it in our first interim. Um, and then we'll talk about some uh, recommendations for the 2021 year. So the first one is for current year, we could make these at first interim. Um, the first one would be reducing that 1% contribution to our retiree benefit fund. We had talked previously about doing this next year. Um, we could actually do this this year. Um, we could suspend that 1%. Um, if we wanted to make that practice moving forward, we could discuss that when we bring back our budget guidelines to the board in the spring, I believe, is when we usually bring that. Um, and we could talk about it then. Um, we. We could also start looking at reducing some of our unrestricted, unrestricted travel and conference expenditures right now. Um, we could look at a partial freeze on some non-essential supply purchases. We could look at reducing some of our maintenance projects. This would not include any of our preventative or our deferred maintenance projects. Um, it would be some of those um, really wonderful things that are, are maintenance guys have done for all of our sites and our departments, uh, maybe scaling back some of those, um, not doing away with them in totality, but maybe just not doing as many. Um, so just looking at a couple of the things that we could do this year, it's about $1.6 million. We've talked quite a bit about Fund 71, um, and Ms. Krikorian talked a little bit about that with her graphs this evening. So what we wanted to try to do here was put some of, um, put some numbers out there just so everybody understands what we're talking about. Um, and for those of you who haven't been part of the discussion, our Fund 71 is our Retiree Benefit Fund. Um, and what that is, is that's money that we have set aside for our current and our future employees to pay for re retiree benefits until age 65. So that's really what that fund is about, what it was established for. Um, so in the box, kind of just outlines what was approved back in 2007. That was quite a long time ago, but that's at that time that board and boards after that have, have basically been consistent with this practice. Um, we have, according to our actuarial, about a $22 million uh, li liability balance um, and we've talked a lot about what the actuary um, actually contains. Um, there are some standard practices and projections that they must include in there. Um, we are working to also include what our current um, numbers are. We have currently in our fund, we have $14 million. That was our beginning fund balance. Um, so currently for this year, we have 472 um, retirees receiving benefits, that's classified management, 
um, certificated management are classified employees and are certificated employees. This year's cost for all 472 is about $904,000. We had set aside $815,000 budgeted as a pay-as-you-go amount, so we were a little short in that estimate. Um, we are, we'll talk a little bit uh, later about a possible retiree incentive program similar to what we did for teachers last year. If we were to offer that for classified, we have 414 between the ages of 50 and 65 who are eligible. That's a huge amount. Um, we also have 263 current eligible certificated retirees from ages 55 to 65. Um, so those are some of the things that we'll be taking into account when we look at our projections moving forward in terms of what our annual costs are currently um, and what they could be in the next 5, 10, 15 years. I want to thank you for that slide. Thank you. Sure. We also tried to put uh, some timelines down. I know we've talked a lot about dates and GASB and GAP and you know lots of acronyms that we have out there. So I just tried to put on a timeline starting from 07 and kind of how we've gone through the last 12 years. We actually did suspend the pay-as-you-go contribution back in 08, 09, and we did that for about five years. Um, we continued with the 1% contribution, but we did suspend the pay-as-you-go amount. So it is something that we have done in the past. Um, so it's something we could do again. Um, the two GASB implementations that, that um, changed how irrevocable trusts were defined and the role of a Fund 71 in terms of retiree benefits versus an irrevocable trust, which is actually now outside of the district. Um, back in 17, 18, we increased that pay-as-you-go amount. We had $600,000 for quite a few years. That amount was increased to that 815,000 that we talked about earlier. Um, we did have a resolution a couple months ago to establish a true OPEB trust outside the district. Um, an irrevocable trust with PARS, that was in September. Um, and then tonight, um, we will talk about a proposed transfer to that irrevocable trust and kind of some thoughts on what to do with the balance that we currently have in there. So what we, what we are looking at in terms of that $14 million, um, kind of a little bit about what, what Deb had said earlier about transferring some of that fund balance out for one-time purposes, which would be um, our main goal right now is to provide for a Chromebook replacement plan. So our proposal would be to set aside $4 million of that $14 million, set that aside in Fund 40, which is a reserve for capital outlay fund, and then transfer the remaining $10 million to the irrevocable trust with PARS. This doesn't meet that, um, that full liability amount, um, but it, it gets us pretty far into it. One of the recommendations that we had for this current year was the unrestricted general fund reductions. And we had talked a little bit about that $350,000 reduction for traveling conference and some other reductions. Um, this is kind of, we've talked about a zero-based budgeting model starting next year. This would be kind of a jump start on that. We would start looking at our, our departments looking at some of our allocations, starting to dive deep into some of those priority-based decisions. Um, some of the things that we would sacrifice, we would reduce some of our staff development. Um, we are looking at our restricted funds as well. We're trying to see what we can use our restricted funds for in terms of staff development, just shifting some of that funding. Um, on the maintenance side, there would be some cost savings if we were to uh, slow down some of those projects because we, we do many of those with our in-house staff um, so that we would have some cost savings from that. Um, unfortunately, there could be an increase in our work order response because of some of those projects. Um, so we would, we would just try to keep that um, in balance. Um, our projected ongoing savings is about $300,000. Um, we'll continue to look at that. We'll look um, deeper um, as we get into first interim and second interim and then the spring when we look at adopted budget for next year. So for 2021 for next year, these are our recommendations and we took a lot of the feedback that we presented previously with mixed support. So the first two items were actually high support and this was reducing site and department carryovers, which is a one-time 
reduction, about $1.4 million. This would not include things like Intel. Um, we have our Intel donations. We have other donations from our partners in the community. This would be outside of those. This would be just the formula type allocations that sites are given. Um, and then that Chromebook replacement plan, this would just be a shift of funding. We would use some of that reserve from the retiree benefit fund to fund those. The other items here, we have individual slides that address these. Um, we addressed some of these last board meeting. Um, some have um, some revisions to them. Um, we, we've changed some amounts in a couple of cases. We've tried to provide some additional data um, from questions that we've received. Um, so if we were to do all of these, the impact, the budget reduction would be about $4.7 million. So Ms. Solomon's gonna talk about the redirection of Folsom Lake High to other all debt options. Thank you, Dr. Kalikian. The impetus uh, to make this change comes from the cost factor analysis that uh, took place with the cost of each student at the current facility of about $18,000 per student and the revenue source only providing 9,000. So due to that, um, this rose uh, and did come on, be become very um, obvious on the radar for our, uh, at our various budget study sessions. But having listened to the feedback that we um, obtained from the last board meeting and working collaboratively with the staff and with uh, Principal Leanne Linson, this is one of those slides where the actual proposal has been revised a bit. So um, the feedback that we received strongly indicated that the original proposal of the independent study model was um, not what the students at Folsom Lake High School really needed. So with that in mind, we went back to the drawing board and um, we have a, a new proposal here, which is the redirection of Folsom Lake High School actually to the Folsom High campus. The uh, proposal considers the relocation with a hybrid model for students. We would keep two full-time teachers uh, at the uh, facility at Folsom High School, as uh, Folsom Lake High School, and um, with kind of a multiple subject approach. Online courses would be available to those students who chose or who would choose a, a blended learning approach. Uh, Folsom High School will host the Folsom Lake High School students into some of their on site electives. The development of a robust work experience program to assist students with a school to work program. Dr. Jim Huber initially will uh, oversee the school partnering with site leadership when necessary to build that capacity. Um, in concert, Dr. Uh, Shauna Kukarvi is requesting to maintain the services of MFT Elizabeth Lee. Um, to stay with the group three days a week at the Folsom Lake High School designated location on that campus. And uh, we're still in discussion. There is currently a point to counselor attached to Folsom Lake High School. So we are in discussion about whether we can and hoping we can afford to keep that. Discussion with uh, Matt Washburn and his department about the facilities. Um, and the location that um, we have some thoughts about. We want the access to be as easy as possible for the Folsom Lakes High School students. Um, there are students there who choose a smaller learning environment, so to ask them to walk across a very large comprehensive campus to get to their school uh, is not something that we find to be desirable for them. So we're looking at our options there. And uh, we heard a lot from the community partnerships and we certainly hope that they will stay with Folsom Lake High School and continue to run clubs with the students and offer some service learning opportunities. The current ILS programs that are on site uh, at Folsom Lake High School's current site um, will remain there under this plan. 
under the supervision of Student Support Services. So Kinney High School will be uh, will, will remain as our district's school for our ADP placements. So we're looking at a, a pretty robust proposal here. Any questions from the board on this slide? Mm -hmm. I do want to compliment you on all the work you did in two weeks to pull this together and come back. And it, you did take into consideration the concerns that were brought before the board last time. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. I um, thank you very much for the work you put in. Um, and I'm just just so I'm clear on this. I think so. ILS will remain oh. at the Folsom Lake site for one more year under this proposal, correct? That's correct. And um, yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Uh, our I, assistant I, superintendent uh, Betty Jo Wessinger can probably address that better than I can. But I wanted to make sure that we had it here on this slide. Okay. Yeah. Clearly. I just yeah, and I um, as we continue to explore that, um, yeah, I just I would I would love to look at alternatives uh, that potentially keep the the ILS kids in the community that they're from. So I would just love to work with staff on that as we continue to explore those options, um, because I, I do think it's important that these kids are able to stay in their communities. Certainly. Betty Jo, I think people are looking for confirmation that it will yes, be Yes, and that's, that's why we decided to keep the program on the campus for one more year because we needed time to lo look at and study those options. And also the facilities that the, the program in, is, it's a very unique facility. So to just pick up and move, it's, it's like an apartment. It has a washer and dryer. It has a kitchen. And so to just move a program to a classroom um, and to have the time in for mats, team to be able to get that ready was problematic. But we also wanted to look at those other options, as you mentioned, um, about, it's about 50-50. So about half of the students come from Rancho and half of the students come from Folsom. And um, we met with the staff and the staff agreed that one thing that's optimal is having the three programs together because it, it sort of allows for a continuum, but that doesn't mean that we we wouldn't be able to look at other options because that did come up also that um, it would be optimal for students to be in their community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Yeah, no, just one quick question. Um, I know it was a big thing for some of the students that they remain active in their community service club, their interact. Is that going to be available uh, if they do go to Folsom? Well, my, my hope and my vision and working with uh, Principal Linson was that the community partners that we had, um, a couple of them here at the meeting and uh, the Rotarians that do run the Interact Club, would be that they would continue to work with Folsom Lake High School students exclusively oh. because Folsom High also has an Interact Club. Right. But I think that um, I don't want the students from Folsom Lake High School to get lost in the shuffle of the clubs or not participate because they don't know as many students. So I think we would have two clubs. Okay, and, great. Yeah, and that would be our out, outreach on our part to make sure that that continued. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So in effect, Folsom Lake High would lose its title and it would become Folsom High and they would graduate or would maintain the Folsom Lake High title on the campus? Right, okay. it's a relocation. Good. To put it simply, a relocation of Folsom Lake High School into a school within a school on the Folsom High School campus. So we probably need clarification because I may have given Mr. Reed the wrong answer. Would they have oh. their own graduation? Yes. Okay. Thank and you. And their own diploma. Thank you. Okay. Going on. Moving to the next slide, we talked about this at the last meeting, um, staffing reductions at the ESC and, and continuing to look at how we can reimagine our departments and run more efficiently and we did some of that last year coming into this year as we had vacancies and uh, when we had a vacancy in our aces program we looked at reimagining how we um, direct that program so we didn't backfill that position same thing with the child welfare coordinator so as these vacancies have occurred we have not backfilled and and we continue to look at the um, where we have that opportunity to um, also be more efficient Going into next year, um, we're looking at uh, not uh, filling a director level position and two classified positions. And that would be ongoing savings of about 250,000 in addition to the previous reductions. And those are ongoing and compounding. 
Thank you for clarifying that because that came up in the past too, so thank you. And Mr. Wilson is going to handle the next couple of slides, I believe. Certainly. Uh, the slide um, remains somewhat unchanged from the last meeting as well, um, taking into consideration that currently we have three different models of um, kindergarten schedules that occur across the district right now from SLIP, Extended Day, and AMPM model. Um, and you see the numbers up there about which, how many schools run each of those models. Um, where the savings is realized here is in the AMPM model currently, the teacher um, receives prep time from a PE prep teacher coming in um, following contract at 60 minutes per week. While the AM teacher receives the prep in an AMPM model, that means there are no students in the classroom, so by default the PM teacher is also receiving prep. And then the same thing is happening in the PM model where the teacher is receiving prep and there are no students, so by default the AM teacher is also. So we are receiving double preps in AMPM models. If we were to move to AMPM models across the district and stick to contract of 60 minutes um, per week of PE prep time, we would be able to reduce um, PE prep coverage by 1.9 FTE um, and still stick to contract with teachers receiving preparation time um, as dictated by contract. But what we would of course sacrifice is the school's ability to choose the kindergarten schedule that works best for their site uh, dependent on enrollment right now is what dictates what schedule is going to happen at, a, at a, any given site any given year. Um, what space we have available on the site, how many kids are enrolling, and that changes year to year at the majority of our sites across the district, um, as well as the extended time for the students enrolled in the extended day schedules. SLIP and AMPM currently serve the same number of instructional minutes, regardless of schedule to students. Uh, what we would gain is the alignment of kinder schedules across the district. Um, no more wondering each year what schedule we're going to have at any given site. Um, oftentimes we cannot tell parents what they're registering for until we realize the full enrollment of that site and find out where all overflow and um, our spots finally land at the end of an enrollment process. Um, and again, the savings of 1.9 FTE in the form of PE specialist. Um, we also maintain PE still being delivered by a PE specialist and we also gain some facility space for future programs and growth. Um, the one point F 1.9 FTE, that would not affect any of our current permanent PE teachers? I'm getting a, a shaking of no from our HR assistant superintendent. Okay. Any other questions? From, any questions from the board on this side, uh, Mr. Yeah. Hoover? Um, if you don't have this in front of you, that's okay, but what are the six sites that um, use the AMPM right now? I had a feeling you would ask that. Let me uh, pull this up, and unfortunately it's sideways in my PDF, so it's going to take me a minute to turn my head that way and take a peek here. Um, so you were asking for the AMPMs? Yeah, the six, yeah. Okay, the AMPMs are at Blanche Sprint, Carl Sundahl, Empire Oaks, Folsom Hills. Make sure I'm not, oh, nope, I skipped. Sorry, skip column sideways. Blanche Sprint, Carl Sundahl, uh, Gold Ridge, Oak Chan, uh, White Rock, and Williamson. Okay. And uh, have you, re I mean, have we received any feedback from those schools about challenges? Or, I mean, do they seem pretty, do the teachers there seem pretty happy with uh, so, yeah, the, it, um, the, the setup? I will share that um, we spent last year meeting with um, representatives from every one of these schedules. Mm -hmm. um, so a teacher or two representing an AM schedule, a teacher or two representing the slip schedule, and a teacher or two representing the extended day. I believe I want to say there was about eight to ten teachers on that committee when we were looking at prep schedules. Um, they all liked the schedules they had. Um, so if they were a um, extended day I teacher, see. They liked that. I have AMT, AMPM teachers that have been teaching it for 22 years and swear it's the best thing they've ever taught. And I have the same um, teachers. Again, what they like is what they promote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. if a current kindergarten teacher is teaching SLIP and they don't want to teach AMPM, there will be opportunity for them to consider a, a, another grade level? or There will. Every, every year when we go to... Uh, make our schedules for the elementary schools. Um, if there is any movement or wish to change grade levels, that is done at the local school site level. Um, most principals handle it very similarly where they put out a your first wish, your second wish, your third wish if we have movement. And um, by starting the conversations this early, um, this year, we can definitely get to a point where there are options for the following year. Oh. 
I have another question. Let's know. So one of the benefits that we continually hear about is creating that small, um, the slip session. The benefit is I have half of my students for 90 minutes and then. Correct. The, so there's a small class size for that time. So uh, with the two teachers in the classroom, a larger size classroom in most cases, um, that small um, uh, group environment can be recreated between the two teachers there would be two groups happening yeah. with one teacher in the room at a, with two teachers in the room at the time for about 129 minutes of the 201 minutes thank you please uh, we will we'll let the comment we'll let the public comment on this item any other board questions yeah just one real quick so i i just want to get a, a handle on the ratio mm -hmm. if the slip goes away what is the ratio and the ratios don't change for the student to teachers. Um, so the numbers in every kindergarten class, um, it, it doesn't affect the ratio of students to teachers at all. During certain parts of the day, it does change that. So current slip schedules um, utilize the time where your first 12 students enter the room for a designated amount of time. Then the rest of the kids enter. You have all 24, and then the first group of 12 go home, and you're left with 12 students in the room. So in that essence, you have a 1 to 12 during part of the day. Okay. And the extended program, um, I know there's probably a lot of parents out there working mm -hmm. uh, full time. Um, are all these sites going to have student care in place? Yes. So again, with, with a decision being made this early in the school year, we've already started um, conversations with Denise Earle. Um, who is our student care supervisor, to look at what our possibilities are in extending our student care coverage at sites, expanding it at certain sites. Um, the AMPM model, um, as we see in some of the gains here, um, opens up facility use occasionally on some of the sites, um, depending on rooms. Um, and it's possible to look at offering student care on those sites to expand it for the kindergartners. Possible, but not guaranteed, correct? Guaranteed. I'm going to stick with Matt's rule on <laughs> saying guaranteed for anything. Guaranteed? No guarantee. No yeah. guarantee. Well. Uh, to ex extend on that question, um, mm -hmm. so how do we anticipate staffing AMPM classrooms across the district? 24 to 1, 26 to 1? So we would follow the class size reduction uh, ratios, which currently um, dictated by the state is an average of 24 to 1 in a TK through third grade classrooms at a school site. So... So it's an average. Could it's some an could average. be 24, 26, 28? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay. And I shouldn't have said staffing. How many students do we right. plan on putting that class? It would be great if we had 24 teachers and no <laughs> students. Okay. Any additional questions on this slide? Okay. Next. That's me again. Uh, so this one is about the restructuring of lead teachers, which ultimately um, reduces the number of lead teachers. Um, again, no substantial changes to this since the last board meeting on this slide. Um, we would be looking to change the name to curriculum and instruction K-12 specialists. Um, those are the factors that we are considering. Um, when we look at the what we would sacrifice, of course, it is the level of professional development that the lead teachers have been able to provide to the teachers across the district and the support of the PLC implementation designated at each site um, by our implementation coaches across the 20 sites. Um, Again, the proposal is going from seven lead teachers um, to four K-12 curriculum instruction specialists, and the ongoing savings would be approximately $300,000 per year. Questions on this slide? And again, not um, affecting any of our full-time employees. We're still looking at temporary. Time. Correct. Okay. Um, and just to point out, I want to compliment, because when this slide first came to us, it was eight lead teachers correct or was it six it was going from seven to two i think was the original proposal um so and uh, working with them mm -hmm. for a compromise thank you next slide miss allman thank you since the last board meeting i don't believe this slide has changed either however i i do want to acknowledge and thank the staffs at mills and mitchell for being willing to meet with me and share their concerns and um, their passion for what they do. Um, what I saw at each of these sites were staffs who were very, very dedicated to the success of their students and their angst over moving from a seven period day to a six period day uh, really centered around um, their desires to help their students. 
However, with that said, this is, um, you know, the impetus for this was the savings of 828000 and it's not so much about the schedule as it is about the two prep periods. Our concern with this, um, it, we do have a surplus of teachers, and I know the board had some questions as to whether or not uh, Mitchell Middle School would be able to continue the IBMYP program on a six-period day, and so the staff there has been working diligently at uh, some options. So um, with that said, if you have some questions, I have our coordinator, Amy Strawn, who is here, who can answer those questions um, at, at a great level of depth. Uh, so uh, I personally would like to hear, because it is a concern sure. to hear how we're going to collapse that. Yeah. So I will defer to uh, Amy. Wow. Amy, no one has gotten applause just for walking up there, so <laughs> bravo. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to come up here. Um, this is a difficult one because I'm standing right here with our teachers who see this, and this is a loss. Um, when we were authorized back in 2015, we had an eight-period day, and the IB really values the holistic approach, which means we have timetabled time within our day to focus on structured learning of all eight subject groups. So then we went to seven and now six. So um, if you feel some disappointment in the room and some challenge, that that is a very real reality. And I, and I think I would be um, dishonest if I didn't acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. That said, we have done some research and there are six schools in the state of California that I have found that do have a six period day. Those schools, um, or are, are, are do it differently all over. There's not one school that does it in a way that um, another school does in the sense that some are a K-8, some have a six period day where maybe their contact limits are not the same as ours and so it's been a challenge. However, we have been able to come up with five options. I think our staff still needs time to discuss and to weed out and to get some confirmation from the IB. Um, I have reached out to them as well to see which of our options would be the best because we do have an evaluation next fall. So, um, and that just means the IB is coming in for our accreditation. Some of the options include integrating subjects. So we already integrate um, design into science. Mm -hmm. We're looking at things like integrating history into language arts. And that provides some challenges in regards to credentialing, um, how we work on the framework. And so further discussions would need to be made with director of curriculum and instruction and, and lead teachers and, and our staff. Some of the other options include zero periods, so offering an optional zero period for things like PE or year-long music. Um, other options include rotating, so we would still have a world language program, but it might rotate on a quarter system. So if you think of the high school that offers semesters, so they have a semester like psychology and a semester of social, it would be essentially the same, only your semester would meet quarter one and quarter three and then your second one would meet quarter two and quarter four. So we would rotate things like um, visual and performing arts and world language. So that means that our options would go from one year to half of a year. Um, there's an option to just stay status quo and teach maybe six of seven, but that's not popular because student contacts would increase. And there is the option to stay a six period traditional with an optional uh, zero period. So those are some of the options. There's, we can go way in the deep in the weeds and kind of go through the nitty gritty, but um, those are some of them. Do you have any questions? No, something. there's a lot of things, moving pieces here. Any yeah, questions? Amy, out of all the options that you actually uh, spoke about, is there any one strong option that you may have? Yeah, we, so we spoke with our staff for the first time last Thursday, and Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Catherine Alleman and Jim Huber came out. I mean, at that point, we were tasked with just, we had a lot more questions. Mm -hmm. And we met with our division leaders on Monday afternoon and presented some of our options and asked for more if they have some. The two that are kind of rising to the top would be that implementing um, history with language arts. And then offer, and then another one would be offering zero period options, right. which would allow students who would come to zero to take PE and maybe then stay in a full year of um, art or world language, mm -hmm. um, or for students that would like that rotating, they would have that option as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm just 
this whole uncertain impact on the IBMYP, that's my heart. You know that. I mean, I want this program to flourish. I want it to stay around. And I don't want it to go anywhere. I mean, you know, disappear. And it's like, oops, you know, we're going to have to cut it. We don't have any viable solutions or options that we can use. So that's why my concern on that. So please understand. Um, I do have some more questions, but they're coming. Okay. All right. I will say that all of our options, we're really making sure that we are meeting the 50 hours of scheduled structured learning that the IB is requiring. Mm -hmm. And so I think when it comes to an evaluation, we will pass and we will be all right. Um, that said, the Mitchell Middle School staff and the way of Folsom Cordova is we do things to fidelity and we do what's right for kids. And when our program model as the student in the center, that's what our faculty wants. And so it's just difficult to, to think of altering the program in any way. Right. right. Okay. Mr. Reed. Yeah, just one quick question. How is history and language arts compatible? I don't understand how that works. So the idea behind that option, and remember we're still kind of playing out some possible options. The idea behind that was the Common Core, um, while there is the history framework, a lot of the Common Core anchor standards are transferable. And so, for example, when I taught um, eighth grade English, we were reading a book called My Brother Sam is Dead, which is all about the Revolutionary War. And so you could embed and integrate some historical content within that. I know that um, we have, we, there are schools that do an integrated approach. Um, that said, it would, be ch it would be a challenge, and I think it would require additional professional development. It would require looking at, looking at credentials um, and more discussion with all of our stakeholder groups. Thank you. Any additional questions on this slide? Okay. Next. Dr. Huber is going to address the summer school. Good evening. Uh, this slide basically takes us the, through the next step of a process we actually began last year um, when we started talking about the budget issues. And as you'll recall, last year we stepped back and, and offered a summer school program that was not as um, robust, if you will, in terms of course offerings. We focused on classes such as English, math, science, um, courses also that were required for graduation. The, we also still had some opportunities for enrichment, especially for students that need um, courses outside of the regular school year because their schedule during the school year is so impacted that they need to get some things um, like health, for instance, um, taken care of so they can actually take a, a program like band or orchestra. So as we look towards progressing into this year, we started looking at other models that were out there that might be um, workable for Folsom Cordova. And one of the things also that we have some experience in is we already have an online platform ourselves that are being used at different school sites. And so that brought us around to the idea of uh, summer school going to an online platform. And that would involve uh, probably Folsom High School and Cordova High School running kind of, if you will, two labs that would um, offer online curriculum. And some teachers would uh, be in those labs to help students that would come in. Uh, this still needs to be worked out in terms of would they come in every day? Would they come in you know, on a schedule of their own, come almost like um, kids do now in terms of their uh, individual learning programs? And this also, in terms of when we, when we looked at what this we, we could gain from this, one of the things is the fact that we could tailor make some of these courses to student specific needs. So cur currently, if you go back in history to a regular summer school program, and I'm a student that needed to retake in ninth grade English, I was basically taking the course over again and we're trying to compress all of ninth grade English into that time frame. With our online programs, we can now, and our guaranteed and viable curriculum, we can now actually tailor make in terms of what essential standards need to be covered. And so if I needed to repeat something in ninth grade English, my teacher could actually assign, these are the three areas that you did not master the standards. And when I went to summer school, I would hit those three standards. When I showed I had mastery of them, I'd be done with summer school. And so that is a, um, a bonus for our students and it would, again, allow us to tailor things to, uh, directly to students and their individual needs. Any questions? Any questions? No? Yeah. yeah, Mr. Reed? Um, so if we don't offer a traditional summer school, is there an option for students to take classes 
in other air, other districts or um, that offer summer school in person summer school, um, or are they just not they they just don't have that opportunity? Um, I, I believe it, it's up to the other district in terms of what they might open up. Um, but I don't. I've never heard of us restricting that. I, I could be incorrect in terms of allowing other p schools to offer their summer school program. That's that's true. Students could, if another district would allow. We don't allow students from outside of our district to um, take summer school with us because uh, we don't collect any ADA for summer school. So we're not going to beef it up with other people from other districts, and they probably feel the same. Okay. But we do have students who might take a course at Jesuit or pay for that PE class that they can get. If through. That's correct. Yeah. You bet. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The early retirement incentive for classified, we mentioned that earlier, and Mr. Ogden's going to talk a little bit about that. I'd like to differentiate this slide from uh, the previous slides. This won't be on the... Uh, won't be on tonight's resolution. So this is a work in progress with CSEA. Um, this is um, something that we will be talking about in negotiations on December 5th. And um, it reflects a, a process that we did last year with our teachers union. And what we were able to do is offer an in, uh, early retirement incentive, which actually um, pencils when you don't backfill some positions. And that's where the negotiations comes in because we need to bargain the impacts and effects of uh, not backfilling positions. Currently, we're working with our department heads, um, trying to reimagine some departments and see how we could perhaps uh, move into this space and offer this incentive and then uh, perhaps not backfill some positions. Thank you. Any questions from the board on this? No. Next. Ms. Crawford, please. So some of the things that we haven't included in the previous slides, even though we have identified some reductions for both 1920 and 2021, 20, uh, we have not fully reversed the deficit spending. Um, at adopted budget, I believe our deficit spending was $7 million, which meant we had $7 million more in expenses than we did for revenue. And in 2021, it was an $8 million deficit spending. And that was uh, also incorporated with the deficits overall that we needed to cover, which was three and a half million and five and a half million. So we, based on the, the two years of reductions, we still have not fully met the directive from SCOE. Um, so they may still disapprove our first interim budget. We will wait and see what they say. Um, they may, if they disapprove it, they could still, um, start coming to our board meetings, they will probably have further directives on what they would want us to do in the future. Um, they will probably reiterate that any delay in identifying additional reductions would compromise our options in the future for our fiscal solvency. Um, we, as I've said, we've only identified two of the three years, so we will need further discussion on 21-22. Um, in addition, not only do we have to re uh, identify reductions uh, for our deficit spending and our uh, shortfalls, we still want to identify some funding for salary increases. Um, we want to provide increases for our employees, especially since we are now at the end of our two-year agreement, so we want to make sure we have funding for that. Um, as, as we've talked in previous slides, there are lots of reductions here. There are still more to be discussed and more to come. Um, we are still looking at additional staff reductions on both the classified and the management side, um, and those positions will be identified and brought to the board. So some of those things that we will continue to discussion for 21-22, um, we had discussed the prep periods at Cordova High and at Vista Del Lago. That did not reach into the, the high support categories that needed lots more discussion, lots more um, thinking through uh, the impact and, and really working through all of the, the associated impacts to both of those sites. Um, in addition, there were some proposals that included reducing some certificated stipends, and I've listed a couple of those here. Those are negotiated, so those would continue um, with our bargaining units. Um, iReady has been um, at the forefront of many of our discussions, 
just for clarification, we are at the end of our eight-year license. We do not have either a replacement or a continuation of iReady in the budget. So depending on which way we want to go, um, we would need to include that moving forward. But I know that's going to be a larger discussion um, in addition to the monetary factor of that. Um, some of the other things that were mentioned in previous feedback um, that require more synthesis of data and, and more, more discussions with our, our departments, our managers, and, and the board. And we've got Print Shop, our secondary project Lead the Way. We had talked a little bit about consumables and the licensing piece of it. Um, there's also lab replacements that are impacted um, by the vendor. Um, with our LCAP, we need to continue looking at the positions that are funded with that supplemental funding source. Um, we will continue to look for reductions in travel and conference. We are hopefully working towards reducing the amount of release days that our teachers, I know um, we've, we've had that discussion previously. Uh, we're trying not to take teachers out of class as often as previously. Um, we have a SIG grant re expiring in two years and we have a little over six positions funded by that grant that we'll need to consider moving forward. Um, a grant writer has, has floated to the top on a couple of occasions. Uh, we need to do a lot more further research on that. Um, I haven't been able to find districts nearby that have a position. Um, I'm sure they exist, um, so that will, that will just need some more research, and we'll have to do a cost-benefit analysis on that. Um, we do want to continue looking at our district-wide zero-based budgeting model. As I said before, we'll, we're going to do a kind of a pilot program um, starting mid-year, and we'll continue moving through that for next year. Um, and then we want to just continue to evaluate our operations, looking for efficiencies, looking for um, the needs of our students and our staff. So the next couple slides are follow-up questions. Um, that we, we talked about at the last board meeting. Um, I won't go through each of those. If you have questions, we can answer those at the end. But we've got one slide here for legal fees versus in-house counsel. Um, and then we've got several slides on a breakdown of the expenditures that were included in a very large object code in our financial statements, services and other operating. We've broken out um, we tried to break out the major categories by unrestricted and restricted. Um, so I've, I've tried to break all that out with the different amounts with some examples for the board. Any questions on any of those slides that flip by really, Mr. Reed? Yeah, um, the $776,000 uh, that would be a savings for Vista Prep, is would that be switching Vista from a block schedule to a six period? Is that what would create that savings? I'm going to defer to Mrs. Alleman. Uh, the, yes, again, it goes back to the cost of the prep periods. Because if you have a, a four by four, you think of that as an eight period day. And it goes back to the fact that teachers have two prep periods. So they're teaching six of eight. Um, like with a seven period day, they're teaching five of seven. If they were teaching six of seven, or if they were teaching seven of eight, then uh, there wouldn't be that same issue, but that increases their contacts. And uh, within our current contract, their contact number is 175. If they taught six of eight, excuse me, seven of eight with only 175 contacts, it saves us no money. So effectively, the, the block schedule is costing the district $776,000. That's correct. Okay. I just want to clarify, it's 210 a year. The contacts for Vista? For Vista, it's 210, but it would increase by yet another 35 if you're teaching seven out of eight. And uh, the cost is in the prep period. So I do want to be careful with that, that it's, it's the cost is in the prep periods, mm. the double preps. So it, 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 there would be, if there was interest, uh, other options would be maybe one prep period a term would solve the problem. That would be what, that would probably be a Vista State on a four by four, it would be one prep, choose the term that you would want it on. Yeah, so it's just looking at another option, not saying wherever this ends up, I'm just saying it doesn't necessarily, yeah. 
Uh, any other questions on that item? Uh, that, that any comes, questions that, on that? That comes to further discussion on that. I mean, shouldn't we have that on as a discussion, the four by four costs on there? I think since not, it's yeah. on here for twenty one twenty two, I think it's going to end up being a discussion. Right. How right. it's starting with Vista attention. staff, and then I'm right. sure the community yeah. will be engaged oh, in yeah. any discussion. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I was uh, yeah. I was there when. We yeah, we're not, we're not getting ahead of this. There's a whole process that would be. Uh, also, I have other question. We brought up the zero base budgeting. I brought that up the last time. I, I know that's in the future, but I mean, what would it take to, because we heard, you know, with zero base budgeting, we, you know, it's a very surgical process. How much time would that take to really do? Uh, I mean, that's a lot looking at everything. My question is uh, how much staff time and ha have you done it before? No, we have not done it before. I know we've been talking about it, but yep, I... we have talked about it over the years. Yeah, it is very time intensive. Right, um, but I think we could maybe start with a hybridized type model. Maybe not do a fully um, zero based budgeting model. We could do some um, arrangement, um, working with our departments, working with our schools, um, to at least get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and to at least start the start discussion. Discussions. That's what I was yeah. just thinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any other? Okay. Moving forward. So that takes us to the next steps slide um, of looking at that resolution of the things that we've identified for 1920 and 2021, uh, which take it would take us to 6.3 million, um, and by approving the resolution, then we put that into the first interim report that then comes back to the board on December 19th. Um, and then we would also be committing in that resolution to identify another 2.5 million of reductions um, for 21-22. And that would need to be done prior to second interim, which is March 15th. Mm -hmm. So that's what's sitting before us right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Crawford, can you clarify when they, you say they might not approve our budget? Are we talking that they they we could be positive, positive, qualified, or um, is that, am I using the wrong terminology these days? Depending on what the board approves tonight, um, when I plug all of those into our multi-year projection, if we are still qualified, however we're by not meeting their directive, they could still disapprove our budget. Mm. <laughs> they could send it back to us, like I said, mm. with further directives. And, and 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 part of that is goes back to when we dealt with this in the past. We said, okay, let's tell it like it is, and let we need more funding. You know, every time we solve it, and yeah. you know. So anyway, so that's going off on another tangent here. So we have a number of speakers, assuming everyone on the board here is, do you have any more uh, questions? I, I do have a couple questions on the uh, OPEB account. I don't know if we want to do these now or after, but um, uh, just out of curiosity, so I, I, I see that the proposal is to transfer $10 million to the irrevocable trusts. And so I guess my question is, obviously the Chromebooks are, are in the proposal for about one million of that, but what what is the plan for the rest of that money? Is it just to go to the balancing? We we had proposed setting aside four million, right? Which would be depending on the ratio that we decide upon for our Chromebook replacement plan. Mm -hmm. It would be a four to six year replacement plan. Okay. So it would be each year we would replace a certain number of Chromebooks. So that money would be set mm -hmm. aside for a okay. long period of time. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the remaining 10 would go into the irrevocable trust. Okay, so the Chromebooks are, or, I'm sorry, the 4 million is going just to Chromebooks or would it, be, would, how much of that money is going to Chromebooks? The proposal now is for Chromebooks. Uh, we could, if there were other proposals, mm -hmm. we could look at using that money for Chromebooks and, and other okay. one-time purchases. Okay, but all 4 million it would go to the Chromebooks? At this point, yes. Okay, I just want to clarify that. That's yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. We have 26,000 Chromebooks right now. Yeah, that's a lot of Chromebooks. Um, <laughs> and then uh, do we plan to, do we plan at this point to pay our ongoing pay-as-you-go OPEP costs out of the general fund or out of the trust? Because I know that was also the new trust that we're creating. 
the current proposal continues with the pay as you go amount from the general fund okay. to the irrevocable trust. We would just be suspending that 1% salary surcharge. Right. If the board wants to revise our budget guidelines mm -hmm. to suspend both the 1% and the pay as you go amount, we can do that. Right. I just want to see the, the current proposal is to keep it coming out of the general fund. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, last question, the, um, so Debbie brought up something earlier about uh, we thought that the money was already in an irrevocable trust. So I guess, and I wasn't here obviously when Fund 71 was created. So I guess, and I know we've talked a lot about the PARS account that we already approved, but w what is the assurances we have that that money will be truly irrevocable I guess the document that the board approved back in September basically sets it up creates an irrevocable trust it's a legal document it's outside okay. of our books okay it is pretty much ironclad that it can only be used for retiree benefits for our employees which include okay got it thank you so to ask a continuation question on that um, the board also has the latitude to say, okay, 10 million, um, do we want to look at any other uses for that money before it goes in there, correct? Correct. So right now you're recommending, because we did ask for your recommendation at this point what you would come back with, um, but it could be used for other items if, if the board said we wanted to adjust that 10 million. Just, correct. Um, and then I'm just gonna make a comment. I'm, um, compliments to... Um, um, you and Debbie and the past boards for building up that fund because it's coming in a little handy now. So thank you, yeah. Um, David. Yeah, just uh, since we're talking about it, and I might, might as well uh, bring up the, the issue right now. So out of the $14 million balance, <clears throat> the recommendation is um, drawing the uh, Fund 71 down to $0, $4 million to the, the capital outlay Fund 40 for Chromebook, and the remaining 10 to the irrevocable trust. Um, is there any reason why we couldn't leave 3 million in Fund 71 until we figure out where the budget is going? Um, so putting 7 million in the irrevocable trust, the 4 million in the Fund 40, and leaving 3 million in Fund 71 just until we get through the next couple of months and then we would figure out on that with the remaining amount in fund 71 we could either transfer it to the irrevocable trust or we could use it for something else yes we could okay so the board can give direction on how much money to transfer mm -hmm. over but once it's transferred then it's yes once yeah. it's transferred it's locked into the trust right that's why you were asking okay yeah. any other board questions are we done with that okay yeah. Um, we, I do have um, three cards that are marked students, so I want to check. <coughs> I don't are you speaking? He's still away. Okay. He's still away. I always knew I was going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for staying. <laughs> My name is Violet Knight, and I attend Mitchell Middle School. Okay. <laughs> I joined because it had a lot of classes that I could take, ones that I was interested in, art, language, all the classes like that, drama, music, but it seems as if these budget changes may remove my opportunities to take some of these classes and I would very like for that to not happen. <laughs> so please don't change much of the school schedules, like please don't remove any periods or classes. Well done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is Carson still here? Come on down. Hi, my name is Carson Cages. 
I'm from Mitchell Middle School, and as you may know, Mitchell is an IB school, but with the six-period proposed budget cut, Mitchell may no longer be an IB school, which is the main reason I attend it. If that happens, I may want to move to another school, which may have <coughs> another language opportunity. Now, I've thought of some other stuff that we could do besides doing the proposed budget cut. Like, all the money we spend on energy. The lights are running all the time, on the weekends, every time. We leave the heat running all the time. We spend so much on Chromebooks, but in a lot of my classes, we don't even use them. We only use them <laughs> for... Ad we only use them for I'd ready an advisory and on a daily basis, which three days a week, and then we use them every day in language and literature in which we write journal topics and do little quizzes. But in most of my classes, we just do one or two things every now and then. There are also other um, big spots where you could save money, including the water and landscaping, more drought tolerant landscaping. And that is what I would like to see happen instead of taking away my language and arts opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, well done. Jackson, are you? Is Jackson Berry still here? I think he spoke. Okay, he okay, he spoke. Speak. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, come on. Did I miss it? Come on down. We don't want to keep you. Hi. So, um, uh, there's been inequitable cuts in the. In, for Rancho Cordova Middle Schools. And so that would make it so that ours couldn't be an IB school. So if we go down to six periods, then they wouldn't be, then Mitchell wouldn't be an IB. Oh yeah, also I go to Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Mitchell wouldn't be a functioning IB program. And which was what I was promised when I went to Mitchell. And for the zero, for the zero period, some students can't really go to the zero periods because they can't get up that early because, like me, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep a lot. And um, so please keep the seven period day because that's really what I came there for, the IB program. And so if we go from, because it started off with eight periods, but now it's down to, then we would go be going down to six. So that would be a big change. And so um, I went to Mitchell for the IB pro, or wait, no, never mind. <laughs> That's for later. Okay. So um, here's, there's been, there's things that have been, that are on the chopping block. And one of them is music. And I've been in music f since fourth grade. And although, also I'm in seventh grade. Um, so I've been in music since fourth grade and band since fifth, and one of my and it's an emotional outlet, and it brings fun to the school, in entirely, because it's a fun way to make friends, and that's that's a good thing. Um, and one of the teacher for Miss Mr. McCrossin, he's taught me that if you don't do something right the first time, then you keep trying no matter what. So that's that's another thing. So I went to Mitchell for the IB program, and so I sure hope that I would get it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Can <laughs> Young man, can you share your name with us? You can just, can you share your name? You can, okay. <laughs> My name is William Wallace. Thank you. Oh, I think I okay. Okay, um, David Hansen. Followed by Amy Strawn. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my son James attends the ILS program at Folsom Lake High School, and I see from the slide that uh, you've indicated the location is going to remain there uh, for the next year. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think it's very important for the students to be in their community where they can walk to their events, take the local bus. Uh, so thank you. I hope you can find a permanent location um, in their own community. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm sitting over there with my super brilliant colleagues, and I think we might have one more option. So I wanted to at least put it out there because um, you've heard from our amazing students. So if you kept a seven period day and perhaps had a floating schedule so that teachers, for example, half of them were off first period and half of them were off seventh period, they would still be able to teach five of the periods, 175, the contacts would stay the same, and we'd possibly be able to make sure that all of our students receive the structured learning in all of the subject areas. So that's, that's something that um, I think we should maybe entertain. Thanks. Thank you. I'm trying, I'm trying to group these by subject matter if I can. So Amy Wallace, followed by Karina Kirkland Kaplan. I think you both want to talk about Mitchell. Amy and then Karina. My name is Amy Wallace. I happen to be William Wallace's mother, Mitchell's <laughs> middle school student. I have a daughter that attends Riverview STEM Academy, and they have had enriching program in Folsom Cordova Unified School District. My fear, like what I hear, is equitable time in the middle schools. Your three comprehensive high schools don't have the same schedule. Cordova has a seven period, Folsom has a six, and Vista has an eight period schedule. Um, so really, where's the equity in the education of the middle school student? Um, the limiting the time for the ELA and for the social studies for a Mitchell student versus a Folsom Middle or a um, Sutter Middle School, um, that just doesn't make any educational sense to me at either. I happen to be a um, Cordova High School teacher as well. Um, as William stated, we were promised an IB program and when he had a choice to go to Mills or Mitchell and we gave him the choice to choose Mills or Mitchell and we pulled in the mar parking lot of Mills for the parent program. He looks at me and goes, Mom, I'm not going here. I wanna go to Mitchell because there's an IB program. It wasn't because that's where my friends are going, that's where um, I'm gonna excel at sports or anything like that. It was specifically the IB student. He happens to be an extremely talented musician. Um, if, he, if you go to that six period day, he won't have the opportunities that he currently has. And there's equity across the district it's disappointing that it seems to fall on the Rancher Cordova um, middle schools to balance the budget. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Karina followed by Stephanie Madrill. Hello, I'm Karina Kirkland Kaplan. I'm a science teacher at Mitchell. Um, I wrote it down so I can go quick. Okay. okay. When I was hired with this district last year, I was beyond excited to learn about the district's passion for social emotional learning and advancements in equity. I feel like I have been duped. The majority of these cuts have a direct effect on our students on our, and on our students who are not able to perform on the same level as students in other parts of the district. The students who have more access don't seem to be affected with these cuts. The IB program creates equity in our district and access to enriched curriculum that provides a depth of learning. By moving to a six period day, you will be cutting the IB program. It will not be taught to fidelity. The art and world language would be greatly affected. And I agree, I don't see how history and English can be compatible. There are ways, but come on. 
all students, especially for our special ed students, come, our students with special needs, okay. All students would not have access to those courses like they currently do. Our students in Rancho need a chance to have a holistic education. By moving to a six period day, you are cutting programs and laying off successful teachers that are an asset to our students and the IB program. Please save our program and give the students in Rancho the opportunity, opportunity that they need and deserve. Thank you so Thank much. You. Stephanie followed by Amy Reeves. Well, good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Stephanie Madrill, and um, I sent you all an email yesterday, but I still wanted to get up and speak so you could put my face with, um, with my name and also so I could reiterate some of my, um, my major concerns. Um, I am um, one of the French teachers and the World Language Division Lead at Cordova High School, and I've been there for, this is my 19th year, so I've seen a lot of changes. When I started, I was a 60% French uh, part-time teacher, and so the French program has really been my baby all these years, and um, I've done so many different things to help it grow, and the IB program was wonderful to, to really, um, really help our language programs grow. So. Um, in my email, I did talk about um, the importance of electives and the impact that a reduced schedule at Mitchell and a potential reduced schedule at Cordova would have. But tonight, I really wanted to talk about language acquisition or world language. Um, they are part of the IB core, and these proposed cuts have the potential to hinder our language program and the growth of it, when what we should really be doing is strengthening it. And if we call ourselves an international baccalaureate world school, we really need to embrace that international aspect. And so instead of cutting our language programs, we should be growing them. And um, we only have currently two language offerings, but with these proposed cuts, if the option um, is chosen to minimize the world languages at the middle school, I, see, I foresee that French will go away, so we will therefore have one and a half languages instead of two, when really I would love to see us have three or four. Um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, teachers and school site administrations at, at Cordova, at the Rancho Cordova side, seem to have a knack for showing up and pushing forward and doing the best for our students every day with all the challenges and difficulties that are thrown at us. Um, but I feel like this time it feels even harder because we've been gifted this program and we're really trying to make it work. Um, when we started, I heard someone say that it takes about 10 years to, to develop a really strong program and I feel that we're about halfway there, right? We're five years in, but I feel that these cuts would really um, take away, or I'm sorry, it would, it would hinder that growth and it would set us back on our, our 10 year journey to becoming a really well-established program. So thank you. Thank you. Amy, Amy followed by Mahalaksmi. Mahalaksmi? Okay, thank you. Amy. <laughs> Hi, thanks for letting me talk. Um, two middle schoolers that were here, I wrote down a quote. They went home, they had studies. Um, they said, music and language have a lot of upsides. They relieve stress, increase time management and creativity, and they, they use all your brain and give students a chance to do something different. So those were their comments that they would have said had they stayed. First, I wanna say you missed two great concerts this week. Mitchell Middle School had a music concert for their band that you were invited to on Tuesday, and then our orchestra played yesterday on Wednesday, and it was really great and inspiring, and it was at the Cordova Hall, um, the Cordova High Performing Arts Center. So I'm, I'm a parent in this district, but I started out as a charter school parent. I lived in Rancho Cordova for 14 years, but I chose to take my students to a charter school because of the large um, kindergarten classrooms here in our district. I came back because of the foreign language elementary school program at Cordova Gardens, because of Mrs. Peterson's art class at Cordova Gardens, and because of all the great teachers. Guess what, the FLESS program has been cut since I came back to this district. Um, Miss Peterson's art class was closed because of the whole PE fiasco. And now my kid's in the International Baccalaureate program and she gets to take language and music and it's great. And I'm hearing this is on the chopping block. She's an eighth grader, so this actually isn't gonna affect her, but it affects the kids in my community and it affects our students in the long term. And I don't think it's okay. I think fair and equ inequitable 
and fair are not this fair and equitable are not the same word and I need you to think about that and I hope you make a great choice for our students Thanks. Um, thank you uh, Leanne McMeans and then be ready we're gonna start with the slip people who want people who want to talk about slip okay all right hi, hi. thank you for everything I'm Leanne McMeans I teach special ed at Mitchell middle so far my little program at this point hasn't been affected so I'm going to talk about what happens to the other programs that my kids do go into and that's art that is language that is the computer program. I forget the name, sorry about that. These are statistics from our district. We have, at Mitchell Middle School, we have 69.3% of our population social, oh, poor people, I'm sorry. I'm trying to go fast. At Mills, 86.8. .8. Well, here we come to Folsom Middle. They have 9.1. And at Sutter Middle, what do they have? Oh, I think they have 20. Any cuts you make to our side of the district is totally, I don't mean that, is totally inequitable. It is not fair. Our kids are born into things that are unfair. We need to raise them up. You know anything at Folsom that gets lost, the parents will pay for it. I get that. My kids in San Juan District at Dewey Fundamental, we paid for it. They can afford it, their parents. Ours can't. Ours don't have the education. They don't have the money. Where's Mr. Hoover? He left. Okay. Sure he'll be right he'll back. Be right. Okay. He'll be back. Okay. <laughs> this is. You just... know what? He can probably hear you, actually. Yeah. That's true. Okay. He may not want Trust to come me. back. Well, there's a reason I love my special ed kids because I know I have ADHD and I've been here a long time. I was affected by all of the cuts. I went from. Mitchell to Peter. I also worked for Mr. Curtis. Uh, then I went to Vista, and then I got to go back to my Mitchell. But you guys, you have to find something else. Take some of that $10 million that's hidden away. I'm going to be 65. I'm still going to work here. I don't care about the retirement money. Now, if you give me two or three extra years, then I'd leave. But <laughs> you know, that's something else. Um, I have so much education you wouldn't believe, and I know I have to go, my math isn't my specialty. <laughs> but I have to tell you, be fair to our students. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't mean to be mean. Okay. I got uh, I, another card on uh, Mitchell, so we're going to do it. Sherry Ramir uh, Ramirez. And then we're going, the, re um, the next pile is, yes? Okay, so if you tell me your name, I'll pull it out too. If you can, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. If you want to talk about this, come on up and say your name, so at least we can stay on tar on topic. Hello. Um, I also kind of truncated it onto my phone uh, in an attempt to be a little bit quicker. Um, but good evening. Uh, my name is Sherry Ramirez. I'm a first year language acquisition teacher at Mitchell Middle School teaching both French and Spanish. Um, and I'm addressing you today with the concerns about moving from that seven, t uh, seven periods to six periods. Um, I really do think that uh, Mitchell really needs that seven periods to implement its curriculum to fidelity and it's already had a huge impact on a population that would otherwise be left behind. Um, and a six period day would put us at risk of being kind of IB in title, but not necessarily in practice um, because of its restrictive structure. Um, and as someone who comes from what we might call humble roots or a rough upbringing, um, single parent household, immigrant parents, language barriers and eviction, um, I, I didn't think it was really possible to kind of escape my situation but, um, and especially because I wasn't strong in math and history and science, like things that tend to survive these cuts, um, I didn't think I could uh, kind of get out of that situation, but because I was able to thrive in world language because it wasn't cut, because this was an option for me, um, I got to see the world. Um, not because I could talk about rocket science in French, but simply because I could hold a day-to-day -day conversation. And I think if we eliminate these options and we don't allow for the students to really find their strengths, we're kind of telling them that they can only only really rely on their weaknesses to get them as far 
as they can go. And when I look out into my students' faces and I, I recognize those backgrounds, I recognize those struggles, I, I, I want to be living representation, present day present, uh, representation that, that they can make it, that they can kind of overcome these situations, but not if we don't allow them the options to explore the strengths that they have. So I, I really hope that you reconsider um, taking us from seven periods to six. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jacob, Jacob, right? Jacob, yeah. And I think that is, um, and if I missed anyone, we'll come back to the subject. I was just trying to keep them grouped, but it might not work. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Oh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> My name is Jacob Kaditz, uh, members of the board, superintendent, members of the staff. Appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I know this is a very difficult conversation we're having in our community. Um, and I know that the conversation has been going on for a little while. There has been uh, meetings about the budget, which I neglected to go to, um, so that was uh, on me. Um, I will say, though, that I did not, I was not aware how far the conversation had advanced in these uh, discussions, and so um, it was a surprise to me to find out actually only three days ago, and I think of myself as a relatively well-informed parent, or at least I'd like to think of myself as a relatively well-informed parent, to find out three days ago that these uh, budget cuts were under consideration for tonight's board meeting. So um, that's part of my concern is that I'm not sure that these, I don't feel that these uh, cuts have been adequately um, communicated to our community, particularly to communicate uh, the community that these cuts are going to impact um, most of all. Uh, my son goes to Mitchell Middle School. My daughter goes to um, Riverview SEM Academy, and uh, we are looking at going to Cordova High as a high school because of the IB program. Like you've heard from so many parents and students, that is the that is the thing that is keeping us here in the schools in Rancho Cordova. Um, it does feel like uh, our schools are being um, targeted uh, unfairly or uh, not equitably, I should say, at the very least. Um, there are 25 schools in the Polson Cordova Unified School District, um, I believe, with, with the Adult Education School. So we've got the two middle schools that are re receiving cuts, uh, and then, of course, the Folsom uh, Lake School, which is going to find another location. The middle schools um, represent, I believe, about 20% of the total budget uh, cuts for the entire district, but again, only two out of the 25 locations, or 25 <coughs> schools. Um, and um, uh, I, I, so I, so my, I guess I have three things to ask the board. Well, one thing to ask the board with three sort of little follow-ups. Um, I would like the, I would like the school district to be able to uh, communicate adequately to our community about the impact that these cuts are going to have on our programs. Um, I would ask that the, um, also the board of the school district communicate why it seems like the Rancho Cordova schools are being targeted more so than the other schools across the district and explain why these cuts seem to impact us more profoundly than some of the other schools. And then um, number three, I'd like to delay any cuts or any dec decisions until we really fully understand the impact that these cuts are going to have on the IB program and the ability of our students to sort of excel academically in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the kindergarten teachers because we know that some of you have to be at school at 7.52 tomorrow. So, Jen Jones. Nope. Jen. Jen Jones. Followed by Rahul. Um, Rahul? Rahul? Yeah. Okay, my name's Jennifer Jones, and I teach kindergarten at Gallardo. Um, obviously, transparency is obviously not a priority right now. Um, as amongst the teachers, kindergarten teachers that we've talked about, a lot of parent, a lot of sorry, principals, not mine, have told parent or have told teachers not to talk to parents regarding this issue. Um, parents have a right to know what's happening and what's going to what your decisions do to impact their children. I teach SLIP. I have t uh, 12 to 13 students that attend class from 8:25 to 12:06, and another group that come from 10:37 to 2:37. There's an overlap from 1033 to 1206 where all 26 of my students, 24 to 26 students are, are, are there. Uh, I cover art, calendar, science, social studies, PE, library, STEM, fame, junior achievement, and other activities. There's one classroom teacher for my, my kids and, and we do just fine. During the early late time, when I have the 12 to 13 students in my room, I teach math and benchmark. 
I teach handwriting without tears, and our site happens to offer SIPs. Our kindergartners finish SIPs beginning 1 through 55. Um, after the winter break, I start uh, journal writing with my children, an additional 20 minutes of paper and pencil time that they're getting with a 12, to 12 to 13 students to one teacher. In an AM PM class, you've got 24 to 26 students who attend from 7.52 to 11.13 or say 11.17 to 2.37. Two teachers are in the classroom, not for the entire day. Um, they're in there for about an hour doing centers. They're not in there for the entire day with instruction. All instruction is done whole group with all 24 to 26 students. In that one classroom that's being used, you've got 48 to 52 students in that single classroom. Custodial staff does not come for four minutes and clean the bathrooms, uh, empty the trash cans, or clean the floor. And I know I'm over time and I'm gonna continue. Well, there's a 13 to one ratio in both scenarios. We will grant you 30 seconds. There's, there's 12 to 13 little bodies in the slip room. Um, some people are gonna say, our misinformed people are gonna say, but we had AM, PM years ago, and it worked just fine. The reason I say they're misinformed is they don't realize the academic standards in 24 years have changed. In 1996, I started teaching first grade at Oak Chan Elementary School, and I am teaching the same exact standards now to my kindergartners at Sandra de Gallardo Elementary School. Our kindergarten program is not developmentally appropriate for students, and now you're gonna throw us in for a three and a half hour day with all of those kids. So when you're looking to collapse SLIP and make AM, PM schools, or classes AM, PM, what the district is really considering doing is taking our youngest five and six-year-old kids, and they're the ones who are gonna bear this. Bear this. They've, got the, they've got academic demands that are above their ability. I have kids, my, I, my students last year overperformed over a, a private, a friend of mine who teaches private school up in Placerville. My kids wrote and performed better well, than her second I have to cut your time period. short, sorry. So I'm just saying that you need to keep our, our slip schedule. <laughs> Rahul, followed by Natalie. Natalie Darty. Okay. I'm not even sure where to start now because I'm actually up here and I wrote everything down and I took notes because I've been here for five hours. But um, um, my name is Natalie Doherty. I am a parent of a kinder student at Natoma Station Elementary. Um, I, similar to you know the discussions that that came up around the the boundary relocations and the families, and I bought my house where I'm at in Natoma Station, for Natoma Station, knowing what I was going to get when I came there. And now I'm being faced with the challenges and the changes that everyone else that's left in the room um, are dealing with. I'm not gonna talk about the their classroom ratios because a teacher just did it for me, so that saved me a paragraph. Um, but I'm gonna say this, I am a working parent. So is my husband and most of my friends including the six of my neighbors all who have children between the ages of 16 months and three years who will all go to natomization elementary i am fortunate to have a job that affords me the opportunity to be in the classroom but this isn't the case for most as more and more parents are working outside the home we are all but guaranteeing a reduction in the number of classroom volunteers yet you're looking to increase our classroom sizes when there isn't a volunteer in a slip classroom, it's manageable and learning can still occur. But when there isn't a volunteer in a class with 28 students, this results in a barely managed chaos situation, whether you have a second teacher there or not, that can't be guaranteed. What happens when working parents can't volunteer? When I'm there, it's a six to one ratio and I see the difference. I see the time that she gets to spend with those students and the relationships that she develops with them. <laughs> And I'm going to keep talking, too, because I've been here for five hours. <laughs> Having a smaller number of students during group instruction in a slip class is more conducive to student learning, to both social and economical gro emotional growth. I'm going to also say that my daughter is an August baby. Therefore, she will be required to start kindergarten four days after her fifth birthday. She doesn't get TK. Maybe she will. Maybe she won't. It just depends on limitations. But now you want to throw her in with 28 other students for three and a half hours instead of 12 students to 24 students for a longer period of time 
more focused education. This, it, this SLIP program offers an invaluable opportunity for small group learning, and that can't be taken away. And the last thing I'm gonna say is do not forget the teachers and what is important to them. We're focusing on the parents, we're focusing on the students, and that's important, but, but we have to consider how this affects them as well. You're taking two people into one classroom, different priorities, different teaching methods, and you're expecting them to be able to do this together, to adapt, but yet to teach the students how they work best, and it's not fair to them either. And we have to conclude. So, that's why I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to start stressing that no, we're gonna push fine. the two minutes because we're already pushing eleven o'clock, eleven thirty here. So, um, thank you, Linda Stallman and Debbie Dinkle. Linda and Debbie. Hi, it's Lydia. Thank you. Um, thanks for, for being here. I'm here um, to advocate for the SLIP program. I'm new to Folsom, Bay Area transplant like so many other people. And my husband and I chose to move here because of the school. He's a school social worker. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and we want to be able to raise our kids in a great city. And this is a great city. Like, everyone's so passionate. And my daughter's in kindergarten, and I know we have a long way to go. But, and it's kind of scary hearing everybody talk tonight, but I just want to say that I'm able to see the passion that these teachers have for these students. And my daughter comes home, and she hates the weekends because she misses school. She plays school and um, with her two-year-old sister. And the reason that I'm here tonight is because I want my two-year-old to have the same, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, the same experience that my five-year-old is having. And I don't want her to get lost in 27 other students. And this is the first time that some of these students are away from their parents or they're in a classroom. And to be with all of these strange kids and build a relationship with one adult that's so hard for these little learners. And I just wanna say that I really, really hope that you guys consider saving SLIP on the presentation tonight. I know you guys work hard on it, but it said on there that you, huh? That you were gaining space in the schools and you were aligning other kindergarten schedules with the rest. Where is the, the emotional support and the social effect that it's gonna have on these little kindergartners? So so please, please consider saving the SLIP program. Thank, Thank you. you. Abby, followed by Emily. Hi, my name is Debbie Denick. I have a second grader in Atoma Station and another little guy that's gonna be a kindergartner in two years. So. Uh, my second grader was in a SLIP program, and I was able to volunteer for part of the year in the classroom. And one of the things that I saw that struck me is one of the things that was so important about this schedule. In the morning when I got there, he would, the teacher would split her 12 students into two groups. She'd work with six kids on the math program. The other six kids would sit and write or practice um, different language skills. What other classroom schedule gives you the opportunity to work with six kids at a time? The value that my son got loves math. He was great at it. She could give him a problem and he would focus on it. And that let her have more time to focus on the kids that needed more help. You won't find that in an AMPM class. The other thing, I'm, a, I'm professionally a planner. Um, so when I heard about this, I immediately started asking logistical questions. What happens when there's a minimum day in an AMPM? Where does that second group of kids go? And in talking to teachers, they either have to be kind of forced into a classroom, in which case you then have 40 to 50 kids in one classroom, or 
those other kids get put in empty classrooms in the school. Neither of those options are acceptable to anybody, I would think. Um, the other thing that I asked about was, um, what if there's an uneven number of schools, or of classes? If you have three kindergarten classes, what's that third teacher do? They don't have a support in their room. Um, the last one is one of the teachers that I know in the district that teaches AMPM does not like it. Their library librarian only works a half day, so her kids don't get to go to the library. Okay, thank you. Emily, followed by Natasha Shelton. She's gone. Okay. Hi. Uh, emotional night. Um, I'm a, a parent of a fourth grader, a second grader, and an incoming kindergarten student in 2020. There, none of them are going to go to Vista, okay. so and I'm cool with it. So Thank anyway, you. <laughs> um, I'm also a school psychologist in a local school district that has its own financial issues. Um, my experience and beliefs are based on education research and evidence-based practices, and the tough and beautiful work of being a mom takes both. Research in early childhood resounds with the importance of children's early school experiences. The first years and in instructional quality set the stage for lifelong learning in our classrooms and beyond. The slip schedule allows for our teachers to target in smaller student groups the needs of individual students before the needs grow into greater difficulties. My opinion is no way reflected of, of a belief that our kindergarten teachers aren't capable of managing and teaching classrooms of 24 to 28 students in a room all day. I know they can, and let it be known, I believe teachers are the most generous and resilient people on this planet, um, but connecting individually and managing behaviors of all those kids is tough, and it's way harder than managing a boardroom full of zealous parents. Um, but this is an argument for accessibility. With the slip schedule, kindergarten teachers are able to access and address student needs. What does this look like in the classroom? I'm sure anyone would invite you to come see their classroom, but here's what I've observed when teachers have better access to their students. Our kindergarten teacher could provide a phonological intervention for a struggling but determined reader. Our kindergarten teacher could foster a greater connection with a boy whose parents are divorcing or a mom who's going through cancer treatment. Our kindergarten teacher could foster a greater connection, uh, I'm sorry, she or, or he, there's male kindergarten teachers, there's like unicorns, but I know they exist. Um, our teacher could encourage the shy introverted girl into a leadership role. Our kindergarten teacher could create a safe, quiet space for the girl with crippling anxiety or the, boiled, uh, the boy with a mild autism spectrum disorder. Um, our kindergarten teacher could use individual reinforcement to engage um, and motivate the student with ADHD. Um, I just, I couldn't believe more in this 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 whole thing and I care a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, Thank you. it's obvious. <laughs> Bonnie, Bonnie followed by um, through ye. No, two. two, two. And do we have Bonnie Ingalls? Okay. Are you? Yeah, kindergarten. Yeah. Bonnie, then two, and then Ashley and Carmen. Thank you. My name is Bonnie Ingalls. I'm a kindergarten teacher. I didn't plan to speak tonight. Uh, I emailed all of you last night. Thank you, David, for responding. I appreciate that acknowledgement. I have taught in Folsom Cordova for 20 years. I have done 15 years of kindergarten. At Mather Heights, we have not had the AM PM schedule for at least 14 of those years. For five years, my partner and I have taught extended and full day. Extended was 825 to 152. We now teach early bird, late bird, just as first grade. It is not in any way our favorite schedule, but it does work. It is doable. I hear the teachers saying, you know, slip is important, and absolutely it is. But what's really important is kindergarten. It is the foundation for everything. All of these things we've heard tonight, all of these challenges facing middle school students starts at kindergarten. And I feel it's so disheartening to see kindergarten right on the first slide of cuts. Years ago, when the district cut 32, everyone else had class size reduction, boom, cut from kindergarten. It's just, it's always kindergarten takes the hit. I, we feel like, um, going back to how you said, you know, I, I feel like we're treated like the girls in the mail room and the district is at the top and we're just, we're just here for whatever. And it's gotten so much, like Jen said, what we are teaching today is what I also taught 20 years ago in first grade. The district has spent millions of dollars on benchmark, TCI, Envision, 
I don't even know the name of the new science. Yeah. Second yeah. step. Yeah. All of these things, it's just more and more and more, and you want now. I've done it for six hours and 10 minutes for five years. Five years, my community has gotten six hours and 10 minutes of education, and now you want me to do it in three hours and 20 minutes. And I just feel like it's unfair to the children. And to add insult to injury, shoving us into a room together, um, back to someone mentioned housing, I, ha I live there, I have a home. My neighbor teacher has a home, and we are going to be shoved into one home together to leave that classroom empty to save $190,000. That's really, really upsetting. Thank you. Tu, Ashley, and then Carmen. Hi, my name is Tu Yi. Um, I have a son at Nick Sutter Middle School who went to Riverview STEM Academy. I have Grace, who's a third grader at Riverview STEM Academy, and I have Aiden, who will be going into kindergarten 2020. So disclaimer, this is sort of for selfish reasons for because I work full time. Uh -huh. So um, if there is no student care at extended day, um, then that means that I my job versus my child going to school, I probably have to go away and find a five hour kinder school. Um, another thing is Riverview STEM Academy is 29% free and reduced lunch. Um, so that's almost 30%, yet their API scores are second to Russell Ranch and equal to Sandra J. Gallardo. So um, I'm just saying we have always been trying to bridge the gap for lower socioeconomic status to help them achieve as well as higher socioeconomic status. And Riverview has this full day or extended day kinder, and this is one of our interventions. Um, I believe and know that early childhood intervention <coughs> is the key, uh, building the brain, and anything we do when the brain is done at seven or eight years old um, will be more impactful than anything from eight to the rest of their life. So, um, in kinder, they learn their routine, they learn their um, early literacy skills, numerical awareness. Um, I wanted to compare, actually I found something out. Our fifth grade at Riverview STEM Academy did not get full day kinder, they got half day kinder, and our fourth grade got full day kinder. So I would love to see those type of scores, which is in the same, um, um, I guess, population. Another thing is my daughter is a 24 week preemie, and I have to say that early childhood intervention helped her catch up, and she is not in any uh, intervention right now. And another thing I wanted to say, which was really, really important, um, I guess that's it. Um, I just wanna say that we, we have to start early, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Ashley, Carmen. Hi, my name is Ashley Pantoa and I teach at Riverview. I actually had Grace in my class in kindergarten, in a whole day kindergarten, um, extended day as we're calling it. Um, thank you for this time to speak about what we are all so passionate about. This really has been a really emotional evening, so I'm sorry, because I know I'm gonna get emotional about it. Um, I had all things to say, but Jen really covered a lot of it already. So I think the biggest thing for me tonight was hearing from that boy, um, Barry, something Barry, and he talked about um, a small group and how he got that time from his teacher. And I just, I know so many of my kiddos that need that time, and I'm so scared to lose this time. I've already cried my principal about it. I mean, this, this is scary for us, and we don't want to see this happen to our kids. Our kids need that time with us. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I've had parents all this week because of parent conferences mention a mini day at drop off and they're like, wow, you're doing so well, you know, um, corralling them all and it's only gonna be a couple more days and I'm thinking in my brain, it won't be this, it won't be a couple more days that this happens. It will be like this all day, every day next year and I will have 24 kids. I won't have time for small group. I won't have time for sips with them. I won't get to switch with my colleagues and have these leveled reading groups and make sure we have this intensive time to give them what they need. Um, I have taught half day our first year at Riverview, and I was not able to cover everything. I did teach first grade at Gallardo, actually, and I do feel like I'm teaching first grade now. And so I was not able to cover everything that first year, and I, I worked my butt off trying to, and I felt so guilty, as we always do, that I wasn't doing enough. Um, 
we have Project Lead the Weight Worst uh, Magnet. I could only do two of our four modules. So I know that that's going to be a draw for our parents that will go away if this happens. Um, and just to say that people keep saying to us, you know, who are ill-informed, you're going to have half day, you're going to have like so much time to prep and you only have to teach three hours. It's not what we want. We don't want to teach three hours. We want this time with our kids. You. So Thank please you. give Thank us you. this time. Thank She's you. She's an awesome teacher too. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Folsom Lake High, Ed Andrews, and then Andrea Martin, Annie Treese. For what? Oh, oh, come oh. on up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Carmen, right? Yes. Sorry, I put, okay. Good evening. My name is Carmen Coriano, and I am a kindergarten teacher at FHE, Folsom Hills. Just today, I was sitting at my desk, which rarely happens, by the way, watching as 13 busy kindergartners were playing in my classroom. As the class hummed with noises of playtime, one of my students began to sing, Highway to the Danger Zone. <laughs> little, little did he know how much this phrase related to how I was feeling, thinking about what would happen today if I didn't get the guts to come up here and share this with you. Danger zone seems a little over the top, but have you taught a kindergarten class lately? <laughs> and come out alive? <laughs> At F FHE, we have the slip schedule, and it will be different world when you cram two teachers into a classroom and get rid of the only thing that makes me stay in kindergarten. The slip program is invaluable to me. It allows me to have small groups for most of the day. I am currently using the schedule to get down to a teacher-student ratio of seven to one. Um, how on earth am I going to have this valuable time next year with my students? There's just no way. You are welcome anytime to come into my classroom and take the highway to the danger zone and substitute for a day. My kids are spectacular, by the way, but they also have a teacher who cares about them, wants a bright future for them, and can do all of this by getting to know them on a more individual basis. It will be very difficult to do the same thing if you change your program to fit your needs instead of what our students need. Mm -hmm. If you care about our students and your magnificent kindergarten teachers, make the right decision and let our SLIP program be. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ed Andrews and then Andrea Martin. Good morning here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it quick. Can we go to the uh, slide for the schools being closed? Is that a possibility? Closed. Folsom. Folsom Lake. That is on the board being closed, to my understanding? Correct me if I'm wrong. What? Pardon? Relocated. Relocated. Okay, pretty much the same thing and so I'm highly interpreted. On that note, I'm not seeing anything from the board or anybody else as per the 55 students that are currently there as you're gonna uproot them and move them over to the high school. Some of them have difficulty in the medical concept. I don't know if you guys have taken that upon to see if that's gonna be a good match for the students as you're moving them over. I do have one student that is gonna be unable to do that. So I'm not too sure if you guys are really lying with that. <coughs> Sorry, I thought my voice was loud enough. <laughs> so what it is, you guys are uprooting 55, possibly more students from a location going next door. Some students cannot go to back to that school, but I won't go there. I'm not seeing any letters as for those 55, and the one I'm looking at right now, any information on what's going on if they do move that student. Are they going to be able to meet the needs? So on that behalf, has there been any consideration at looking deep within each student's needs as per medical or disabilities when they go to the high school? Are you talking about the Folsom Lake High students? Folsom Lake, yes. Okay. On the 55 students that's currently enrolled right now. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, well, the, the, the question is, I'm speaking on one student right now where if that particular person goes to the high school there's gonna be probably more issues so my question is to this to the board has a board looked at all the situations within the students if you guys uproot 
the students move them over. What other problems are going to come about? Has okay. that been addressed? Because uh, I've not received a letter taking this particular one student. So my question is, how deep have we gone as we're closing these schools down or transferring over to the high school? Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Andrea Martin, followed by Annie Trice. With the proposed closure of Folsom Lake High, I want to state that m many reasons that the Folsom Lake campus is not only a special education setting, but why it is necessary for our community. Folsom Lake High is a small, tight-knit campus that embraces all students and makes them feel seen, heard, and understood, and cared for. All of the teachers know every student's name and listen to their life stories. Leanne Linson is a principal who works tirelessly and passionately to empower her students and staff to work hard, set goals, and exceed high expectations. Leanne, along with other staff, is out with the students every day at lunch. All staff go above and beyond to create a safe, all-encompassing, and engaging environment for their students who never felt that passion at their comprehensive high school or on an independent study schedule. At Folsom Lake, all staff focuses on providing a strong environment of social emotional learning. The Folsom Lake staff works daily to meet the differentiated and unique needs of their students. Students attend Folsom Lake because they could not survive at any other, in any other educational environments. These students need Climate 2.0 the most, as our superintendent states is our district's focus this year. At Folsom Lake, st staff have the opportunity to actualize Climate 2.0 because Folsom Lake is, has smaller class sizes, passionate teachers, and in, an intimate campus. All that Folsom Lake High brings to our community is represented in their 91% graduation rate this last 2019 spring semester. Folsom Lake High reaches students who need it the most, students who do not feel they matter, Students who have felt lost in the shuffle don't take, don't take their voices and their potential away by taking away their school. Please show our students they are more important than replacing Chromebooks or moving Blanche Sprints to Folsom High. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Brian Nichols followed by Sid Bazzetti. Oh, after, yeah. Yes, okay, and then so um, sure. Brian and Sid. Okay, um, so I just want to say that I'm in full support of saving FLHS and keeping it as um, the campus that it is and not relocating it, um, but I am an ILS teacher and part of the ACT program on that campus, so I kind of wanted to talk about the proposed plan if FLHS does get relocated. Um, having that program on that campus without any admin is very concerning to parents and the ILS teachers as well. Um, it's kind of dangerous. We have a homeless population there that does tend to um, navigate themselves onto our campus every once in a while. And if there's no admin on site, I don't know how the three ILS teachers by ourselves will be able to um, handle that. Student safety, I have students that have seizures and other medical needs. And if we don't have people to support us when we're there, I don't know how we're going to really um, be able to handle those situations. Also just other logistics like subbing, any any of that stuff, IAs, um, evaluations. There's two new teachers on in the ILS program that are being evaluated by principals. If we don't have admin on site, I don't know who is going to be doing that. And if it's someone coming from other places that are just coming every once in a while to check in, like how are they gonna know us? How are they gonna know our students and be able to fully um, evaluate that? Um, district mail, like any of all of those logistics, maintenance, custodians, any of that stuff I don't think has really been thought about when we're talking about leaving us on this campus by ourselves without any extra um, support. So I just wanted to present those thoughts to you guys before you make any decisions. Thank you. <laughs> Brian and Sid. Can you guys hear me? Hi, my name is Brian Nichols. 
I've been a teacher in the district for over 20 years. And for 13 of those years, I've been with Folsom Lake High School. Thank you for coming out and visiting us last week. I appreciate that. And um, thank you for, uh, you know, offering another proposal. Um, this is a little bit different than the last time I was up here to speak. But I'm still here to tell you why I think the proposal to move our school <coughs> to a hybrid credit recovery model at Folsom High is another example of bad planning by the school district. Um, the revised program is a step in the right direction, but it still fails. I have in my time as a continuation school teacher and an adult ed teacher used the APEX and the Edgenuity programs for credit recovery with my students. Both programs are great, provided that the learner is self-motivated and self-disciplined. They work great with adult learners or uh, for the high school student who wants to fit in an additional class to have a more flexible schedule, but they don't work well with continuation students. I've tried. When you read about dropout prevention, one of the concepts that you come about is uh, student resiliency. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with student resiliency, but basically what it means is that um, the more resilient a learner is, <clears throat> the more likely they are to have positive educational outcomes. Good continuation programs actively encourage student resiliency by providing multiple pathways to success, by developing positive relationships, by having great teachers who care about their students, by providing access to mental health and academic counseling, by implementing restorative practices, by developing strong PBIS programs, by producing, or by providing for more than one-to-one -one access to teachers, by having smaller class sizes, by that I mean 15 to one is the ideal ratio, by providing multiple pathways to career and technical education, by developing strong relationships with the community and with the parents. Basically, good continuation programs prevent dropouts by providing many as many as many supports to the students as possible. From what I can tell the district's proposal, you're asking two teachers to do that. Two teachers. And I don't think that that's going to work. I do think that uh, by asking the students to go to Folsom High School and take online credit recovery courses, you're encouraging more dropouts. And um, that it's going to actually um, reduce the ADA in the future, and it's a bad budget decision as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sid. Um, and then uh, Stephanie Berry still here? I know she spoke on boundaries. Is she still here for budget? No, Stephanie? Okay. Hello. Good evening. I'm Sid Bassett. I'm a retired school psychologist and served over 15 years in the district. And, um, and I served at... Uh, Folsom Lake High School as well as Vista and, and Folsom High School. So I have a pers different, slightly different perspective. But what I would like to step back and say, I can remember more than 10 years ago that Debbie Bettengord had, and board members had a vision of creating this building and passed a bond and did it. And, and I, it's in that vein, and I, and I recognize the challenge you folks are looking at the budget. But my area, my concern as a psychologist is the, the kids are, that are at risk in our district. In fact, I looked at it up today and it's 20% of our student population has mental illness. And we're talking mood disorder, anxiety disorders, ADD, weight, weight issues, gender issues. So I'm looking at the numbers and we're looking at about 2,000 at Vista. So that's 400 students there. 3,000 3, at Folsom Lake, that's 600. So that's about 1,000 students they're gonna be at risk our district in the near future and, and longer. And how do we address those students' needs? And those aren't, those aren't the children that have things happen like a divorce or mom or a sibling has a cancer or dad loses his job or whatever. Those are those temporary setbacks. And where, how do we address those students' needs? And I think the Folsom Lake is an exceptional school for that. And I believe the alternative school should be a model that you should be considering, not just now, but in the next decade ahead, because those at-risk students are gonna be there. They're not going away. And they, they seem to succeed and be successful for a lot of reasons. One is, is the, um, 
is having a separate campus, having relationships with significant adults, having specific, uh, a, a direct teach instructional model, um, having ma amazing supports, um, a principal, uh, counselors, that sort of thing, having recognized by name. Everywhere you go on that campus, everybody knows you and shows a concern for you. So, and I must say I have a personal interest in, in, in that alternative ed. I have two sons, one who graduated from an alternative high school and uh, is a partner in four major restaurants downtown Sacramento that have been featured in uh, Sunset Magazine and Wall Street Journal. He wouldn't have done that if he had not graduated from alternative high school. I have another son who is on, on, the, on the route at UCLA to go to medical school. So totally different learning environments, both successes, I think. So we, we certainly should have those other models. Now let me switch to the ILS program. Uh, that was one of my main responsibilities as a psychologist. And we're talking autism, we're talking Down syndrome, we're talking CPA, uh, 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 cerebral palsy, we're talking a lot of things. And those teachers and that staff, they need, they need support. They need its, uh, and the mainstreaming experience is awesome. That location is awesome for light rail and the buses and that sort of thing and all the retail outlets there. So that's an amazing location for the ILS program. But it's unfortunate, I, I really think it's not wise to, to leave them alone. They need good support, good administrative support. So thank you thank and you. I appreciate your time. Um, Jennifer Larratt and then Thomas Schubert, Schubert, Schubert. So we've talked a lot tonight about school choice for VISTA students, for, for middle school students in the Folsom area, but what about our choice in the Rancho area to choose the IB program, to choose Mitchell Middle School, to choose Cordova High School? I'm a graduate from Folsom High School, so I understand the significance of the education up here in Folsom, but um, there is quite a bit of inequity that we have. I mean, our students at Cordova High have to walk into their uh, weight room with the shame of having Vista logos on their weight equipment because they got the leftover broken equipment from Vista. They don't even have the, the um, you know, they don't even have their own weight equipment. They get leftover cast offs. So now to turn around and say that we have to budget the balance, to, to balance the budget on the backs of Mills and Mitchell and Cordova High School students just is not fair. Um, by profession, I, we have a promotional products company and I have a daughter who's on the Cordova um, track team and they came and said, hey, we're looking at uh, warm-up uniforms. Can you give us a quote? Which I'm already a current vendor for FCUSD. We do pens and everything like that already for the district. So we're already a district vendor. So we gave them a quote. They sent it up to the district level and we're told, you have to use our contract vendor, which by the way, was $400 more. So when you take that and you're taking that $400 and you're looking at all the sports teams that have to do their required vendor, that is just safe. that's just money down the drain. And um, so my proposal is that you kind of look at doing a three-prong system similar to what the county, the state, and SMUD does and going into big contracts for your consumables so that you're looking at something and you're getting competitive bids where you maybe look at some vendors that you can say, hey, these are your five qualified vendors. You guys need to submit in three bids so that you guys are consistently getting the lowest price. Because as a vendor who has been in these types of situations before, typically what happens is they undercut a bid by 20%, and once they have that contract, they're right up at the 40% margin. So you're overspending in some of those areas. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> After Thomas, we have Deb and Ed. Good evening, I realize this has been a very long night. My name is Thomas Shubin. I'm a parent of a student that goes to Mitchell as well as a student that goes to Navigator Elementary. Um, the reason why I'm talking tonight is because I hadn't planned on talking, but um, my son has definitely benefited from the IB program. Um, he's definitely more emotional. Uh, he can talk uh, better to me as an adult about what's going on. Um, and I would just urge you guys to, uh, before you make any drastic budget cuts, take a look at what the fiscal impact is going to be and whether or not the IB program is going to be impacted. I think you've heard from multiple parents here that there is a benefit to the IB program and especially moving forward at Cordova, that's one of the reasons why I like to consider moving him to Cordova. My daughter uh, at Navigator um, was on the AMPM. I don't know if that's the slip schedule that you're talking about, but um, she definitely benefited from the one-on-one -on -one time early in the morning or late in the afternoon 
because it allowed the, teachers, the teacher to focus on her. And when she was fine, she could focus on other students. So it gave them that one-on-one -on -one time. Additionally, I work in law enforcement. I work for the County of Sacramento. What I can say is what that last parent said about the competitive bid is imperative, okay? I, I hold a corporate credit card for the county. That's one of the things that we look at. You have to do the competitive bid process. If you don't, the companies are taking advantage of you. And that is a very easy way for you guys to cut costs and force vendors, if they want to do business with you, to you know, bring the pencil out and tighten their budgets because they want the contract. But make the vendors work for you. And the students win as a result of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Deb, and then Ed's card says, give his time, give time to Deb if needed. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Hi, board. And, and I'm Dr. sorry, Felicia. I just thought of this, that maybe you shouldn't have been last. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm going to try to make this really quickly. Um, first thing I want to say is there is good news on the rise with $7 million um, budget surplus. So that's hopeful. We have communities and schools first coming up. So let's hope that that gets on the ballot and our budgets start going up and this can all be a moot point. Um, I'd like to turn to page five. Thanks. Uh, two more back. There you go. I just want to reiterate a couple things. First thing, $22 million, as I stated before and as Rhonda stated, that is taking into fact that all of our employees would get medical retirement benefits. Um, as right now, one third of our employees are in lieu. 41% of our certificated um, employees took medical benefits because a lot of them work till they're 65. And so um, that plays into fact. The other thing is three and a half years is the average amount that we're taking into fact, not 10 years as the $22 million came up with the actuary. The other thing I want to put in was the 40, 200, 472 employees receiving the $904,084, and that is because of the golden handshake last year, the incentive program. Normally, the average is $702,491 over the last um, six years. So um, that's where I came up with my $7 million in the budget. It gives us 10 years to go on. And so when we're looking at the 414 plus the 263 employees um, that are outstanding, if you take a third away, you're looking at about 447 employees that we're looking at medical retirement for. That's less than the 472. So it's very doable to go ahead and do that. Now let's just turn to the third page over on fund 71. Yeah, um, one more. No, one more. So I just, I'm going to conclude really quickly. Um, the extra dollars, I want $7 million for FCEA wants to be responsible. We want to make sure that we have 10 years covered, and the average was around 702000 uh, $702, So we're asking for $7 million to go in that trust and for us to um, cover the next 10, 10 years. We want the rest of the money to go back into general funds to cover areas that we may need to cover with the budget shortfalls, and we're going to hope and pray that that surplus is passed on to schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that concludes tonight's public comment. <laughs> okay. Board comments. Anybody ready? Um, Joanne, Mr. Reed. can we break this down um, so we're not jumping all over the place? By Why don't we put this, the resolution up? Good idea. And we'll go by line item on the resolution, maybe, and see where see if we have a consensus on anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I are we good down to um, where we actually start looking at the cuts? Are we all good with the one percent and then the? 300,000, you know, the suspension of the 1%, the 300,000, the reduction in travel, conferences, et cetera. Yes. Okay, so the so site carryover. Can we discuss yeah, I, fund 71, though? Yeah. 
Okay, where is Fund 70? Oh, up on top? Oh, oh, sorry, I missed that one. Yes, let's go to Fund 71. Yeah, um, I, I personally would like to be a little bit conservative here and uh, place $7 million in the irrevocable trust and keep $3 million in Fund 71 until we get through the next couple of months. I don't want to overcommit ourselves and then regret that decision <clears throat> um, come March. So, and, and we, in March, we may decide to move the, the additional three million into the irrevocable trust, but I, I just, I'd feel more comfortable if we didn't move um, 10 million, but just move 7 million. Rhonda, are we at the point right now where we're actually considering the whole amount, or are you just, um, um, is this the point, is this the point in the process where you wanted the direction from the board about how much of the 14 million to split out? Or was that something you were planning on adding to a future discussion? Is that this was really the first opportunity that we've had to talk about how much to transfer into the irrevocable trust and how much to keep. Mm -hmm. I don't think the decision has to be made tonight. It was just a recommendation. We can um, talk about that that transfer piece at first interim, or um, as we have our further discussions regarding 2021-22. Uh, I just, think that's a good idea. Uh, Mr. Hoover? Uh, just to be clear, that that decision isn't gonna impact what we're mm -mm. putting forward with the budget for our report, so. That's correct. That's, that's what correct. the, okay. Yeah. The, only, the only decision we need to make is regarding the suspension of the 1%. Uh, okay. Does that make sense? Um, all right. Okay, because this, um, all right. So as, as you can see, there's obvious interest when we get to fund 71 in the board discussing how much to transfer. Okay, all right. I, I, I do think that, um, you know, the, the, the suspending the 1%, I think that, that, that does make me a little nervous. I will support it tonight, but I think it was a very fiscally prudent move and we've done it because uh, it has prepared us for the future, so. Um, as our information states and our budget book states, you know, that fund is already underfunded. Um, I don't like the idea of suspending the 1%, but um, so I would say if we do support that tonight, I would encur encourage us to think very hard about putting as much as we can in that irrevocable trust for the future. And we have used that off and on yeah, throughout yeah. the budget, uh, ups and downs to best fit what we can put into that fund. And also we have the intangible of we don't know what that fund is going to earn when we transfer it over to. Yeah. So it isn't something we would probably be revisiting. Not like in the past we had those you know flying pig bags we used to look at the, the cash flow. <laughs> Remember those days? The money. <laughs> yeah, the money bags. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think we're all going to agree on yeah, reducing yeah, yeah, travel. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the site carryover, amazingly, these sites have managed to have that carryover for us every year, so thank you. Um, um, Chromebook replacements from the time we have already discussed it, okay. Are we moving that? Um, Are we discussing that in a future discussing. Is that what? Uh, the recommendation uh, is to put it in there, um, put it, take one million from the retirement, from 71 now to offset. Capital some, outlay. Yeah. It's a capital outlay. Yeah. And we can always discretionally look at that as we go. Mm -hmm. um, Folsom Lake High. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I think the staff's done a really good job um, bringing forward some alternative solutions where we're not completely eliminating the program. Uh, I, I really do appreciate what was done with ILS and uh, at least, you know, continuing to explore, you know, where we end up ultimately moving that program. So I'd be supportive of it. I'm supportive of it, and um, also, um, hold on, the ILS is, they did bring up some concerns about right. staffing. Yeah, I, I'm for it, but I think we need to address some of them. Staffing on yeah. the ILS Support program. issues and stuff like that. I think that's getting down into the, the weeds, but I think staff will probably hopefully address that and coming back with some solutions mm -hmm. to address their concerns. <clears throat> okay, um, so um, we are supportive of the ESC reductions. Um, the PE prep positions, which is standardizing kindergarten to AM, PM. Any board member comments um, on that? 
Um, yeah, it, yeah. Go ahead, I, Mr. Reed. I, I do. Um, I'm not sure where to begin. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the, the point that the, the teacher has raised about having 12 students in a class um, for part of the day. And, and I can see how that's a benefit I, I, to both the teacher and to the students. You know, and it's, I'm, I'm getting older and my kids are getting older, so, but I, I, we, we recently went through kindergarten. It doesn't seem, well, it's probably not recent anymore, but um, uh, 11 years ago, nine years ago, and seven years ago, we went through kindergarten in Gallardo. Um, the, my two oldest uh, had AM, PM. Um, I think they were both in PM. And uh, my youngest was in SLIP. And I can tell you uh, that there was really no difference in their um, what what they got out of kindergarten, um, whether it was uh, AM, PM, or or slip. But now again, that was eleven <coughs> seven and and uh, or eleven nine and seven years ago. Uh, so things things might have changed. Um, you know, I, and one of the things that I struggle with is if, if SLIP is so great, and it very well could be, how come we can't offer it to every school? And so in a way, we're saying that nine of our schools are lucky enough to be able to have SLIP and the rest aren't. And how's that fair to the, the kids in the schools that don't have SLIP? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, there's any way, if, if, you know, following the logic that there is a benefit to the students and to the teachers for that. So I, I struggle with that. Um, I also struggle with the amount of technology we do in kindergarten. Um, I, I got an email from, oh, did I just lose it? I might have <laughs> lost it. Um, from uh, a teacher uh, in just the last couple days who uh, wrote, uh, here it is. Um, is it? Yep. There we are. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't understand why the cuts are hitting our youngest generation. The district has spent millions of dollars on programs for us to use SIPs, Benchmark, Envision, Second Step, iReady, Lexia, Step Up to Writing, TCI, and Amplify. You know, I, I wish we could just make kindergarten a technology-free zone. I, I just, I, I think we're overdoing technology, um, and especially at the youngest level. I mean, the kids in kindergarten need one-on-one -on -one or, or, or involvement with the teachers directly, not uh, involvement, interaction with computer programs. Um, uh, uh, but I'm guessing I'm getting off on a tangent on that that one. <laughs> but um, so, I mean that that's that's what I struggle with is is, is if it's that great, then why aren't we pl applying it universally? Uh, and if we can't apply it universally, then we're 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 benefiting certain kids over others. Um, I mean I, I recognize it's a you know the savings. I, I, you know, I, I, I see, you know, perhaps, you know, it's a small, it's, it's a smaller amount, but let's, oh. let's also keep in mind that, you know, we're just in round one of cuts. The one thing I've learned very quickly in this role is it doesn't matter what you cut, it has someone who loves the program. And this is for, this is round one. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the hard stuff yet. And 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 this is something I wish wasn't imposed on us, but let's face it, the state of California mismanaged their retirement funds, and we have to bail out the state of California for their mismanagement. But what can we do? Uh, it's not like the state of California gives a lot of uh, power to the, to the local school districts, uh, unlike some other states. It, the, the system is what the system is, and we have to try to make do and, and, and make the best decisions we can. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm torn on this one. 
is, is the bottom line is what I'm getting at here. Okay. Any um, other board comments on this? Refresh me again on how many of those programs are in Rancho, just out of curiosity. While I look for the document again, um, I believe two, uh, White Rock and Williamson for the AMPMs. Is that, was that the yeah. slip, the program the you're slip. looking for? Oh, the slip. The slip. Okay, AMPM is White Rock and Williamson. Let me pull back up the document here, and I apologize I didn't have it. I actually flipped it this time, so I don't have to look sideways. So for the slip sessions, we are looking at Navigator has a slip session. And Mesa. Uh, White Rock does have one uh, to balance out the, the – because they have an odd number of kindergartners. Okay. And Williamson has one. Oh, extended day. It's right. You were asking for slip. Oh, okay. Yes. That's all I need to know. Uh, I'll you. make the comment later. Chris, did you have more? Sorry, I don't want no. to. No. Okay. Uh, Rhonda, just uh, David reminded me, did, this Chromebook replacement uh, amount, did, does that take into account what we have kind of discussed about purchasing fewer Chromebooks for kindergarten or the younger grades? Because I know we had kind of mentioned that that was – Something we'd like to look into, but I didn't know. That was our original four-year plan. Um, since that time, we've started looking at different scenarios um, and playing with ratios and taking into account those lower grades that argument could be made against having a one-to-one -one ratio for, right. the, for the lower grades. So that, that amount is based on the original plan. Um, we have, I think, five different scenarios that we're looking at right now. That number would be lower. So it depending could on which be lower which ratio we, we choose, yeah. okay. Um, slip. Yeah, so that was just uh, kind of, uh, but on slip, I mean, this is difficult, and uh, it, um, nobody obviously wants budget cuts. I don't think any of us up here want to have to vote on any of this. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we have to make cuts to ensure that larger impacts do not, you know, we can avoid layoffs and, and furloughs and other things in the future that we really do not want. Um, and so we have to we have to make cuts sometimes. And unfortunately, that this is the time that we're in um, as a kindergarten parent. Um, I I can appreciate why a slip schedule is beneficial. Uh, I also have to say that there is nothing about kindergarten that is convenient for parents. <laughs> no kidding. Um, whether it's slip schedule. I mean, heck, if it were up to me and we had the money, I would want everyone to be an extended day. I mean, because at the end of the day, uh, that would be the best for parents. That would be, um, that would be significantly easier for people like my family whose parents work, you know, both work. Um, I, I completely get that. And, and, you know, the unfortunate reality is that kindergarten is extremely inconvenient. So, um, you know, I, this is a, a very difficult, uh, thing. Uh, I think that, uh, given our budget situation, um, I, I think I would support this, but, uh, it, it, I'd like to hear from my other colleagues. This could cost um, a whole lot more. And um, lot of kids thank you. Thank you. First, cut it from the top this time. Why take from our bottom kids? Our Thank bottom you, Jen, Ms. Jones. Any other board comments? You know, I'm, oh. I'm actually, um, I'm kind of on the fence about it right now. And I, and I asked about the Rancho Cordova schools because I can see where that one-to-one -one would be necessary, especially for our kids that have maybe in that area suffered socially, economically, and maybe trauma. And I'm just thinking how important that program would be to them. And that's why I asked how many students were in there. So um, I, I would actually support keeping the SLIP program. I know there's more to this that I'm going to talk about, especially with our Mills and Mitchell uh, prep periods. But I would probably be uh, more looking at keeping the SLIP program. Um, so my boys had two fabulous kindergarten teachers, Mrs. Moffitt and Mrs. O'Reilly. And I think that if you have two quality teachers in a classroom with 20 or 24, 26 kids, that we can, 
replicate the slip session. I am with Mr. Reed on this. If this is so great, I wish we had the money to do it across the district. But we don't, and I don't think it's fair that we have slip here and some kids get into it and others are in an AMPM. I support the putting all the schools on the same schedule. Um, I would love to see when you talk about Rancho Cordova needing one-on-one -on -one time, I'd love to see, can we get those classes down to 20? And you know, can we try to keep our numbers low as possible next year? But I have confidence in our kindergarten teachers that they can teach AMPM. And our kids will, so um, I'm going to support um, aligning all our kindergartens to AMPM. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Short. It, I have some big concerns here, I think, overall, uh, and the next one's coming up, the, the equitable schedule across the school district. This has been an issue for years. Okay, wait a minute. Let's just keep going down the list so well, we don't let, get off target. So, I, I'm, that's oh, what I'm talking about. Oh, so about. you're talking about PE or Mitchell? Can I, can I okay. talk? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, similar to here, like White Rock, if you've ever been on that school site and been in that, in that area where those kids, those kids are disadvantaged kids those are kids that really do need that extra one-on-one -on -one stuff so i'm kind of torn like uh chris here uh mr uh, that we need to have that a slip program for those kids there and those areas that we need so being equitable across the board sometimes may or may there are school sites that need like title one schools and white rock and all these other schools they have different needs and those kids have different needs same as the Folsom lake college the same argument some of those kids need especially when we have to make decisions that where are they so i'm kind of torn with that same concept that mr clark had here uh in regards to that so i'm more for <coughs> keeping it because of how it impacts the kids that are really in big need okay so um how are, we, how are we voting are we voting i just um I, so so I, so right now i'm seeing a slight majority on this so let's keep moving down and i guess we'll revisit this or do we want to just i, I think you need to make a decision before we move on okay so how on. all right let's let's have a, a vote of the uh maintaining the slip or um uniting um unifying ampm across the uh, district before we get there uh, I mean, I guess it's probably a question for staff. If if the decision is to keep slip, I mean, what are we doing? I mean, with the hundred ninety thousand, I mean, that's another hundred ninety thousand that we need to identify. And how does SCOE react to um, a larger amount that is is missing from the fi final puzzle? Technically, what would happen because everything is included in the resolution. If there's even one thing that you want to take off, you have to make a motion to not accept the entire resolution. You'll have to direct staff what to bring back for first interim in terms of another resolution. Um, and then we will have to add the 190 plus any others to the discussion list of how we're going to find funds to match that. Well, well, wait a second. Why would you not be able to vote on a resolution minus a specific line if it's built into the motion? Why would it have to come back? Why is it all or nothing? I mean, someone made the motion to say, I move that we adopt this resolution. And I'm not moving, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, but if someone made the motion <laughs> that I, I move to, to uh Adopt uh, resolution 11 21 except for uh, the $190,000 line item. Why wouldn't that be acceptable motion? Why, why would I think what it's doing is changing the whole resolution because a lot of the language that's built after that would have to be changed as well. I don't it dominoes. Uh, just like the numbers. Uh. So if you read the paragraph after the one you're going through right now, that would have to change too. So what if we did something like this? Since there's obvious, there's a number of board members on the fence about this. What if we prioritize that as if we find additional funding to revisit reinstating that? Well, I mean, this has to be, we have to figure this out soon, right? Because we're registering. 
So, I don't know. I think I think we need to make the decision tonight, honestly. But um I vote no today. Uh so I'll just say um uh, first of all, um in terms of equity, I mean I absolutely agree that I, I do think we need to put the block schedule on the table. Um, I think this is definitely a conversation that we need to have next, you know, in the coming months. Um, because I, 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 yeah, I agree. If we're going to take this stance on equity here, we need to take it in other places as well. So I would say uh, I'm very supportive of continuing that conversation. Tonight I will support um, uh, AMPM uh, equity here. So I, th I th any other, yeah. okay. Um, one of the things that kept coming up is that, um, well, Folsom Middle and Sutter are on six period schedules. So what they're what the, we're trying to do is align the schedules across the district. So when we were hearing comments about how Folsom schools have this and that, and right now the Rancho schools have the extra prep periods. Now I have significant concerns about the IB program, and we don't want to lose the integrity of that program. But I also have a lot of confidence in Amy and Jim and the staff to work out, come back to the board with a solid plan. Now, let's say that comes back to the board and there isn't a solid plan. What would happen if we said, hey, we want to go back and revisit this? what would if we approve the resolution hypothetically this evening um and we wanted to re we we saw the plan to how to implement it at mitchell and there were concerns about ib anybody <laughs> would we can undo it right if we had to if we weren't comfortable with it yeah. if we found if we got extra funding from the seven and seven billion or something so, I know there's a lot of concerns about the IB program integrity. I don't think we I can. I think one of the more important issues is staffing. Yeah. If, if we we really need to make that decision before we start staffing, which we start in January and we start master build um, and moving forward. Any other yeah. board comments, let's, questions? Let's make a decision. What are, we, what are we on? We are on um, well, we have to the, make the Mills and Mitchell prep no, periods. No, 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 no. We, we haven't even started that yet. Oh. No. We're just talking about slip right now. Sounds like we got. I don't know. I mean, I, I, we're I, at a point where either we don't, we don't approve the resolution if we take something out of here, is what I'm hearing staff say. Right. You're so. All or nothing. Okay. Um, so I didn't. I, I I I think I'm the fence sitter. Um, A.M. P.M. Okay, so we worked past that one. Then I'm sorry I, I got off tangent when you mentioned Mitchell and Mills. The lead teachers. I think we reached a compromise with the lead teachers that was acceptable. I'm trying to give each of these line items consideration because everybody came to speak about them, so they deserve some sort of. Um, so prep period at Mills. We um, that was already arranged. No. Uh, no. Oh, no. 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 Oh, no. 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 I didn't hear anything about Mills tonight. I heard Mitchell. 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 No, so no. Mills, well, I, I think, <laughs> and actually, I'm I'm gonna do it for, yeah. if I can remember, because heck, I'm half sleep right now. Um, William, Dylan, Carson, Jackson, I think was the other student. Those are Cordova kids. Uh, those are kids that want to be at a program that it is going to benefit them moving into Cordova. Now I kind of looked at the numbers and Jesus, if we, I mean, where is the equity in this thing? Because our Cordova schools are being targeted big time. And I think with, um, uh, Mitchell, um, and the prep period at mills, I think it's what close to 829,000. Correct me if I'm wrong. 822 okay and then think about it if you factor in cordova next cycle that's close to probably what 1.8 million that you're cutting out of cordova schools 
Okay, I mean, where's the fairness in that? I mean, it, it, and that's going to be compared to what Vista's, and I'm not knocking Vista, but I think we're cutting from the block schedule. We're saving about seven hundred and something thousand, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct 16, me on that. So, I'm going to ask my colleagues to look at this and actually look for equal outcomes rather than equal treatment. I mean, because we're arguing and applying for equal treatment and it's returning the current inequity in our system and it serves primarily to protect the privilege on the other side and the other side I mean Folsom um, and this is where I get with our students and I talked about the slip schedule and the trauma and, and all this stuff honestly um, and I had to write as I heard talk and board comment um, and then I lost it uh, you know the the average Rancho Cordova kid lacks nearly all of the advantages to their Folsom counterparts let's just be real about that I mean it's in the lower socioeconomic area I mean they have they're not equal not at all um, and for us to pretend that everything's the same is ridiculous. This equal treatment um, that was talked about, it, it can't be equal unless we have, you know, when, when we have, especially in Cordova, limited resources and limited parental avail el availability, limited role models, limited financial and community support. <clears throat> and really, honestly, with these students, a limited view of the world they don't have that in Cordova and it, I mean it's just and we're and we're taking we had eight periods now we're down to seven and now we're proposing six that's not right so uh, that's my spill on that um I, I'm nervous about the IB program when it says uncertain impact and yeah Amy I wherever you are Girl, I wish you could do something. I wish you could say something that's going to make me feel good. But right now, I'm not feeling too good about it. And I don't want that program to go anywhere. Honestly, I said it once. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Mr. Short? I, I, I'm along here with uh, Mr. Clark here. Th there's a lot of inequities across the board, and, and they're kind of structural. Think about the LCFS funding formula. It, unfortunately, we have... Uh, polarized community we have you know if you look at the 50 was what do you call that funding where we have to be 50 percent over the the mark and and yeah, yeah i am a little tired right now <laughs> um unfortunately that money doesn't follow the kids where it needs it like our title one kids all we get that money but how about the other kids that over there we see in rancher cordova i mean we if you go to those school sites that money doesn't follow it so it's an inequity just a funding and a, and a problem because the way our district is unified district that way that money works so there's one and along with the ib program and along with the prep periods here we, we worked hard for that ib program we worked years on the ib program and that is such a great thing for those kids over there and i, I really believe that we should find a solution to protect that uh the block schedule, that's $760,000 in savings. I was there when we, uh, we created the 4x4 block. That was a great idea back then. We knew it was a costly program. We knew that was going to happen. We're at a stage now when we made those major cuts, the 4x4 block is a great program. It, it, you can't say it's not a great program. Uh, but again, it, it's a costly program. Uh, it, it has eight periods. And so we're over here talking about six over here and seven. So it's the perception, not saying we're being targeted, but it's the perception. I know we were looking at this in a, in a way to get outcomes and results, but it, it, you can hear from the community that you see this polarized uh, perception, I would more call it, of inequities. And so I'm really concerned about the IB, the prep, and, and maybe there's a better solution that we can look across the board and have a fair share thing and maybe figure out a way to have those comprehensive high schools come into more of a uh, even play yeah because you know, folks want to go to best i get it academy but then you have folsom they're great programs both of them they're great education systems 
So I, that's why I think on the two prep ones right now, I'm having really heartburn with that one too. I'm just following with Mr. Clark. And may I add no. a comment to that, please? Mm -hmm. um, we're not talking about getting rid of the IB exactly. program. We value the IB program. We want it mm -hmm. to continue mm -hmm. and even grow that program. What we're talking about are the teacher preps, and it actually increases instructional minutes if you reduce the preps. But it, it says in there it may jeopardize the IB program. It's unknown. Well, I, I'm pretty confident that, that our team is going to be able fuzzy. to find a, a solution to make this yeah, work, yeah, or we yeah. do a floating day and still offer our students seven right. periods. Mm -hmm. And a, and a four by four block, how much, how much preps? They get a prep in the morning, prep in the afternoon too. They get I prep in each the semester. Yeah, so that's two. So, no, we're gonna let the board deliberate. So I'm that's sorry. that's the, I'm that's sorry. the I'm same. Sorry. So so the prep over there, at Vista, and then you have two. So why aren't we looking at Vista? Um, Vista is on the list to look at. In but March. that's next. Yes, yes. I'm talking we're about trying, maybe what we're, now. The objective here yeah. is to try to get to to get our budget approved through SCOE in December, and we have to take action in a timely manner this evening to get that done. Vista's on the table. Um, Not tonight. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, again, <laughs> no, nobody likes this. You know, this no. isn't fun. And I, I agree, you know, but I, I'm willing to work. Uh, I, you know, I know it's inevitable that the Folsom Rancho stuff it has to come up sometimes and i definitely <laughs> i hate that perception because i completely agree with you on the vista stuff i think we got it we have to look at it but that's not before us tonight i think we need to commit to that conversation at, at a future meeting um but when we you know tonight what we have heard over and over and over again is equity 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 why does this school have six and this school has seven school i mean at the end of the day we're talking about you know shifting periods for Mills and Mitchell to to equity with Sutter and Folsom Middle, I, this equity cuts both ways. And you know it, yeah. If we had the money, uh, I would love to you know move everyone up to seven period. You know, but that's just not on the table. So I think we can't apply the equity argument inequitably. And you know we need to uh, focus on that. You know we're not we're we're, we're just making things. Uh, even across the board, and that will include Vista in a future meeting, and I'm I'm happy to work with you on that. But tonight, uh, I will support uh, this budget resolution. Um, and also, a part of the balancing act with the Rancho Cordova schools is where the LCFF money goes, and we need to make sure that we're ap we're applying that across the dist across that Rancho Cordova to best serve those students, and that's where that those dollars are. So we can use those dollars to try to help. After we get across the board, boost the Rancho Cordova site. And the bottom line here we don't want to lose track of is we are trying to save jobs this evening, too. So, Mr. Reed. Yeah, on, on this topic, I mean, we're talking about equity, but the one thing I have not heard from, I guess, staff is if Mills and Mitchell go to six period, that's not the same thing that we have in, at, at Sutter and Folsom Middle because Folsom Middle and Sutter have a zero period. Mm -hmm. So are you telling me that we are definitely going to have a zero period or a seventh period, optional seventh period at Mills and Mitchell? If the answer is yes, then I think I could be comfortable with this, this uh, proposal. If the answer is I don't know, Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm comfortable with this proposal. So uh, go ahead, Superintendent. If, if, the, if the question is, can we make that work, the answer would be yes. And, yeah. and we would look at ways to make that work. Mm -hmm. And if transportation is an issue, that's where you look at your Title I dollars or your supplemental dollars to help create a little bit more equity to get our kids to school. If that's where the extra period is going to be or if it's at the end of the day. I'm confident we have staff that, you know, that are willing to work to find a way to keep keep it going and do it and give students the opportunity for those seven periods if that's going to be the best model. And and um, I think the student uh, I, f I forget his name uh, who spoke to um, a zero period. Uh, I, I actually, as someone who's not a morning person, um, I I would strongly prefer to see a, an optional seventh period because I think when you have early morning zero periods, that's where you have limited uh, interest because 
you have to get up really early. Uh, and there are, so, I mean, I, yeah, so, but anyway, the bottom line is, if, if I, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that, yes, we will have either a zero or a seventh period at, at Mills and Mitchell. And if that's the case, um, then I'm comfortable with this. And I'm also hearing that we're committed to the IB program to maintain its integrity. Okay. okay. At this point, I'm sensing that we have three people at least who are okay with the resolution. <laughs> so. Well, we have, oh, yeah. Never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I looked at the final three. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, please, please. We, no, please, please. Please, we, 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 we allowed plenty of time for comment this evening, please. Um, is there a, a motion on the table? I'll move the resolution. Is there a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Opposed? No. Okay. We have to go back to approve the. Um... Uh, we have to go back to the action item, or did we already do that? The FCEA. We have, we have to go, to go back, back to that one. Um, yeah, 11D. Okay, we have a couple left to adopt, don't we? Okay. Um, public. Um, adopt uh, a discussion action item. Adopt Folsom Cordova Education Association 2019-2020 proposed contract openers to the Board of Education routine item. Is any board questions, comments on this? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, I was, in, at least I might, I might have misunderstood this, but I, I thought I understood that the reason why we can't consider reducing the block schedule of VISTA to a, a six period um, next year is because it involves contract negotiations with the union. So I don't see that as uh, an item included in here. Would that s supposed to be in there or should that be in there? Is the lang does the language cover that discussion that's in there? It does, co it would cover it. it but the language that the openers as the openers as proposed allows us to talk about that if we approve this. Yeah, work conditions. So work conditions covers, okay. Yeah, the, ske the schedule's included uh, in the work conditions which we're opening with. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, do we have a motion? Move. I'll make a motion to move this. I'll second. Second by Mr. Hoover. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, approve resolution number 1121-1909, FCEA early no notification of retirement incentive. This is our routine item to ask our certificated employees to let us know if they're retiring to help us, especially this year, with the budget. I'll questions, move. comments? Okay. Second. Second by Mr. Clark. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, did I get through everything? Um, annual um, motion for the annual organizational meeting for Thursday, December 19th oh. at 6 p.m. I'll move it. Mr. Clark? Second. Mr. Hoover, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, approve the 2020 California School Board Association Delegate Assembly nomination. Um, I'm up. Yeah, you're up and I'll Head nominate up. Joanne. Right I'll second. Here. Thank you, Mr. Short. Second by Mr. Clark. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we already did discussion. All right, let's move on down. <laughs> Thank you for the information <laughs> item. Reports to the Board of Education Superintendent. I'm going to pass this evening. I'm going to make <laughs> reference to Thank the CAS and LPAC scores that mm -hmm. you just gave and just make sure that you take a look at them. Thank you. Um, any 
board members have uh, any comments just, to make? Just quickly, I, I just want just want to say, reiterate that I really just my hands off to our staff and everyone that getting through the budget, getting through the boundary things, the amount of work you've done, you show exemplary work, every single one of you going through these tough decisions, cannot say anymore, and I'll the superintendent for the leadership to get through this to this. So again, uh, we really do appreciate you, and I, I from my bottom of my heart, do value guys, and hopefully you, you, you maintain the confidence and, and the board in us, and go moving forward and making sure we make the sound decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark, anything to say? Uh, no, I'll just echo what Ed said. And um, Friday night, our uh, Folsom Bulldogs are uh, playing at Folsom, correct? Okay. Um, so hopefully you guys come out and support. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mr. Hoover. Uh, um, thanks to everyone that participated tonight. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Mr. Reed? Uh, no report. Meeting adjourned. Good night. <laughs>